beam could take off someone's head. Nobody's hands were completely clean. All any beam could do was to strive to make sure the dirt was kept to a minimum. I think you should just come straight out and ask her for the antibody, and tell her why, Juzik said at last. She responds to reason? Skarada nodded. Then he levered himself to his feet, both hands braced on the arms of the chair. Time I got some sleep, he said. They say you need less as you get older, but I just seem to need more. Skarada hadn't slept in a proper bed since the night he saved the young Nulls from extermination in Topoka City. He'd do what he'd done every night for the last eleven or twelve years, settle down in another chair with his feet up on a stool, or even curl up on the floor with a bedroll under his head as if he were still on the battlefield. He didn't talk about it. Everyone knew why he did it. It was a habit that had become a ritual his unspoken vow that he wouldn't take it easy until his clone sons had their lives back. Juzik followed him into the Karii and watched him make himself comfortable, or what passed for it, on one of the upholstered seats. He had a bedroom of his own, like everyone else. Only his clothing and his favorite Verpine sniper rifle occupied it. I'll talk to her in the morning, Juzik offered. I won't even mess with her mind. I'll do it. Me and her, we've got an understanding. Juzik recalled a comment Calbert had made a couple of years ago. He couldn't remember what had led to it, but it had moved him deeply, and every so often it surfaced in his memory. Bard I.K., if you ever want a father, then you have one in me. Yes, Juzik often wanted a father. He'd been handed over to the Jedi long before he was old enough to have any memory of his own. But he was now part of a culture where fathers and fatherhood mattered, not lineage or bloodline, but the long and infinite duty to a youngster who depended on you. He badly wanted to be part of this family, a real part, formal and permanent. Kalbir, Juzik said, have you got room for another son? Skirata looked baffled for a few seconds, then smiled and held out his hand to grasp Juzik's arm, Mando-style, hand to elbow. An I.K. Wiretail guy I say ad, Bard I.K. I recognize you as my child. Mandalorian adoption was fast and permanent, a few words to recognize someone as child and heir regardless of their age. Given the emotional weight behind it, the oath seemed almost inadequate. Beer, Juzik said. Father. Everyone called Skarata Kalbir, a mark of affectionate respect, but the word was now changed forever for Juzik, because it was suddenly real and literal. He was finally someone's son, someone with a name, someone he knew and cared about. For a man with no past, that sudden sense of completion was heady and unexpected. I wonder where I'd be now if it wasn't for you. Skarata let go of his arm. Works both ways, Bard I.K. That's what makes us family. The house was completely silent except for the crackle of embers in the Karii's huge fireplace and the occasional click as roof timbers contracted. Juzik made his way down the passages to his room. He didn't even remember falling asleep until he woke up staring into the dark vault of the ceiling, wondering what that noise was. As always, it wasn't just a noise. He sensed a whole package of other information with it via the Force. It was dread, confusion, and a need to run. He let it wash over him for a moment. Claws tapped on the flagstones in the passage. The door edged open. You heard it too, Murd? Juzik whispered. The Strill had its own kind of radar a predator's sensitivity to every noise and smell. How'd you know I was awake? Juzik swung his legs out of bed and pulled on some clothes. Come on. Let's see what it is. Murd seemed to know where the sound was coming from. Juzik buckled his belt and lightsaber out of pure habit, 
and followed the animal past the kitchen to the main back doors that led out onto open country. Thaw or not, the air felt bitterly cold. Murd stood completely motionless, nose pointing into the breeze, and grumbled quietly in its throat. Someone was walking around the perimeter, occasionally cracking twigs in the undergrowth, and for a moment Juzik feared the worst, that the bastion had been found. But Murd's reaction, calm, more worried than defensive, told him it wasn't a stranger prowling out there, and what he sensed in the force was a troubled spirit. It was probably Arla, or maybe even Yuthan unable to sleep. No. Arla. It was Arla. Poor woman, she was coming off those stop Abantha tranquilizers, and she was in no shape to be wandering around in the cold and dark in a strange place. He'd bring her back inside. Murd trotted on without prompting, leading Juzik through the trees. They made enough noise not to startle her. Juzik tried to imagine what might have made her venture outside, and wondered if it had been such a good idea to leave doors unlocked. He spotted her standing on the bank of the stream that formed a natural boundary to the north. Hey, Arla, he called. Despite the racket he was making, she still flinched. You're going to catch your death of cold. Come indoors. Juzik ambled up to her, making a point of looking harmless. He wondered why some could live with horrific memories and others couldn't. Poor Arla. They'd done the right thing getting her out of that place. It wasn't going to be easy adjusting to life outside, but it had to be better than an institution. He was about a meter from her now. She was radiating so much tension in the force that he almost expected her to panic and run, but she turned to face him almost casually, right arm at her side, left hand in her tunic pocket. It was then that she raised her arm and he saw the weapon, wood, a metal bar, he wasn't sure which. In the stretched fraction of a second before it hit him, he defaulted to being a Jedi, and sent her crashing backward with a force blow that was pure reflex. He should have seen it coming. Mess Hall, 501st Legion Special Unit Barracks, Imperial City. Niner now had to think on his feet. The longer Ordo and the others were on Coruscant, the more they risked getting caught. He had to deliver that data chip if nothing else. He also had to get Dar in a position where he'd desert with him, right there and then. There'd be no second chances or asking for a week to think it over. If Ordo had to come back and run the gauntlet of Imperial security checks again, the risks would be even higher than hanging around. It couldn't wait. He watched nervously as Darman dawdled over his plate of noodles, and the moment he twirled the last strands around his fork and slurped them, Niner took the plate away and stood up. Practice range, Niner said. I really need to sharpen up. It was stand easy time, and they'd have the SU range to themselves for a while. Darman just gave him a look and didn't argue. They knew each other well enough to gauge what was a problem and when it needed to be discussed elsewhere. Okay. Darman took the plate back and placed it on the tray of a service droid as it passed on its never-ending trawl for dirty dishes, cutlery, and spills. Let's see what we can do. But remember the new guy showing up in an hour. Shab. Niner had forgotten about Reed. Well, they could get this over and done with by then, and then he could worry about how to handle Reed. An hour's plenty. The interior range was soundproofed, ringed by handy booths and storage areas that were ideal for avoiding interruptions. Niner switched to his secure helmet link as he walked down the corridor, inaudible to Darman. Ordo? It's me. Where are you? Ordo was obviously standing by. There was hardly a second's delay. Four clicks from your position, Nevio D. I'm about to break the news to Darman. It'd be a good idea to give us a time and a place. Things are getting complicated here. This time, the link went quiet for a few moments. 
Where might you be able to hang around in full armor without looking too obvious, and where a freighter could lay up? Is that what you're driving today? New York Valens Crate Cornucopia It's a CC Monarch, 30 meters length overall, beam 10 meters, total draft 15 meters. Niner couldn't recall seeing the ship. He tried to visualize something that size and where it might hang around for a while without looking out of place. The first thing that sprang to mind was an industrial zone, but that wasn't somewhere a commando in full black rig could loiter without drawing attention in daylight. Then there were commercial areas, maybe the megastores with loading areas the size of small neighborhoods. Can we do this when it's dark? Niner checked his chrono. Seven hours, roughly? Yes. How about one of the waste processing plants? They're full of vessel holding areas. Or a repulsor truck park. Repulsor truck park makes sense. You won't be hanging around long, anyway. Report in on the hour, and we'll fine-tune the RV time and location. Copy that. Very convincing, Nike. Ordo out. Darman nudged him. You're up to something. Maybe. Niner checked that the range was clear, switched on the do not enter safety sign, and steered Dar into the end stall. Bucket off. Darman took off his helmet, powered it down completely, and stuffed his gauntlets into it. I get the idea, he whispered. Dar, I'm going to have to mention some painful things. Darman looked like he was trying hard to be unconcerned. Okay, I promise I'll stop eating things that give me gas. Serious. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Niner hadn't spelled it out before. They both knew all too well what had happened the night of the Jedi Purge, and he thought that the less he reminded Darman of his misery, the safer it would be. Darman seemed not to want to talk about it either. Now he had to. Dar, your kid needs you. We have to get out of here. Sorry. I don't know how else to say it. Darman looked away for a few moments, focusing on the blaster-proof wall. I know, he said at last. But I still feel like I'm running out on my buddies. Do you still want to leave? Niner was wary of saying the D word, even when he was sure he couldn't be heard. We decided we would. All of us. Yeah. I remember. You want to see Cat again, don't you? Niner knew as soon as he said it that he'd stepped through thin ice. Dar's eyes glazed with tears. You know what? He said. I don't know if I can look at him. When I look at him, I'll see her and everything we never got a chance to have as a family, and I don't think I can handle that. But he's your son. Niner understood exactly what he meant. You'll pick him up, and all that father stuff is going to flood in. You'll want to be with him for exactly that reason, because he's yours and attains. It was the first time Niner had dared say her name for ages. In fact, he wasn't sure he'd said it at all since the night she was killed. Her death hung over him and Darman like a permanent pall of smoke that they could both see but never mentioned, because its presence was so overwhelmingly obvious. Dar shut his eyes for a moment and pinched the bridge of his nose. How am I going to keep him safe? What if the Jedi come back? If they ever do, they'll have to find him first, and then they'll have to get past Skarada. And the Nulls. And me. The longer they waited to escape, the less urgent it seemed, except for the fact that Cad was growing up without his parents. Niner wavered between looking forward to a new life and fearing that he'd waste it because he wouldn't know what to do with it. What did they do with her body? Darman asked. A dam seemed to have burst, spilling out questions that must have been eating him alive. I don't know where she is. 
Did they take her? I can't get it out of my head. I don't even know how to find out. It seemed as good a time as any to tell him. I'll ask Ordo, Niner said. Darman looked up very slowly. You're in touch with the Nulls? Yes. When were you planning to tell me that, Niviodi? Darman hadn't been told he had a son for 18 months. He didn't take kindly to being kept in the dark, and Skirata had the scars to prove it. That explains a lot. No, it doesn't. I knew it. You've been acting weird. I swear they only made contact today. That's why we're standing here now. Darman wasn't catching on fast enough. Cut the Asik. Tell me. They've come to get us out. Darman's gaze flickered. They're taking a big risk. Skirata always talked about cage-farmed Nuna. It was hard to set them free, he said, because they'd been born in a cage and bars were all they knew. They'd often scuttle back to the cage when set loose, as if the sheer scale of the open fields overwhelmed them. Niner thought he saw that Nuna look on Dar's face. That's why we need to get moving, he said. We've got a few hours yet, he tapped his helmet. Jane seems to have a hundred ways of getting into government systems. The man's inventive. Okay, Darman said again. Can I talk to him? Can I talk to Ordo? Why did he contact you, and not me? It didn't take a mind reader to work out what Darman wanted to ask. His spy couldn't find your helmet to slip the comm link in, Niner said. You want me to ask him? About Atain? Darman put his helmet back on. Yeah. Do that. Thanks. Look, I'd better go meet Reed. Ennin's not up to being sociable yet. Niner watched him go, and realized that losing a wife was a different kind of grief. Mourning a brother killed in action was bad, and it never got any easier. Commandos just found ways to cope with it day by day, and Ennin would, too. But there was no expectation of definite events in a shared life, none of the stuff that a couple assumed would happen to them, having kids, seeing those kids grow up and have kids of their own, and finally growing old together. Things that Darman had started to expect would happen to him would now never take place, even if he married again. The future with Atain had been glimpsed before a door had slammed shut. That somehow seemed even more cruel than just missing a brother in that general he's not there kind of way. Niner put his helmet on and activated the comm link, still wary and half expecting to be intercepted. Ordo, you there? Receiving, Niviodi. Darman needs to know what happened to Atain's body. Ordo was silent for a few moments as if he'd had to think about it. We took her back to Mandalore, and she was cremated in keeping with her custom. Jedi custom. Kalbir wanted it. Ordo sounded almost ashamed. Her ashes haven't been scattered. We're waiting for Darman to come home. Niner felt a familiar ache behind his eyes and shut them tight until the feeling passed. I'll let him know. Niner out. Back at the mess hall, Darman and Ennin sat huddled at a table with a clone who had to be read. It was hard to explain to randomly conceived beings, but despite looking almost identical, this man was a stranger. The sameness got filtered out, leaving only the small variations, lines, gestures, tone of voice, as distinguishing features. Niner hadn't got the measure of reads yet and he was one year old. More or less. Almost everything he knew, and every skill he had, was the result of flash learning. He just hadn't been alive long enough to undergo any of the basic training that took up the first years of a Kamino clone's life. He was going to have a tough time in special operations. Sergeant. Reed sat bolt upright. 
Trooper TK70558 Sergeant. You'll probably end up calling me Niner. He sat down. Small squad habits. Did you volunteer? No, Sergeant. Aptitude assessment. But how do you feel about joining us? The lad had to learn that he was free to say what was on his mind. Happy? Annoyed? Upset at being separated from your old buddies? Reed paused as if it was a trick question. I'll miss them, he said. But it's an honor to serve in the 501st, especially in the Commando Corps. Honor wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Niner knew just how it felt to start over in a completely new squad among complete strangers. Fair enough. Can you shoot better than the other Syntax guys? We can always use more range time. Good attitude. Niner was aware of Enon frowning at him. So what do you think our overall objective is? To neutralize insurgents, political agitators, and other security threats seeking to destabilize the new government, Sergeant. It sounded like something Reed had learned. Poor kid. How could anyone cram enough into a human being in one year to make them functional but without turning them into basket cases? It still didn't sound right to Niner. And now there was a whole army of beings below him in the victim's league. He wasn't sure if that made him feel better or much, much worse. I'll ask you that again in six months if you're still with us, Niner said. Enon drained his cup of CAF and got up. If we're still alive. Reed looked to Niner with an expression of grim anticipation, as if he was expecting some guidance. What do we do now, Sarge? Sarge wasn't Niner, but it was a start. Niner felt a pang of guilt that he wasn't going to be around to look after Reed. He just hoped Enon would latch onto him in the days to come. It was hard to look the guy in the eye and make reassuring noises when Niner knew he'd be gone by tomorrow morning. We start planning the next mission, he said. Enon, show Reed his locker and bunk. I've got an errand to run and then I'll join you. Dar? I want a word. He made it sound as if he was going to give Darman a private dressing down. Like all lies, he didn't enjoy it much but it was temporary, because by this time tomorrow they'd be on their way to Mandalore, or even making themselves at home in Kiramorat. Niner had never seen Mandalore. It was weird to have a spiritual home he'd never visited, and a real hometown, Topoka City, that he never wanted to visit again unless he was dropping in to bomb it back into the sea. He walked out onto one of the barracks landing platforms with Darman and leaned on the safety rail, staring out into the forest of towers and apartment blocks whose foundations were more than a kilometer below. He'd never noticed there were so many surveillance holocams in the city before. Once they'd been a useful source of information, now they were a threat. And he was sure there were more cams installed than there'd been six months ago. Dar, I spoke to Ordo he said. When you get home, there's something you'll need to do, something you'll want to do first, I think. Niner tried to imagine what it would feel like to hold the ashes of someone you loved, whether that gave closure or just ripped open wounds that hadn't even begun to heal. If it was him. If it was him, he'd just see how little life had left him with. Nine. I take nothing for granted. The Empire may well have millions of troops, but it is still a fragile thing, still in its infancy, and there will always be those who want to overthrow it. But they will look ahead to the time when they are powerful enough to do so. They have no idea that their best time to strike is now, while I have still to consolidate my power. As always, the ignorance and apathy of the populace works in my favor. Emperor Palpatine, to his secretary droid. Kirimorat Mandalore. Skirata could hear someone having a furious argument with General Zay, distant and muffled. But Zay was already dead, 
and that fact bothered him so much that he decided he had to be dreaming. He was. He woke up in the chair but the yelling went on, because it was real. There was a brawl in progress. It took him a couple of moments to surface and work out that one of the voices was a woman's. Shab, Jilkas finally snapped with Bessany. He scrambled to his feet and ran down the passage, nearly tripping over Murd as they met halfway. If there were intruders, the Strill would have ripped them apart, so this trouble was domestic. Manav and I! Manav and I, Tan! Jilka didn't speak Mandoe. No, it wasn't Mandoe, it was Concordian. That was Arla screaming blue murder and demanding to be let go. Skirata flung open the door to the rear lobby, instinctively letting his knife slip from his sleeve into his right hand. He found Juzik holding a wild-eyed Arla in an arm lock. Now Skirata could see she was Django's sister. Her eyes had that same insatiable, wounded anger. Sorry, Kalbir. Juzik's face was streaked with bleeding scratches. Arla froze, panting as if she was getting her second wind. It was all I could do to get her back in here without breaking something. Shab. Skarada leaned out of the door and yelled. Mijake? Mijake, you awake? Medic. Arla elbowed Juzik in the chest a moment. He slackened his grip. You stay away from me, Mando. She spat. I'll cut your criffing throat. I promise you. And you, Grandad, you come anywhere near me and I'll gut you. Skirata could hear the clatter of boots approaching. Arla jerked her head back into Juzik's face with a loud thwack. The next second, she went completely limp and Juzik lowered her carefully to the floor, blood trickling from his nose. Skirata wasn't sure if she'd stunned herself or simply collapsed. Hilamar appeared in the doorway with his medic's bag and looked from Skirata to Juzik and back again. She'll be okay, Juzik said. He wiped his nose on the back of his hand. It doesn't hurt. Askru. What? For stun. Sorry, but I had to do it. Murd wandered over to sniff Arla and lick her face, but she was out cold. It's kinder than breaking her wrist. Skirata tended to forget just what a range of combat skills Juzik held in reserve. I don't think that would have stopped her. What happened? I found her wandering outside, really agitated, and when I tried to get her to come back indoors, she went berserk and took a chunk of wood to me. She certainly knows how to scrap. Hilamar held a hypo spray up to the light to check it then squatted over Arla to jab it into her arm. This is what comes of stopping her meds abruptly, he said. Now I know why they dosed her up to the eyeballs. I've got to find something to replace the sabenadone and taper the dose off properly. You can translate that into basic for me sometime, Skarada said. He beckoned to Juzik and examined his injuries. His nose was bent slightly to one side. Is this going to keep happening? I can't help but hear Vav telling me he told me so. Just because she's a convicted murderer, it doesn't mean this episode is her normal behavior, he Lamar said. She's coming off a tranquilizer that would paralyze a hut, she's traumatized, and she's scared. There's nothing to suggest we can't get her past this stage. I feel so much better knowing that, Skarada said. Yes, it was his idea, and Juzik's, to spring her from the asylum, knowing full well that her file said murderer. He'd killed more than once himself, so he couldn't get too sniffy about anyone else's criminal record. Just how dangerous is she? Dangerous enough. Juzik submitted to a cold pack on his nose, and stood with his head tilted slightly back. Hilamar tilted it forward again. I can't keep wrestling her like this. Well, first thing we do is lock the doors and put a lock on her room for everyone's safety, Skarada said. 
This was a complication he didn't need, but he was stuck with it now. You okay, son? I'll live. Everyone had woken up now and came to see what the commotion was about. A small crowd assembled at the door, led by Fai and Vav. Let's move her, Fai said. He and Parja didn't seem remotely surprised. Skirata had to admire his family's ability to take absolutely anything in stride. Don't want her regaining consciousness with a crowd around her, do we? Vav shook his head. Told you so. Yeah, so you did. Skirata had to look away as Hilamar eased Juzik's nose back into line. He felt that pain as the cartilage moved back into place with a definite schlick sound. But we can't dump her back on a med center, and even if we find any fed kinfolk on Concord Dawn, they won't be able to cope with her in this state. So we need a solution. What makes you think we can cure what the Valorum Center couldn't? Vav asked. We've got a vested interest in freeing her. They just wanted her off the streets. Helamar seemed to be putting on a show of good humor. He wasn't happy at all, though, and Skirata didn't have to be a Jedi to sense it. Cal, making crazy people uncrazy is a long job if it's trauma that's driven them nuts. Brain chemistry imbalances are relatively easy. You just top up the oil, pharmaceutically speaking. Bad experiences aren't as fixable. Maybe I can do it, Juzik said, his voice distorted by his broken nose. I'm good with brains. He brings Phi back from the dead, and suddenly he's a brain surgeon. Helamar winked at him. Can you visualize what's happening in her brain that causes the problem? That's how you fix Phi, isn't it? Seeing something in your mind's eye and manipulating it with the force. Juzik shrugged. Skirata was suddenly aware of Scout. She'd slipped through the press of bodies and was watching Juzik intently, as if he was saying something that nobody else could hear. It has to be possible, Juzik said. The brain's a machine. Thoughts, feelings, memories, it all comes down to chemical and electrical switches going on and off. I think we manipulate that a lot, but don't realize we're doing it. We? Scout asked. Force users. Something had grabbed her imagination. Skirata could see it written all over her face. Show's over, Adike, he said. Time to get your beauty sleep. While everyone else started drifting back to their rooms, Scout looked back at Juzik again as if she was going to ask him a question, but thought better of it. Basami hung around. I'm going to keep her sedated until we can get some sabenadone, he Lamar said. But that will just keep the lid on her at best, and maybe do her real harm at worst. That stuff's got a lot of permanent side effects. Now I'm going back to bed, and we'll take a look at her in the morning. Nobody had asked many questions about who Arla had killed. Skirata noted, as he occasionally did, that Aruatai's had a different take from Mandalorians on the violent side of life. For millennia, they'd done the jobs that were too dangerous or difficult for other folks' armies, and hunted the galaxy's most violent criminals. Killing happened. And when you made your living that way, there was always somebody waiting to kill you. In the more genteel, better-fed parts of the galaxy, a single killing kept the news and the neighbors enthralled with horror for weeks. Here, it was simply part of existence, and only the circumstances mattered. There was no glamour to being a killer, and no stigma, unless the killing had been orisomic, way beyond, too far outside the rules of acceptable Mando conduct. Arla was assumed to have her reasons until proven otherwise. But she wasn't a Mandalorian, despite her illustrious brother, and Skirata reminded himself that he knew almost nothing about her. What did you do to start her off? Bessany asked Juzik. Juzik looked a little indignant. Nothing other than being male. 
I try not to imagine what would make a woman that scared of men. Bessany fussed over Juzik's nose and made him a mug of shig. He drank it with difficulty. And what would tip her so far over the edge? Well, she doesn't stand a chance of getting any better until we find out. Maybe she's always had mental problems, Skarada said. We're assuming an awful lot. If everyone who had a horrific childhood turned into a psycho, half the galaxy would be at each other's throats. It sounded callous as soon as he said it, and he didn't mean it that way. Bessany hovered on the edge of a frown. Has Ordo called in? No. It's all on schedule. Oh well. I suppose he'll let us know in his own good time. Bessany yawned. It'll be good to have Darman and Niner around again. The place doesn't feel complete without them. Good night, Calbear. It was three in the morning. Skirata wondered what an uneventful life felt like. But his boys were coming home, and he had a brand new son in Juzik, and that kept the hurdles he had to face in some kind of perspective. This is who it's for. This is why it's worth it. Work through the problems one at a time. Eventually. How are you feeling, Bard I.K.? Skirata ruffled his hair. You want a painkiller? I'll be okay, thanks, Juzik said. Not the first black eye I've had. You should spend more time healing yourself, you know. It's not selfish. Fi still needs therapy. And I'm sure I can do something for Arla. I've just got to work out how. Calbear, if you could feel things in the force, the misery that just flows out of her is terrible. It's like she's permanently crying. Skirata found it revealing that Juzik talked about his powers in such technical terms, therapy. He saw his force abilities in terms of the real world, like a tool that obeyed the laws of physics and could be understood and explained. He'd never been all that mystic. Sometimes Skirata felt his powers embarrassed him because they weren't logical, and that he needed to nail them down and define them. If only they'd all been like him. If the Jedi had all been like Juzik, we'd never have been at war with them. Get some sleep, Bard I.K., Skirata said. He walked past Arla's room just to check things were back to what passed for normal. Murd was curled up right in front of the door, one golden eye open and watching Skirata, nostrils flaring briefly as it sampled his scent. The strill usually slept at the foot of Vav's bed. It had either been put on sentry duty or decided for itself to guard Arla's door. New York's really got a soft spot for Murd. Band the bone indeed. He missed her already. He hoped she was getting on all right with the nulls. Murd grumbled as if to reassure him that everything was under control and that he really ought to get some rest now. Rest wasn't easy. Skirata checked his chrono to work out Karuskan time and decided that Ordo would be calling in soon. Then there was Yuthan to deal with before she got too distracted by Jibad's fate to focus on what needed doing. I'm a real piece of work sometimes, aren't I? For some reason, he thought of Dread Priest, probably because he was a piece of work, too, and wondered if the Chikar had heard that his Kiwi Valdar comrades were around. Everyone at the Oyabat knew, Skirata had to assume Priest did as well. He wasn't sure just how much of a risk Priest might be. No, he likes being alive too much. And if he knows Jilamar's here, he won't want any trouble. Skirata settled down in the kitchen with a mug of shig and listened to the news feed for the latest on Jibad. There wasn't a lot to report, seeing as most of the inhabitants were dead, and any expats wouldn't exactly be rushing to the nearest off-world studio to express their outrage. Am I wrong to lean on Yithin when she's just lost her entire world? In the end, we all walk over those we don't really care about. Only difference is that I don't lie to myself about it. After a while, 
his calm link chirped. Ordo was a little early. Skirata opened the channel, wanting to hear that Dar and Niner were on their way back, but realizing that it would probably take a while to slip out of Coruscant. Imperial City, my Shebs. Corey. Sergeant? said a voice. It wasn't Ordo. The voice was familiar, a clone's, but not one of Skirata's boys. It could have been anyone. Word was probably finally getting around that there was a safe haven for deserters. It was hard to let those who needed sanctuary know where to get help and still keep Kiramorat's location a secret, but Skirata's old comlink code was known by quite a few, and there was now no way that the link could be traced to a specific location. Who wants to know? Skarata said. It's me, Maze. Formerly Captain Maze. Maze was on the wanted list. He was the last clone Skarata would have bet on to desert, but then Ark Troopers were a funny bunch. You need help, son? I heard you were running a relocation service. Skarata felt a sudden flood of relief. This was what he'd set out to do. His existence was justified. We'll get you sorted out. You want to tell me where you are? How do we handle this? We don't give coordinates over the comm. Pick an RV point, and we'll come to you. Maze paused. Fradian. The ore terminal. Might take a couple of days. Skirata couldn't get a location from Maze's comm link. But he would have been disappointed if an Ark captain wasn't cautious to the point of paranoia. You okay to hang on? Yeah. Skirata wanted to ask Maze what had made him jump ship, but that could wait. The less time they spent transmitting, the better. He'd tell Maze about the Imperial garrison when he needed to but no Ark was going to be troubled by a few Imperials for neighbors. Want to give me your comlink code? It's not showing. It's a public comm booth, Mays said. I'll call you again when I get to Fradian. He could have been anywhere then, and he had his reasons for not saying. Skirata closed the link and smiled to himself. The waifs and strays were coming home at last. Everything was going to work out fine, he knew it. Come on, Ordike, he murmured, glancing at his chrono. Call me. Tell me my boys are on their way. Freight Vessel Park, Quadrant G80, Imperial City. New York wished she'd sprung for a better security system for Cornucopia. The freighter's external cams gave her a limited view of the outside world just the critical areas she needed to keep an eye on for safety. The cargo ramp, the drive exhausts, the ground immediately beneath the landing struts, and the main hatch. As she sat fretting about who might be lurking in the yard waiting to arrest her, she realized just how much she couldn't see. It'll be dark in a few hours, too. Relax, New York. Pretty I looked engrossed in his data pad, but he had even better peripheral vision than she thought. The eggs won't break. In the hold, a complete pallet of assorted eggs, Nuna, Marlello, even meal-sized Ganza eggs, was secured to the deck. New York hoped the rest of the tasks on her list would be as easy as getting the groceries. If she'd known how long they were going to be stuck here, she'd have stocked up with a lot more supplies. It's not broken eggs I'm worried about, she said. It's other broken things like legs and necks. The big illuminated sign on the opposite side of the compound really bothered her. It was the only new, shiny thing she could see in the area, which still bore signs of cannon damage from the failed separatist invasion, blast-pocked walls and gaps in the rows of buildings like missing teeth. The sign showed a kindly but serious cop and a stormtrooper, side by side, guardians of the new imperial peace with the words, suspicious? Out of place? Report it. 
be the Empire's eyes and ears. The posters were big, bright, and everywhere. It gave her the creeps. Cheapens the military image, doesn't it? Jane flexed his shoulders as if the new armor was too tight. The nulls were more heavily built than the average trooper, and New York wondered when the recreational eating at Kiramura was going to show up on their waistlines. They'll have Stormies issuing parking tickets next. New York reached across and twanged his belt. I'd really recommend trying the concealed tanks for size, boys. The Jedi found it a tight squeeze. And we'll have six strapping lads to hide on the way out. Not for long, pretty I said. And these suits are atmosphere tight for half an hour. New York had visions of the clones clinging to the outside of the ship like Salgari Street kids sneaking free rides on transport speeders. You're going to have to draw me a picture. Means they can withstand immersion, too. Who's going to look for illegals in a full water reservoir? Or a full fuel tank come to that? That's just mad, New York said. The idea made her shudder. That fuel was liquid trimoceratate, not as volatile as liquid metal, but nasty enough. You're off your criffing heads. We can't help it, Berike. Prodiai stood with his finger pressed into his ear. He was just listening to the audio feed from Niner, but he handed up into a credible impression of a lunatic. The Iowa bait built us crazy. Mario raised an eyebrow. As long as I don't have to hide in the waste tank. They might not even try to board us, Bordo said. And your faith in imperial procurement quality is disturbing. Mariel didn't take the bait. Everyone's a comedian. So what's the plan now? New York asked. We just sit here. She was defying an emperor who'd wiped out a planet for arguing with him, and she was scared that she'd be the weak link that compromised the whole mission. The Nulls could stroll through this without breaking a sweat, but she was in danger of letting them down by looking like she had something to hide when they had to clear departure checks. Waiting wasn't easy. It gave her too much worry time. Yeah, we just sit here, Jane said. Unless Niner calls for assistance. Ordo was never chatty. He was staring at the bulkhead chrono, counting down to something else entirely, his scheduled sit-up call to Skirata. Every six hours, on the dot, he come to Kiramura to update him. New York watched his gaze fixed on the seconds on the chrono display. Five, four, three, two. Calbir? Everything's fine here. You've seen the news on Jibad, I assume. Jane, Prudiai, and Mariel seemed to be ignoring the conversation. Prudiai was listening to Niner's audio feed while he read a technical manual and made notes in the margin. Jane and Mariel were watching something on Jane's datapad screen. My, Jane said, all smug satisfaction. Hasn't my little backdoor program been busy? It's always gratifying when your offspring come of age and branch out on their own. Is that the second one you fed into the system? New York asked. They were so trusting, the Republic. So innocent. What's it found? You sure you want to know? With much knowledge comes bad stomach acid. Skirata had explained how Jane had acquired the clan's vast fortune by skimming off just a cred, sometimes half, from trillions of bank accounts via the galactic clearing system. It was, by anyone's standards, a bank robbery on a grand scale, theft, fraud, a very wrong thing. If Jane had walked into a branch of the core bank and hosed the staff with a blaster before making off with bags of credit chips, New York would have classed him as a criminal. But when she watched him so clearly delighting in his technical genius, all she could see was a nice young man who'd had the worst imaginable start in life, 
and who was now redressing the balance in favor of other young men just like him. Scarata called it social taxation. New York tried to work out just how far the Nulls would have to go before she'd find them frightening or repellent. But they were professional killers and saboteurs, however kind to animals and polite to old ladies, unashamedly dangerous men who were bred to be lethal. New York just happened to be within their defensive circle, not a target beyond that protective boundary. Would they kill me if they thought I was a threat to Scarata's scheme? She knew the answer, even if they didn't. Bankrupting palps again? She said carefully. More like searching through his drawers. Jane smiled. He keeps a lot in them, or at least his idiot minions do. Every citizen on a database, data shared among departments, clerks who use their pet axe name for passwords. Once you get past the first level of security, you can just wander around stripping whatever you want from the system. Treasury data, banking, personal details on imperial employees, procurement plans, government speeder pool schedules. You'd be amazed how this stuff all builds a picture. No, I wouldn't, because I was spying on KDY for you lot, remember? New York said. So you were. Mariel smiled. Calbert likes his ladies a bit risky. Ordo was taking no notice of them, still deep in conversation with Scarada. He seemed to be listening more than talking, eyes shut occasionally as if he was struggling to concentrate. New York heard him say, Well, that's a surprise. Okay, bear. Ordo out. That was worrying in itself. Ordo had everything nailed down and under control. He was never surprised by anything as far as New York could tell. What's a surprise? Mariel asked. Ordo sat down and stretched out his legs. Guess who's asking for sanctuary? Maze. New York couldn't recall meeting Captain Maze. The other clones gave her the impression that he was humorless and lonely, although Fi said he was all right for an alpha plank, whatever that meant. Ordo seemed to have grudging respect for him. He described him as persistent. Really? Said Mariel. He must be missing you, Ordike. Calbear's working out how to get him to Mandalore. He didn't head straight there. Odd. Maybe he thought it was too obvious a location for Kiramorat. And you, Jane. Calbear wants to know if your program can trawl for Arla's criminal record. He wants the details of the murders. She attacked Bardike, and the more background they have, the better the chance of rehabilitating her. New York was appalled. Is he okay? Broken nose and a few scratches. He's fine. Pretty Eye shook his head, clearly dubious about the whole thing. New York got the feeling that the Nulls accepted Arla because Scarada's word was law, but that left to their own devices they wouldn't have rescued her. If she comes after me with a meat cleaver, Muriel said, I might forget my manners. Nobody mentioned Jibad or how Yuthan had taken the news. The only question was probably how disabling the shock had been, and whether the scientist was able to get on with her task. The promise of being allowed to return home had been all that was keeping her going. Prudy Eyes suddenly held up a finger for quiet, staring in defocus at the bulkhead as he concentrated on the audio feed. Hey, Niner's on the move, he said. Melusers called him and Dar into a briefing. Just them? Ordo asked. Not the others? Sounds like it. Maybe they're the flavor of the month for finishing off Camus. Big prize. We've got a few hours yet. Whatever it is, we can wait for them. Ordo folded his arms and looked relaxed enough to nod off. The Nulls seemed to treat this level of danger as absolutely normal, and New York envied their cool confidence. Scarada had done a great job of raising them to believe that they could do absolutely anything. The fact that she'd come here with them was proof of that. 
They made walking into the emperor's front yard and scamming him in broad daylight seem routine. Night was the best time to do this kind of op, Wardo said, but New York had always been a little afraid of the dark. Humans had evolved with that hardwired fear for a reason. The dark was dangerous. She adjusted her seat so that she could see all the security cam outputs on the bulkhead, expecting a rap on the hatch at any time and the sound of a loud hailer demanding that she exit the freighter, put her hands behind her head, and surrender. So what's on the chip, do you reckon? Mariel said. Names, places, codes? You'd think they'd memorize things and not record them. Jane shook his head. They never learn. Good old Jaller. Pretty I murmured. But one day soon, we're going to need to get him out of here. He's going to get caught. Ordo glanced out of the viewplate. Cornucopia was too high off the ground for anyone to see into the cockpit, and New York had made sure the ship was turned away from the security cams. They seemed to be a token gesture. Nobody parked valuable vessels or cargo in this yard. It was too easy to enter. That was why she chose it. Just when you think that all Oridiais are the same, Bordo said, you find another one who puts their life on the line for you. New York reflected on that, stomach churning, and saw herself from the outside for a few moments, a crazy old widow with a beat-up ship, smuggling enemies of the state, hanging out with a gang of assassins and thieves, trying to outsmart a dictator who killed whole planets to make a point. At her age, she should have been knitting vests for Cad I.K. and telling him stories. But terrified or not, crazy or not, it made her feel thirty years younger. 501st Legion Special Unit Barracks, Imperial City Commander Melissa's small office had a dead, muffled silence that made Niner feel that his ears had blocked up. The walls were covered in sheets of flimsy, charts, lists, calendars. A single desk lamp and a holochart projection lit Melissa's face from below and made him look cadaverous. It all felt like a dressing-down session waiting to happen. Reasons in writing with no CAF, Skirata called it, a terse could do better speech from your seal. Niner held his helmet under his arm, system still active, wondering how much the Nulls would be able to hear. Camus was your commanding officer, wasn't he? Said Melissa. He didn't sound in dressing down mode, though. can have been easy facing him like that. This had to be a test, then. Niner was determined to pass it long enough to get to the extraction point. Melusser seemed like a nice enough guy, but Niner and Darman had plenty to hide, and so any figure of imperial authority was a threat until proven otherwise. Two of our old squad on the run. Our sergeant and everyone we know, all on the death list. Even Zay didn't trust us completely. Why should Melusser... We weren't conscious at the time, sir, Niner said. Melissa looked up from the holochart. He was moving virtual markers around with a stylus, each green point of light representing the last known whereabouts of an escaped Jedi. The green lights were dwindling in number. Sorry? We were put in stasis when we got back from Geonosis, then revived three months into the war, Niner said. So we didn't see much of Camus. General Zay was our CO for most of the time. And there was something he had to add, because Melissa's observation didn't make sense unless he was stupid, which he clearly wasn't, or trying to entrap them. Most troops had to take out their own Jedi officers, so it was no harder for us than it was for them. Easier, actually, sir. Camus was firing at us. Omega hadn't carried out Order 66, of course. They'd been too busy trying to desert. Niner had a terrible sick feeling in his gut as he was reminded just how close this was becoming to a rerun of that awful night. But it's about doing the job, Sergeant, Melissa said. It's about being a professional. And you're still here when others aren't. 
Only a civvy would have thought of Order 66 in simple terms of either unflinching loyalty or cruel betrayal. It was either. It was complicated. It was the sort of complicated you could only truly grasp if you were standing there with a rifle in your hands, if all your buddies were dead, if you understood exactly why orders weren't optional. And it was the sort of complicated you just didn't have time to debate and second-guess in the middle of a crisis. That was why you drilled. That was why you had orders. It was to make sure situations, and soldiers, didn't fall apart when things got tough. There were clones who liked their Jedi officers, or hated them, or didn't know them well enough to have an opinion. And there were clones who felt the Jedi had simply used up troopers' lives in their plan to overthrow the government. But most of them carried out the order, and for one reason, lawful orders couldn't be ignored when you felt like it. The army was there to do the bidding of elected governments, not to decide policy for itself. Orders came from those who had the bigger picture when you didn't. But we didn't obey. Nothing to do with some moral stand. Everything to do with wanting to get away, and not wanting to kill two ex-Jedi who gave up everything for us. Our buddy. And Dar's wife. Niner didn't feel good about that. Part of him now wondered if fate was punishing him for letting the other squads down. They'd behaved like pros, whether it had broken their hearts or not, and Omega hadn't. Darman stood to Niner's right, saying nothing. Got a job to do, sir, Niner said noncommittally. He could smell a fresh herb scent like tea and the metallic aroma of ink or copying fluid. No heroics. Just the job. Well, I'm still impressed you got Camus, Melissa said. He seemed to want to be got, sir. Oh, he'd have made a run for it if he could have. But Intel's pretty sure that the ranger escaped possibly with some Padawans. They'd been piecing together ship movements that coincided with your raid. Latest analysis says Kester's shipping escapees from planet to planet and then to a couple of masters, Altus or Vamilad. Niner felt the hidden data chip gnawing away at his pocket. He was so used to dealing with Jedi officers that he expected Melissa to be able to sense his deception, but Melissa was a regular guy and that changed things. Melusser tapped his stylus on the holochart control. One more green light winked out of existence. You know why removing Camus was a coup, Niner? Because every Jedi Master we remove lessens the chances of the Order rebuilding itself. Without the Masters, the cult starts to die. They've learned all the tricks. If they can't pass them on, can't organize, it's over. Cut off the head and the body eventually dies. Niner wasn't sure about that. But the knights are pretty smart, too. As long as there's one Jedi out there, they'll know enough of the basics to find Force sensitives and train them. Exactly. Melusa looked at Darman and then nodded to himself, smiling. They're all a risk. Niner couldn't work out if Melusa was testing him or leading up to some revelation. We'll do whatever we're tasked to do, sir. Jedi don't have numbers on their side now, Niner, and they don't have the taxpayer bankrolling ships and arms for them. They'll hide for a while and lick their wounds. But then they have to do two things, contact other Jedi to regroup, and then latch on to mundane beings to mount an insurgency. They need an army to do their dirty work for them. They'll sniff out dissent wherever they can find it ferment it, and ride it. Nobody who's that used to power can ever give it up. Niner understood that only too well. On Kalura, Zay and Etain had trained and organized the locals to fight the separatist occupation. They called it a resistance. When the Seps did the same thing against the Republic, that was called exporting terror. Niner just saw it all as combat by any means available although he knew whose side he was on at any given time. They're as bad as each other. And we're always the meat that gets minced between the two. 
Sir, I don't understand, he said. Are these new orders? Are we going to be tracking Jedi by looking for insurgent hot spots? Everything we discuss in this room goes no farther. That's a given, sir. Not even to your squad mates. That felt pretty uncomfortable. A squad shared everything. Niner never liked agreeing to anything before he knew what it was, but he was deserting in a few hours, so this was either intel he might be able to make use of in his new life, or something he could forget the moment New York Valen's ship left orbit. Darman just watched, probably doing his best not to lose it, Niner supposed. It couldn't have been easy to listen to a casual conversation about Order 66. Did Melissa know? Did he know about Etienne, who she'd been, what had happened to her? Niner racked his brains to think who might have been around and able to gossip. No clones, that was certain, but there'd been a lot of CSF cops around, and however tight-lipped they were under Obram's command, everyone talked sooner or later. Understood, sir, Niner said. Sergeant, this office is soundproofed and I sweep it for surveillance devices every time I open the door. Melissa was a man after Niner's own heart. This really is between us. Wow, he's jumpy. Or he's going to shake us down. Got it, sir. Your squad was very close to General Juzik, wasn't it? Give me your assessment of him. Niner's gut almost tied itself in a complete knot now. It didn't show on his face, he was sure of that, because clones learned in Topoka City how to present a bland face to the Kaminoans. For the ordinary troopers, it saved them from being reconditioned. For commandos protected by their ferocious training sergeants, it was just a habit, but a useful one. Depends what you mean, sir. As a soldier? As a Jedi. He left the order, sir. He was ashamed of it in the end. Argued with the masters, told Zay they'd lost their moral authority. Didn't want to be a Jedi anymore. If you're wondering if he'd be regrouping survivors, no, not him. It was true. Niner just hoped he hadn't said it with too much conviction, though. Just curious. I'd heard he walked out, and walking away from power is pretty unusual in most species. Melissa seemed to back off. Niner was now on full alert. Remember that not all Force users are Jedi, and they're not all on the run. Some of them are right here pretending to be on our side. But I don't buy that. The only side they tend to be on is their own. Niner just concentrated on the green lights of the holochart so that he didn't blurt out something he'd regret. Does he mean Vader? Does he know about Palpatine? If he does, he's going to be a dead man. Shame. But I can help him now. Niner was now painfully aware of the chrono ticking, delaying his escape, but at least the Nulls would know why he and Darman might be running late. You're very quiet, you two. Darman suddenly came to life, scaring the Asik out of Niner. He had no idea what was going to come out of Dar's mouth next. We haven't got a lot to say, sir. You know why I'm telling you all this? No, sir. Because I need a few men I can trust in difficult times. Melissa's understatement almost reminded Niner of Vav. I don't doubt any trooper's loyalty and discipline, but sometimes we'll need to do things without intel noticing. And from what I've heard over the last year or two, you fit the bill. You had a very independent sergeant in Skirata. You were completely loyal to him and to the Grand Army. By some extraordinary process, all your Republic records, helmet logs, and everything else relating to your service has now disappeared from the defense mainframe. Melissa paused. I know enough about you from the war. You didn't desert when you could have with the others, but you haven't betrayed Skirata now, either. That can't be easy. Melissa had no idea just how not easy that was. 
Niner felt horribly ashamed as he hovered on the brink of making an excuse to leave. To desert. He still couldn't shake the feeling that this was entrapment. But then Melissa was taking a big risk confiding in them that he was planning to sideline Intel. This was his first day as their boss. He obviously didn't believe in hanging around. What do you want from us, sir? Niner said. He only had to keep this up for an hour or two at most. Just say the word. I'm not convinced that Intel is free of force users. They think we mundane folk don't notice, but I can usually spot them. So, sometimes I'm going to have to task you without their knowledge, because they can never be on the side of the average citizen. They're trying to recruit more of their own force-using kind. Or at least that's how I've interpreted their request to bring the zealous Jedi and other small fry back alive. Melusa oozed contempt. Personally, I'd rather spend the security budget on more accounts. Business as usual. Omega and the Nulls had spent the whole war keeping things from Intel, and from the Senior Command, too. And it wasn't because they were Force users. But Melissa really had it in for everyone with Force powers. Niner wondered what had happened to him to make him so unusually rabid. His arguments made perfect sense, but he meant that distrust and dislike with every cell in his body. It oozed from him. Are you comfortable with that? Melissa asked quietly. We understand perfectly, sir, Darman said before Niner could respond. Excellent. Melissa seemed genuinely relieved. Pity that we don't have the principal General Juzik on staff. A force user who doesn't want power would be very useful. Niner hoped Ordo picked that up. The comment could have meant anything. It might have been an oblique offer to Juzik, which, of course, Bardai K would have the sense not to accept. It might have been a setup. Niner was beginning to resent everything about this world for making him doubt and question every single word said to him. He wanted to live in a society where hello just meant hello. But he needed to seize his chance. Now seemed a good time. Sir, he said. During the war, our commanders let us go into town when we were off duty. Do you mind if we do that? It's not even mentioned in the regs, so... Melissa slapped Niner's shoulder as if his conscience had been pricked. Of course, Sergeant. A man's got to relax and have an ale from time to time. Good for the soul. Maybe take Reed with you. I worry for these youngsters. Niner had to get out, right now, before he dug himself in too deep. Thank you, sir. Dismissed. And don't worry so much. You're still the soldiers you were, and everyone respects that. Darman matched Niner's hasty escape down the corridor, striding as fast as he could without breaking into a run. He's really down on force users, Darman said. Do you blame him? No. Dar seemed to be chewing something over as he walked. He stared at a point a few meters ahead. But they're all the same, aren't they? Jedi, Sith, doesn't matter who's in charge as far as most folks are concerned. The Force users run the show, at least behind the scenes, and never us. You think the Jedi ran the Republic? You said a Sith did? The Jedi were the enforcers even before Palps. It doesn't matter now. No, I suppose not. Are you okay? No, I'm scared stiff. This galaxy's falling apart. Dar dropped his voice as they turned into the mess lobby. My kid. What's going to happen to my kid? You heard what Holy Roly said. He can't even trust until now. We've swapped one rotten regime for another. Welcome to the real world, Niner said. But there's always a door marked exit. They didn't need to take anything with them. 
they didn't have anything of value anyway. Niner had to keep his helmet on to maintain calms to the ship. Reed was busy cleaning his boots when they walked into the squad room. He looked up, wide-eyed. No, science couldn't possibly cram enough into these Sparty clones in a year. Per kid, they were walking out on him when he needed them most. Ennin wasn't around. Are you going to show me some vibroblade techniques, Sarge? Reed asked. I'm a fast learner. Tomorrow, Niner said. He felt awful. Now he had to lie completely. We're just going for a recce around town. Old buddies to check up on. We'll be back before lights out. Reed frowned slightly, but went on cleaning. The truly weird thing was that he seemed to be changing before Niner's eyes. He really was learning by the minute. In the space of a day, he picked up habits and gestures. Whatever medical science tried to do to human beings to speed up their development, they still had to go through that process of learning from adults around them and then fitting in with the tribe. Reed was just doing it faster than a Camino clone. And we did it faster than mongrels. See you later, Darman said. He was pretty convincing. Niner put his helmet back on as they walked through the main doors and headed for the perimeter gate. Beyond that lay what had been Galactic City, now Imperial City, and Niner could probably have counted the number of times he'd walked out into that civilian world on one hand. He opened the secure comm link. Ordo? You receiving? We're on our way. Nice excuse, by the way. Ordo sounded relaxed. We picked up most of that cozy chat. What an affable fellow Holy Roly is. He's crazy, Niner said. He's going to be running his own private army. Jang interrupted. I'm shocked, I tell you. Who'd abuse their command privileges so shamelessly? And guess what? His family's from Dramankas. You won't find that in your database, Naviodi, because it wasn't even on Republic charts. The place is run by dark side widows called the Prophets. They make sure their prophecies of doom and dark destruction come true. Now, I'm no psychologist, but between the saber jockeys and the mad monks, I think I can guess what shaped your boss's bad attitude to our paranormally gifted friends. Pity he's on the wrong side, Bordo said. Calbear would like him. Calbear's never going to get the chance. Niner picked up speed as they passed through the security gates. We're coming home, Vode. Oi, Amanda, Mariel said approvingly. I hope you two don't mind hiding in a water tank while we exfil. They were going to Mandalore. Niner could rarely recall being excited, but this was like nothing else he'd ever known. It was a leap into a new life, one he couldn't begin to imagine, and just not knowing was a thrill in itself. He thought that was odd for a man whose nickname was Worry Guts. He'd try farming. Fishing. Bounty hunting, if he got bored with the rural life. And he'd find a nice girl, just like Fi had. Fi. He hadn't seen his brother in nearly two years. And Darman, Niner didn't ask, because he didn't need to. Dar was going to be reunited with his son. What did Ordo have to say? Darman asked. He was shut out of the secure link, but he could guess Niner was talking to the Nulls. Everything okay? It's all going fine, Niner said, regretting that he'd never get to ask Holy Roly what had happened back home to make him bitter enough to defy force using intel agents. Soon be home. 10. There's something unusual about that clone Darman. I can't quite place it, but he feels different. I get an unusual sense of force users woven into his being, and he reacts to me as if he senses what I am which is impossible. He may be dangerous. Keep a close eye on him. 
Sao Cuis, Emperor's Hand, shortly before his death on a mission to test the new Lord Vader's resolve. Kiramorat Mandalore. Have you been here all night? Hilamar asked. Yuthan looked up from her notes, elbows on the lab bench, head propped on her hands. In front of her, she had the rough sketch of the level 10 containment unit she needed to safely recreate the virus that had been unleashed on Jiabad. More or less, she said. How's it going? He pulled up a stool and sat down next to her, laying his hand on hers with the kind of firm grip he probably reserved for his drinking buddies rather than women. It was still comforting to have someone hold your hand when your world, in every sense, was in tatters. She hadn't pegged him as the hand-holding type. I wasn't expecting you to be working on this. But yes, it helps. After Tanny was killed, I think I read every paper on pituitary tumors in the Republic Institute. I'm working on justice, Yuthan said. And I don't mean the clone's problem. Palpatine wants to play dirty? Fine. Helamar glanced at the diagram. You going to explain? He was a Mandalorian. He'd understand. He wouldn't spout some high-minded piety and tell her that brutal vengeance just brought her down to her enemy's level. He'd want to eliminate future threats. She liked him a lot. I'm working out the fastest way to recreate and manufacture the Phase 1 FG-36 virus, she said. And then I'm going to let it loose on Coruscant. Understood, he said, nodding. Of course, once I've got a few canisters, I'll need transport to the core. It's a very economical virus. You can accelerate its spread by airborne distribution or just seed a few carriers and let it progress at its own pace. Incubation period six days or so in humans, infectious for six weeks, designed to work through an entire population and defeat normal quarantine measures. Go on, tell me how clever I am for building such a stealthy pathogen. She waited for him to explain why she should just stay home and bide her time, all comforting and sensible. But he just nodded again. I'd do the same, I think, except with something that made a lot more noise and flame. He picked up the data pad and looked as if he was calculating what materials were needed. It's a really simple process, then. What did you base the virus on? It's a modified version of Nibelia. That just causes minor respiratory tract problems and diarrhea. It's not fatal. It is after I've done a little nip and tuck on its DNA. Clever girl. All I need is a sample of Nibelia and the cell culture to host the virus, preferably Jespolides ectalis, and I can grow industrial quantities of the strain within weeks. Great value, bioweapons, expensive on the R&D side, of course, but dirt cheap on production. You could just propagate monon spores, of course, he Lamar said. Naturally occurring and patent-free. You know, Midge, I'm not sure if you're encouraging me, mocking me, or humoring me. I'm just seeing the downside of this, but also wanting you to avenge your world and kick Palps so hard up his shebs that his eyeballs rattle. Helamar shut his eyes for a moment. There's only so many times I can say how sorry I am. You don't need to be told how bad it is. I think you're the kind of woman who needs to get even. Yuthan liked that honesty. She felt she could say whatever was on her mind in return, and he'd never take offense. It'd be a great deterrent for Mandalore to hold. You know what? I think we'd rather have an antiviral first. Because Palps knows his toy really works now. He might want to play with it again. Yuthan had worked out that Mandos regarded biological and chemical weapons as beneath contempt, a coward's tactic deployed from the safety of an armchair. But they were too pragmatic a people to have any warrior ethic objection to doing things the easy way. Would Mandalore use a biological weapon? She asked. 
We prefer sharp things, pointed things, and noisy things that we can see from about 20 clicks away, preferably resulting in a big ball of flame. Helamar looked utterly dejected despite his chirpy tone. She found it odd to have a relative stranger mourning with her. Trouble with the invisible stuff is that you don't actually know where it is, or what it's doing, or what happens after you let it loose. If I'd had any sense, I'd have made the immunogen at the same time as I developed the virus. But even if I had, I had no way of getting it to Jibad. Fai and his friends captured me long before then. Helamar ignored the irony. I think that antiviral is pretty urgent now. Agreed. What do you need to produce it? He was a kind man, but he wasn't letting her off the hook. He was right, of course. Ironically, developing a vaccine is the most dangerous and rebellious thing you can do to the Empire now. I just manipulated two genes in a naturally occurring nanoscale virus. Yuthan turned her data pad back the right way up and calculated a few more dimensions. We still need to hold a live virus, so we need some extra safety precautions. But FG36 latches onto a single protein in human DNA, and the protein can be made resistant by one gene mutation. I can induce that gene mutation in a population with an engineered virus. Based on something easily transmissible and low-grade, like rhinocerian fever. Very few humanids have resistance to it. A day or two of a runny nose and itchy eyes, which is far preferable to dying of internal hemorrhaging and involuntary muscle paralysis. How fast? Weeks. How easy to treat the population? Vaccination's best if you can herd 4 million mandos. It would probably be simpler to let it loose and rely on human carriers to spread it. Or do what Palpatine did, disperse it in the air. But that requires a lot of equipment, and someone will notice. Okay, give me your shopping list, he said. I'll get the stuff as soon as I can. And then how about wiping out Coruscant? First things first. There was a timid knock on the door. Yuthan looked up to see Scout in the doorway, and hoped the girl hadn't heard the conversation. It felt indecent to discuss plans for mass murder in front of a Jedi. Yuthan wasn't sure why she reacted that way, seeing as she had little respect for the Jedi Order playing enforcer for the Republic. But Scout was a scared child and that diffused Yuthan at an instinctive level. I wondered if you wanted breakfast, Scout said. I'll bring it here if you like. Peace and quiet. You too, Midge. Thanks, Adik, he Lamar said. You've got a good heart. Yuthan listened until the sound of Scout's boots faded. Then she looked at Helamar. What a strange little group we are, clinging together. All loss and loneliness. Everyone's lonely until they find kindred spirits. I think this is a community of folks who've had enough and can't run anymore. I'm truly grateful for your kindness, Midge. It's as if everyone's conveniently forgotten what I actually do for a living. Helamar shrugged. Most folks here have taken another being's life. I think that includes the Force users, too. How's Arla doing? Not good. Her past seems to be coming back to her, and it sure ain't happy memories. Scout came back a lot sooner than Yithin expected. She caught herself feeling indignant, and then plunged into burning guilt for getting too engrossed in Helamar when there were so many dead. But there was a void in her misery, a gap in the connection to the loss of her world that translated into aching, inconsolable grief for loved ones. She was upset, shocked, horrified and raged, but she felt her sorrow was a fraud, because her personal loss was minimal. I have no right to sympathy. Cecily was a distant cousin she saw once a year out of duty, the nearest she had to a family. 
Somewhere, her ex-husband and in-laws lay dead too, but she hadn't spoken to them in ten years. There were colleagues from the university. But there were no close friends. Yuthan felt like a Hollywood fan sobbing over a dead actor, mourning someone she didn't even know, appropriating grief. Her life had been lived out in a laboratory and fixated on achievement, and now it was barren in every sense of the word. Eggs, Scout said, putting the plates down in a clear space on the workbench. Last of the Nuna ones until New York gets back. Thank you. Yuthan noted that even New York had found a niche here. We won't starve yet. Some tragedies were so huge that mention of them was superfluous. Yuthan could sense Scout's awkwardness, not knowing what was appropriate at a time like this, so Yuthan broke the silence that followed. I have to manufacture an antiviral, she said. In case the Empire decides to use the virus here, would you be interested in helping me? Scout gave her a wary look. Does it involve cutting up animals? No. Not at all. I just tinker with a virus, and then put it in a plant cell culture. The more the cells multiply, the more of the beneficial virus we get. Back to the agricore, Scout said. I'm great with plants. That's what we need most, he Lamar said. Actually, this would be a yeast. But I'm splitting hairs. Are you interested in medicine? Scout seemed genuinely curious. Did Bardan really repair Fi's brain damage with the Force? Watched it happen, he Lemaire said. Measured it. Truly amazing. It must be wonderful to be able to heal. I'm not strong in the Force, though. I hate to break it to you, but most medicine in the galaxy is practiced by regular dolts like me. Using pretty ordinary equipment, he Lamar said. And tinnies, of course. Med droids outnumber qualified wets. The force is an extra therapy, that's all. You fancy learning a little first aid? Always comes in handy. Scout nodded. There wasn't a lot for her to do here, Yuthan thought but then she realized she had no idea what Jedi normally did to keep themselves busy. Perhaps Scout was reflecting on a life without much personal contact in it, too. But she was young enough to avoid ending up like Yuthan. I'd like that, Scout said. I can't stand the thought of any more killing. Helamar nodded. Me neither. I'll teach you the clever stuff. Yuthan said. Doc Mando here can cover lancing boils and setting bones. My world's dead. I don't have any stake in the future. No children, no academic legacy, no hope, nothing. There was something compelling in the chance to teach a youngster. It felt like planting trees. It was never wasted effort. If the teacher was lucky, the pupil went on to change the galaxy for the better. Yuthan clung to that thought. It didn't mean she wouldn't give Palpatine what he had coming to him as soon as she got the chance, though. But Scout had no need to be taught about the art of revenge. Imperial City Nobody looked too hard at armed Imperial commandos walking through the alleyways of Imperial City. Civilians seemed to be very busy not noticing Darman and Niner walking briskly down the walkway that linked the cantinas and restaurants of Quadrant G-14 with the increasingly grim sector two kilometers north of the RV point. Factories and warehouses sat between residential blocks and the occasional rundown alcohol store. It wasn't the kind of place anyone expected to see stormtroopers of any description. Police patrolled here occasionally but not troops. They're scared of us, Niner said. Darman couldn't see his POV icon because they'd switched off most of their helmet feeds, 
except their private short-range calm. They were supposed to be out on the town for the evening and off the chart, not wandering around somewhere they definitely shouldn't have been. Okay, we never had welcome home parades under the Republic, but I don't recall anyone looking afraid of us. You think they even realize he's a Chikar? As long as there's a good holodrama on the net, and they can afford enough ale to fall over on a regular basis, they don't give a moth's shebs about pounces. You feel it? The whole place is different. Wary. Not like it used to be. Used to be was based on a few rare forays into this alien world outside the perimeter. Darman had never been part of civilian Coruscant, and he didn't think he missed much. The Empire was no different from the Republic for men like him. And civilians got the governments they deserved. They're not my problem now. I did my duty. The Seps didn't overrun us. Now the civvies can worry about their own welfare, and I'll look after me and mine. Darman was back being Darman now, the real Darman, the one who could feel the pain of losing his wife. Now that he'd confronted the grief a few times and let it rip his heart out, he was starting to function again without needing to detach from reality. He was still hurting. But he found a little space opening up in his mind that had room for planning, for focus, for taking action instead of just being swamped by loss. I have a son, and everyone's a threat to him. Palpatine The Intel Freak Show Any Jedi or Force user who wants new recruits. Any clone master who wants to use him. I know what I have to do. Melissa's right. I know it. We all get used. The farther Darman walked, the more uneasy he felt. Would you believe New York's done some grocery shopping? Niner said suddenly. He seemed to be talking to the nose again. Darman couldn't hear him when he switched to the secure circuit. They're doing an extraction behind enemy lines, and they find time to shop. Tell Ordo he didn't need to show up mob-handed. We could extract ourselves. Niner fell silent for a moment. Ordo says Calber got fed up waiting. Your dinner's in the oven. If we're late, the stroke gets it. Darman could hear the tension in Niner's voice. The muscles tightened in his throat, and it forced his voice a little higher. And he swallowed a lot. Swallowing sounded much louder in these new helmets. Darman couldn't decide if his brother was nervous or excited, but either state was unusual for Niner. We're going home, Niner said. He sounded as if he didn't believe it. For real. Everyone back together, like it ought to be. The rest of the squad. Calbear. Even Vav. Cad's going to go crazy when he sees you, Shab, I bet he's grown a lot. They grow fast at that age, don't they? Darman tried to stifle the thought that was eating its way out of that clear corner of his mind. He wasn't winning. The thought was a voice, not a real one, nothing insane or frightening, but a voice all the same. It was his common sense, his duty, the core of reality that never let go. He'd been able to bury it for a while. But it never went away. It was the voice that had no doubts and told him to stop kidding himself. He couldn't do what he wanted. That wasn't because he was a slave, but because he was a free man. It was responsibility. Can I face Cad? I couldn't save Etain. I bust my gut saving a world that doesn't care if I live or die, and I let my own wife down. How do I tell him? How do I look at him and not see her? Darman had to be sure why he wasn't as excited as Niner. 
He didn't have time to mess around like this. In ten minutes, they'd be at the RV point. I can't board that ship. I can't leave. I need to stay here, inside the system, for Cad's sake. Darman walked on another fifty meters before he stopped and faced the inevitable. He came to a halt opposite a cantina. Light spilled onto the walkway from an open door, and the illuminated sign that took up an entire wall had so many broken tubes that he had to stare at it for a few moments to realize it was supposed to be a giant cocktail glass garnished with fruit. Niner walked on past him for a few paces before turning. What's wrong, Dar? I'm not going. As soon as the words escaped, Darman felt better. Not happier, his stomach churned, threatening nausea. That was how much it hurt to know his son was waiting for him, and that he wouldn't see him for, he just didn't know how long. Maybe never. I have to stay. Shab Dar, what's brought this on? Niner didn't seem to believe him. He just sounded mildly annoyed, and caught Darman's arm as if he was dawdling and needed some encouragement. Come on. Move it. Darman shook him off. I mean it, Niner. Spit it out. What's the problem? Unfinished business. What business? Jedi, Sith, any Shabir like that. What? It's not over. Cad's always going to be in danger from them. And you're going to rid the galaxy of midi-chlorians single-handed? Dar, in case you hadn't noticed, there are millions of guys who can look after that. I think they can cope without us. But they're not me. This is my duty. My son. Oh, don't start that Asik again. We all agreed. Remember? Look, I know it's not turned out as we planned, but we've got lives to lead, and Cad's waiting for you. The Empire doesn't need you like he does. It was so painful that Darman felt himself shutting down again, doing that ramicadic detachment trick just to cope with the next few seconds, and the next. I'll just be one more rifle on Mandalore. Cad's got an army protecting him. More firepower than anyone needs. But here, Darman noticed that Niner kept putting his hand to the side of his helmet as if he was cupping his earpiece, a nervous tick when he was under stress. Ordo could hear one side of the argument. He was probably pitching in with his ten creds worth, urging Niner to shut Darman up and get him to the RV point. I'm at the heart of it. I'll never be any closer to the threats than I am here. Melissa understands. He knows the score. I don't believe this. Niner snarled. Your kid needs you. If I hadn't been injured that night, you'd have left with the others and be with him now. You know how that makes me feel? That you abandoned your boy to stay with me? I feel like Osik. Now quit the speeches and get your shebs on that freighter. The nulls are risking their necks to get us out. Niner turned and walked away. He got about five paces before he realized Darman wasn't budging. Niner was the most solid, steady guy Darman knew, and he'd never seen him really lose it for all his grumbling and griping, but he was definitely on the edge now. He shoved Darman back against the wall and shook him a couple of times. You selfish Shabir. Move, or so help me I'll punch you out and drag you there. Niner didn't mean the selfish bit, even if he meant the rest. Darman could hear the desperation in his voice. But he still wasn't going. He was inside the system, in a place where he could spy and sabotage and intercept, and that be trying to defend Kirimura when it was too late. I mean that, don't I? It's not that I don't have the guts to be a proper father. Is it? Darman had spent a matter of hours with his son. Not days, not weeks, hours. 
He wondered if the cat in his imagination bore any resemblance to the real child, or if he was just devoted to the idea of him. But that wasn't the issue. When he thought of his own orders, knowing that Palpatine was collecting Force users, he knew the answers. Nowhere was too far away to be found. And if Palps fell, the Jedi would be back. There was no end to the cycle. Niner shook him again. I didn't want to do this, Dar. Darman braced for a punch. He could block Niner. But as he clenched his fist to defend himself, Niner relaxed his grip. Dar, he said. Ordo says Cat asks for you. He keeps asking for his daddy. Ordo says he doesn't know how he's going to explain to him that his dad decided not to come home. Darman's knees almost buckled. Tell Ordo, nice try, but I'm done here. You tell Cad for me, Niner. Tell my boy that I can protect him better here. Darman didn't think that the pain could get any worse, but it had. He turned and began walking back toward the barracks. A guy was staring at him, understandable, seeing two commandos way off their territory and having a fight in the street, and he snapped. He found his deez in the guy's face, and the voice he could hear wasn't his, not at all. Who you staring at, Shabir? Beat it. Niner was right behind him again. He grabbed the deez muzzle one-handed and steered it aside. Okay, on your way. Niner said to the terrified man. We're a little emotional tonight. Get lost. The man didn't need telling twice. He ran. Niner walked a few more paces with Darman, suddenly quiet and placatory. Dar, I've got New York yelling in my ear now. She wants to talk to you. No deal. Okay, you don't go, I don't go. You have to go, Naviodi. Someone's got to hand over that data chip. Right. Whatever's on there, Obram thinks it's critical. Go home and explain to Cad. Two could play that game. Niner had a big streak of dutiful guilt that Darman could lean on, too. He heard him hiss in exasperation. Shabir, he said. How can you do this? Darman kept on walking. He was so numb now that all he was aware of was the feel of the walkway under his boots and unshed tears pricking his eyes. The numbness was pure reflex this time. He didn't even have to try. He waited for the sound of running or the impact of a body canoning into him. But it never came. Niner wasn't making one last attempt to force him onto the freighter. The footsteps got steadily quieter before they speeded up into a steady jog. When Darman looked over his shoulder, Niner was gone. Darman realized he hadn't actually said goodbye to him. When he tried to open the short-range comm link, there was no response. Niner had severed all links. Darman regretted his decision as soon as he crossed the bridge back to the entertainment quarter. But he knew that regret was for the right reasons. Staying here was the best option, not just for Cad, but for all his brothers and friends being hunted by Palpatine. They needed a spy on the inside, too. And he had the feeling that he wouldn't exactly be thwarting Melissa's aims by being one. He began working out how he'd explain Niner's absence to the commander. It wasn't going to be easy. He'd probably leave it until the morning, partly to buy more time, and partly to make it more credible if he used the excuse of a drunken evening and not being able to recall when Niner actually disappeared. The rest of Omega's squad had deserted. Who'd be shocked by one more going over the wall? Much as Darman disliked the idea, it just made him look even more loyal and reliable to Melissa. He'd be trusted. He'd get a lot more information. He wasn't sure yet how he'd relay that to Kirimura, but there'd be a way, and Jalar Obram was still an ally. 
Shab, I wish I didn't keep losing it like that. I've got to get a grip of my temper. One day, I'm going to do something I'll really regret. Darman swallowed his shame at his outbursts and wandered around, killing time until he could slip back into the barracks. When he paused to look in a store window, a public hall in his screen high on a building caught his eye, and he watched for a while. Jibad had taken the full brunt of Palpatine's wrath. It was all the more reason for Darman to stick with the job in hand. Niner would realize that, eventually. Darman just hoped that Cad would, too. Freighter Cornucopia, Freighter Park, G80, Imperial City. Ordo took off his stormtrooper armor and stacked the plates on the deck. Cornucopia was in darkness except for the faint illumination from the red and blue lights of essential systems, her interior looking like an outer rim nightclub that hadn't quite mastered the art of ambience. Niner? He detached his secure comm link from the helmet. Get in here. I need your kit. Niner was making his way through an obstacle course of repulsor trucks and other goods vessels, directed by Prudiai along a path that kept him out of the range of the security cams. Some of the trucks looked as if they'd been abandoned there. In the distance, the NAV lights of another freighter wobbled toward Cornucopia as its pilot headed for a parking bay. It wasn't busy. Trade hadn't picked up again since the end of the war. Why now? Why does Dar decide to do this now? Ordo was going to kick seven shades of Asik out of Darman when he finally got him on board. The man was out of his mind with grief, but this was stupid, pointless, irresponsible. They'd come to extract the two commandos and that was exactly what they were going to do. New York gave him her at Lalby fine look, the lines in her forehead thrown into relief by the console lights. She never looked like she believed it herself. Niner's voice crackled over the calm. What are you planning? Pretty I interrupted, calculating the range of the cams at every stage. Niner, head down and go left at the next bollard. Got it. I said, what are you planning, Lord I.K.? I'm going to go back to the barracks dressed as you and drag Dar out by his get se if I have to. Being a clone always had its advantages. Shab, I can't even contact him by comm link. Make sure you've got your recorder running, Lord I.K., Mariel said. Always handy to have as much data as we can get on the interiors of enemy installations. I don't suppose Niner's been gathering layout data for us, has he? No, Niner hasn't, Niner snapped. Not before your pet tinny rigged my bucket anyway. How would I explain that if anyone checked my systems? That I was afraid of getting lost on the way back from the freshers? UDCI, NVOD. Mario rolled his eyes at Ordo. Take it easy. We'll be out of here in no time. Niner was a special forces soldier who'd operated behind enemy lines throughout the war, never turning a hair. It made Ordo uncomfortable to see him rattled by such a low-risk extraction. Maybe it was all too emotionally charged to be handled like combat. This should have been relatively easy. Nobody knew they were here, nobody had cannon trained on their position, and nobody would even notice them if they walked right in and took their helmets off but it could still end in tragedy. We've all been here before. Niner didn't respond. Ordo could hear his ragged breathing and the occasional irritated click of his teeth, just like Skirata's. If I don't get Dar and Niner home, it'll break Calbear's heart. Only those two could make a drama out of a nice safe exfil like this, Jane muttered. New York jerked her head around sharply. You call this safe? Nobody's shooting at us, he said. Or them. Relax, Bear I.K. Ordo waited for the rap on Cornucopia's hull. New York, attuned to every sound and vibration in her ship, reacted before Ordo did, 
and he thought that was impressive for a knock clone with none of the genetic enhancements that the Nulls had been given. She released one of the hatch controls and Ordo heard the clatter of boots climbing a metal ladder. It felt like a long time before a black armored shape emerged from the hatch set in the deck. Niner pulled himself up through the opening and removed his helmet. So you can take out an entire droid base single-handed, but you can't make Darman behave and get his shebs over here, Bordo said. He knew it didn't help to take it out on Niner, but he couldn't bear to let Calbear down. Get that kid off and let me sort him out. Niner just blanked him and reached into his belt pouch. This is all you'll be needing. He held out his hand, palm up. Ordo could hardly see the data chip in the gloom, a wafer of plastoid and metal so small that a sneeze could have sent it flying into the air conditioning vents. Ordo took it carefully and passed it to Jane. Clue me in Niner, he said, realizing this had all gone to Osik. Are you planning to go back for him now? I'll do it. No offense. No, I'm staying here. I can't leave Dar. He's going to do something extreme and get himself killed. Here we go again. We do the logical thing. We drag him out. Look, I don't want this any more than you do, but I see his point. Or at least I see why one of U.S. should stay here, except it shouldn't be him. He should be with his kid. If you're planning to use the word duty, Naviodi, I might forget we're family and punch you into next week. Ordo could see a clean line to be drawn under all this, a final escape from Coruscant with no ties to keep dragging them back. This had to end now. It's the same Shabir running the show, remember? Except instead of Jedi, he's got dark side saber jockeys as the hired help. You don't owe this army a Shabba thing, and if you've got a duty, it's to your clan. You're a liot. Niner took a step back and put one boot on the first rung of the ladder. Dar's going to do some dangerous stuff, and I'm not leaving him to do it alone. I'll stay in contact and relay intel back to you. Now get that chip analyzed. Obram said you could recover the data, but you might need to use a scanning microscope to get at some of it. He made it clear that it's important. Ordo hovered on the edge of grabbing Niner and getting his brothers to hold him down. They could all apologize for black eyes and chipped teeth later. It was for Niner's own good. Last chance, Ordo said. Give me your armor. When we're ready, we can bang out any time we want. Okay? Ordo gestured to New York to lock the hatch behind Niner. Mariel edged closer, ready to tackle him. Then Pudiai swore to himself. Heads up, Vode, we've got company, someone moving around out there. It's a freight park, Mariel said. What do you expect? Ordo looked up at the monitors. Shapes flashed out of one screen and emerged again in another as someone darted from right to left, caught by the hull cams on either side of the freighter. New York edged forward in her seat, head lowered. Whoever was on the ground wouldn't be able to see much in the cockpit viewplate, not even the faint glow. You know, maybe we should sit this out in another location. Can't you just take off? Niner said. He put his other boot on the next rung down. Any moment now, Mario would grab him. You don't have to exit via the freight terminal checkpoint. We do if we want to keep coming back here. New York squinted as if she couldn't see. Kidding her out with envy goggles would have been a good idea. This ship shows up in systems as a legitimate commercial vessel. As long as I stick to the rules, we can go anywhere. The minute I drop off some flight schedule or the ship doesn't show up on someone's tote board, they'll flag it to board or detain. Hide in plain sight. That's what you lot always say, isn't it? Time wasn't a problem. Ordo thought they could hang on here for a couple of days, maybe a lot longer, 
but the less time spent here, the better. He seethed with frustration at having traveled light years only to be thwarted five clicks from his target by Darman deciding to form his own one-man double agent network. I can be in and out of those barracks in under an hour. Okay, we might get spotted. New York will have to keep the drives running. But it's madness to turn around and go home empty-handed. I don't want to worry anyone. But I think that's some local entrepreneurs doing a little asset acquisition. Pretty, I said. Thieving shop by case. Look. Jane slipped the chip into the wristband of his gauntlet and checked his sidearm. Ordo watched the grainy image on one of the monitors. Three figures, two human, one Bahan, moved from vehicle to vehicle, trying hatches. There were two trucks and a small courier shuttle between them and Cornucopia now. The Bahan kept watch while the two humans rattled the manual latches on one of the trucks and vanished inside. Relax, Bordo said. He'd have to wait until the thieves moved on before he could venture out. Niner was stuck too. For a moment, Ordo debated whether to simply lift off with Niner and come back later in another vessel for Darman. Never seen a Bodhan thief before. I hope nobody calls the cops, Pretty I said. They'll move on. Niner was wavering. Ordo could tell. His blink rate had shot up, and he kept looking down the shaft of the hatch beneath him. He was going to make a run for it. But Ordo needed black armor. The white stuff was fine for general loitering around, but to get in and out of the 501st Special Unit quickly, easily, and without fuss, the kind of fuss that involved blasters and rapid exits, he needed an Imperial Commando rig. Then he'd have to subdue Darman somehow and get him out of the compound. Doing that without being spotted was going to be a challenge even for Ordo. Shab, they really might have to regroup and try another day. Like New York said, they could always come back as long as Cornucopia didn't blot her copybook. There were millions of vessel movements around the galactic capital every day, and even with tightened security that meant the chances of slipping in and out unhindered were good. If they were really desperate though, and they didn't want to use the freighter for cover again, they could get in and out anywhere they wanted. Not even Palpatine could lock down a planet this big and complex. Ten points for cheek, pretty I said. Look. They're stealing the whole truck. The truck edged forward out of the line and turned. But instead of speeding away, the vehicle stopped after a few meters, and the two humans jumped out to force the doors of the next one. They were in and out again in what seemed like a few seconds, carrying a packing crate between them. The booty went into the rear of the stolen truck. Now the gang was shaping up to work on the courier shuttle. Ordo watched them struggle with the hatch controls for a few minutes before they gave up. There were no prizes for guessing where they were coming next. Their getaway vehicle vanished from the side cam's range for a moment, and then the underhull cam picked them up. The thieves were standing right under the belly hatch, looking up. Don't even think about it, Shabir, Mariel muttered. Move along. Nothing to see here. New York's hand reached slowly for the console and hovered over the hatch controls. If you lock the hatch from here, Bordo said, they'll hear the mechanism engage. Does that matter? It'll make them move on sharpish. If we have to stay here longer, it might also make folks curious about why a ship is sitting here in lights-out mode with a crew embarked. I can't see that lot calling the cops. You've seen the posters. Everyone has to denounce their neighbor to show how loyal they are. Everyone held their breath. Niner slipped his helmet back on, one-handed, and stood partway in the hatch, waiting. Ordo didn't dare make a commotion by grabbing him now. Asik. Pretty I let out a sharp breath. Ordo could see the two humans trying the outer hatch. 
The chunk of metal flanges and the scrape of a hinge transmitted through the hull of the silent ship. You really don't want to do that, Shakar. Okay, darkened ship, New York. Niner jumped back onto the deck and turned to face what was coming up the ladder beneath him. New York killed all the console lights and the monitors. Niner's blue-lit visor vanished along with the charge indicator on his dice. The only sounds were occasional breaths and the faint clicks of weapons being aimed. If the thieves decided to come on deck, Ordo didn't have a lot of choices. He couldn't let them leave. And there was one still outside he'd have to silence, the Bahan. They were just petty criminals, Shakar, not normally worth killing, but he'd let security lapse for a few minutes and now he had to clean up the mess. The risk was too high not to. We should know better. We're elite special forces. And still we slip up on the small stuff. I slip up. New York was using her seat as cover, a small blaster aimed at the hatch. Ordo had no idea how she performed under fire. His brothers knew without thinking what the other would do and how they would fight, but New York was a wild card. Ordo snapped his fingers to get her attention and gestured to stay down. Leave it to us, New York. Let's make this silent. Without infrared images from a helmet to guide him, Ordo could only see vague shapes in the darkness and follow sounds. Fabric rustled below. Something metallic chinked against the rung, dura steel toe caps or a blaster, and he strained to see what was emerging. Come on! Both of you. Don't want one of you jamming the hatch while the other gets away. Ordo worked out how quickly he could exit and stop the getaway driver. The freighter's exits were all choke points. And one thing he couldn't do was use Cornucopia's small defensive cannon here. Shab. The first thief scrambled onto the deck apparently oblivious that he was walking into an ambush. He even turned to give his buddy a hand up. Ordo waited two seconds for them both to stand clear of the hatch, and then Niner jumped one of them. Ordo heard a thud and the shunk of a vibrablade ejecting, followed by a wet gurgling noise. Ordo smashed the butt of his weapon down on the guy nearest to him. As the man dropped, he got him in a headlock and twisted sharply until he heard a crunch. It had taken seconds, and it had been almost silent. Everyone froze. Then New York hit the console, bringing up the instrument panel lights. It was enough to see what had happened. Ah, uh, she said, staring. Ah, uh, staying. I'll dump them, Mario whispered. Don't worry. Sounds drifted up through the hatch. An engine revved before dropping to idle speed. A vehicle door opened and closed quietly. Hey, what's happening? It was a loud, nervous whisper. Fari? Kim? I lost your calm, guys, guys. The Bahan didn't try to enter the hatch. Crunch, crunch. He took two steps, sounding as if he was backing off. He knew something was wrong. A metal door catch snapped shut. Niner looked at Ordo. Everything had changed. Ordo hated to quit on this but they had brand new problems. I've got to stop him. Niner slipped the grenade launcher attachment onto his dice. Sorry. When I fire, just bang out, because there'll be cops here in minutes. Just get clear. Oh, and ask your tinny to mod Dar's helmet like mine, okay? Will do, Bordo said. Koyasiai, Niviodi. Niner dropped down the hatch and landed with a thud. Ordo's decision had been made for him. The last thing he heard before the belly hatch sealed was a repulsor truck engine roaring away. Abort, he said. New York, get us out. Niner, are you clear of the vessel? Ordo heard him panting as he ran. 
I am now. Secure all hatches. Stand by. New York hit the ignition and the repulsor maneuvering drives rumbled into life. You sure he's clear, Ordo? A loud explosion cut her short as the grenade found its target. The vessels visible on the monitors lit up yellow for a few moments before settling back into reflected flames. Niner was a reliable shot. I think he's got a problem with his gearbox. Niner's forced cheerfulness didn't fool anyone. It's just gone 50 meters into the air. Head down, Niviodi, Bordo said. Clear to take off, New York. New York took Cornucopia up in a steep climb, sending loose items skidding down the deck. Two of them were bodies. They'd have to be dumped, but that had to wait now. This is going to be bumpy, New York said. And if ATC spots us, we're borked. Ordo buckled himself into the co-pilot's seat, catching Muriel's eye as he twisted around. He felt ashamed and useless. Things shouldn't have gone this wrong. It wasn't all Darman's fault either. They'll be fine. Muriel could read his thoughts. Besides, intel from the source is priceless. As is the ability to reach out and touch the Empire. You know what? I've abandoned two brothers. You can shove your intel. Just trying to make you feel better, or I K. Don't. I blew it. We all blew it, New York said. Ordo, prep to jump on my mark. Ordo pressed the comm link bead in his ear and listened. Niner was calling in CSF and fire crews. He sounded absolutely calm, reporting a stop and search that had escalated. Isn't that going to look suspicious on the compound security cams? New York's voice shook. How's he going to explain all that to Holy Roly? Is he really going to be okay? He'll think of something, Jane said. He slipped a data pad back in his pocket. Of course, the problem with security and traffic cams is that certain anti-terrorism officers have access to them, and they tend to erase the recordings. Don't you just hate it when that happens? You called in another favor from Obrim. Fair exchange. We'll save his shebs when he runs out of luck and needs to vanish with his family. The freighter had now climbed enough to safely engage the sublight drive. It streaked high over the city, as far from Niner's location as possible before New York got air traffic control's attention by climbing vertically to a safe hyperjump altitude. It was a maneuver that screamed, look at me, I'm in a real hurry to escape. How long did it take to scramble enforcement fighters? Long enough. Ordo counted down the seconds until Imperial City ATC cut in on the ship's calm. ATC calling Cornucopia, you do not have customs or flight clearance, I repeat, you do not. Shut it. New York smacked her fist down hard on the audio control to silence it. Revoke my license. Good luck with finding me, too. Ordo, you ready? Ready. Okay, in five, jump. Cornucopia shuddered. Familiar constellations vanished instantly. And so did the chance to bring Niner and Darman home, for the time being at least. Ordo couldn't decide whose disappointment would haunt him most, cowbears or cads. He'd find out soon enough. At least jumping to hyperspace before he could calm Kiramorat gave him time to prepare for the reaction. He seems like a nice lad, New York said, staring ahead into the featureless void. She patted Ordo's knee. Solid. Dependable. Niner? Yes. I never met him before. I didn't even get a chance to introduce myself. That stung Ordo. He hadn't realized. He's Manda Carla. Got the right Mando stuff. Free men make their own decisions, Ordo. 
just remember that. Even if it upsets us, both of them are doing what they want to do, not what someone made them do. Free men also faced up to the consequences of their actions. I could have done this all differently. I didn't. He'd sit Cad down and explain as best he could to a toddler that his daddy wanted to come home, but Uncle Ordo, Bavoda Ordai K, had got things all wrong and had to leave him behind. If Cad was going to feel let down by anyone, it wouldn't be his bear. 11. Here's why you can't exterminate us, Arutai. We're not huddled in one place, we span the galaxy. We need no lords or leaders so you can't destroy our command. We can live without technology, so we can fight with our bare hands. We have no species or bloodline, so we can rebuild our ranks with others who want to join us. We're more than just a people or an army, Iruatai. We're a culture. We're an idea. And you can't kill ideas, but we can certainly kill you. Ranate Nast Mandalore the Destroyer, daughter of Avhenchal, giving the Consul of Lan a final chance to surrender during the siege of the city. Kirimorat Mandalore. I let you down, Kalbear. Ordo stepped down off Cornucopia's ramp, chin lowered, looking as if he was expecting a good hiding. Skarata threw his arms around him and gave him a fierce hug. Don't you even think that? He scolded. You hear? You never let me down. We can still get them back any time we like. Come on. He broke off to embrace the other nulls one by one. Let's get this stuff inside. Eat. New York emerged from the freighter carrying a tray of eggs. She gave Skirata a sympathetic look and shrugged. He was worrying how you'd take the news. She whispered. He's always so confident about everything else, but he's scared stiff of you. She sounded as if she was asking what Skarata had done to make him that way. I love that boy more than my own life, Skarata said indignantly. He knows I'd never blame him for this. For anything. I know. It's just sad to watch it. Ordo's need to please him always broke Skarata's heart. He'd never given Ordo any cause to fear him, but the Kaminoans had already burned the idea into the Null's psyches that failure was never tolerated. Failures had to be reconditioned, terminated. However many times Skarata told Ordo he was perfect, it never erased that lesson from infancy. You believe me, don't you? Skarata said. Here he was, scared in turn of New York's disapproval. He did the right thing. Pull out, rethink, try again later. I believe you. New York put a box down on the deck and caught his face in both hands, giving him a little shake. You're a bad boy, shorty, but nobody doubts your devotion to your kids. She held on to him for a few seconds more than needed to make the point. He realized he had no idea how to respond. He'd forgotten the moves after all these years. New York suddenly let go and picked up the box again, and he was left to wonder if he'd missed the cues and disappointed her. I think I overordered, she said, looking at the crates still to be moved. But if everyone gets sick of eggs, we can pickle them for the store. Fi and Aden bounded up the ramp, making a show of being cheerful. They'd been desperate to see Niner and Darman again. We never get sick of anything, Fi said, rummaging through the cargo. Our favorite flavor is second helpings. Ooh, you got us some more nuts. Hot and spicy, and salt and sour. Candosii. Ten kilos of each. She gave him an indulgent smile. Skirata noted that she fell into the maternal role with Fi without a moment's hesitation. And if you eat them all in one go, Parja will make you sleep in the barn. On your own head be it. I'll ration myself. Hey, Fi, 
I'm sorry we didn't get Dar and Niner back. But we will. It'll all be fine. I promise. Maybe we can talk to them somehow. Fi sounded wistful, like a lost child, and he wasn't putting it on. Niner's got a secure link. We can talk to him, right? Yes, you can. New York's eyes suddenly looked glassy. Jane can make it happen. Aden stood back to let Fi move the laden repulsor off the ship. I'm going to go with Midge to pick up the equipment for Yuthan, he said. We'll be back in a day or so. Anything else we need? You might want to wander back via Keldabe and see what Dread Shabla Priest is up to. I really don't need to collect more problems now. Priest can wait, surely? See if Vav wants a trip out too. Poor old Chakar needs to take his mind off Sev for a while. That means taking Murd as well. So? Vent the aircon twice an hour. Aten slaps Garada on the shoulder. Will do. See you later. That's a little miracle too, Skarada said as he walked away. Him and Vav, real death grudge. Vav gave him those scars. But they called a truce. Anything's possible. New York rubbed her nose discreetly as if she thought Skarada hadn't noticed the tears. But not reconciliation with the death watch. That comes under the water flowing uphill section of possibility. No. Skirata steered her down the ramp with the last of the egg crates and closed the hatch. Where could he start? But she had to know if she was going to truly fit in. Even without discussion, there seemed to be a tacit acceptance that New York was a permanent fixture. Do you want to settle here? Skirata asked. New York blinked a couple of times. I think I already have. I mean become a Mando. Properly. He realized that he'd opened a delicate topic that begged the question of what he was actually asking her. He skipped over it, unable to deal with more emotional complications right then. I mean that there's such bad blood between us and them that you need to be aware of it. Of course. New York reached into her jacket and took out something. A stack of cash credits. She opened one of his belt pouches and dropped the chips into it. Every time she laid hands on him he was rooted to the spot and didn't know how to react. I'd hate to make any social gaffes at the Keldabe Country Club. Skarada longed to be at ease with her. I told you to keep the creds. Nobody thinks you're sponging. And I'm handing them back. Nice pickpocket job, though. Now, Death Watch. Tried to oust Jaster Muriel because he liked law and order, and that crimped their game. Big turf war. And they killed Darla's parents for sheltering Jaster. How am I doing? Skirata was glad she didn't say civil war. War was for soldiers, folks with discipline and honor. The Death Watch were just criminal scum who happened to share the same system. Not real Mandalorians at all. Not bad, he said. They dressed themselves up as patriots wanting a return to the good old days of the Mando Empire, but it was just a cover for organized crime. But you lot don't have a proper government like other species. You've got this loose arrangement of clans, and you've got a head of state who only shows up part-time and doesn't make the rules. How can the Death Watch overthrow anything? There's nothing to overthrow. They can destroy our backbone. New York snorted. Yeah? Good luck with that. We've had times in our past when we let rotten Mandalores steer us down some ugly paths. It happens, New York. Ideas take root. Whole societies get swept up in things without thinking. Because they're just ideas, right? Just harmless things. But they'd fight to the death to resist if an invading army showed up and tried to force those changes on us. 
We don't see bad ideas coming until they've done the damage. It was all he needed to say for the time being. New York had seen enough of Arla to get the idea that the Death Watch committed atrocities, and that was enough on its own. Inside the house, the Veshik table was laid with an impressive spread of scrawny case, an assortment of small fancy snacks that could be lingered over for hours. It was a spread for special occasions, from weddings to funerals, and sometimes both at the same time. Jilka, C-O-R-R, and Ru were already munching on crisply fried meat. Skirata opened one of the bottles of Tihar on the table. New York stared at the bounty. Won't Youthen find this a little inappropriate? I mean, it's a bit festive. It's how we do things. Skirata tried one of the pastries. Shersha Bal Ae Han. You can't separate the two. This should have been a welcome home party for Darman and Niner. Skirata saw nothing odd about combining it with some respectable mourning for Yuthin's people. Life was all sharp contrasts. You couldn't appreciate joy without understanding sorrow. Happy guests at this kind of meal were a reminder to the unhappy that life would be good again one day, and the mourners reminded those celebrating not to take a moment of life for granted. The act was one of assertion, of looking for the positive side of the moment. It made sense to any Mando. Scarada wanted it to make sense to New York. He stopped short of asking her if she'd ever attended a wake, and realized he didn't know much about her background. The better he got to know her, the harder he found it to talk about her dead husband. Lassima came out of the kitchen with a tray of miniature pastries filled with conserves so transparent and brightly colored that they looked like gems. She was an impressive cook. Might as well tuck in, she said. The others will show up when they smell the food. Highly sitar. Fill your boots. Where is everybody? Jane went racing off to play with the data chip. She downed a pastry, looked pleased with the result, and licked her fingers. Kinaha took Cad for a walk to burn off some energy. Skirata's alarm bells went off. You let a Kaminii go off with him? He regretted snapping the second the words were out of his mouth. But it told him his hatred of Kaminoans was as embedded now as Ordo's fear of failure, and just as immune to evidence and reason. Sorry. Just tell me they didn't go far. She's a thousand years old or something, Calbear. Lasima took his arm like an old man and gave him a kiss on the cheek, humoring him. How fast could she get away? They're in the yard, feeding the Nuna. And Dar and Niner are light years away. Skarada tried not to dwell on it. They were alive, and they'd made their own decisions. But there was Cad, and Cad still thought Daddy was coming home. As long as Darman and Niner were behind enemy lines and not here, then Skarada could have no sense of peace. I left my kids to go to war time after time. What was the difference? His wife had been there for them. Cat had a choice of mothers here, at least a dozen uncles, and a grandfather, too. Eliot Orishaya Talden, family was more than bloodline. Dar didn't have to be here all the time to make Cad feel loved and secure. But it was more than that. It was all about Etain, and trying to heal that wound. Skirata still couldn't work out whose wound it was. He suspected it was more his even than Darman's. Atain's ashes haunted him. He went to the cupboard where the funeral urn was kept, and stood looking at it as if she was trapped within. It was a strange thought for a Mandalorian, in a society that had had to dispense with cemeteries and revered remains in fixed places. The dead weren't there, and the link to them in life was a piece of armor or a lightsaber. But Atain was somehow in a kind of limbo in Skirata's mind, waiting for Darman to scatter her ashes and free her. Becoming one with the Force wasn't like that. Juzik kept telling him so. Sorry, Etiakei, Skirata said. 
Can you wait a little longer for Dar? He's doing it for the boy. New York was right behind him when he closed the door and turned. She squeezed his arm. I'll get you then, she said. I'm starting to get the picture. Shershe Bal Aihan. Skirata found himself slowly surfacing from the numbness of dashed hopes and entering a stage of anger. He was angry at Darman for putting everyone through this when he could have just walked away. You've got a son here, doesn't that pull you back? How can you do this to him? It felt a lot like the process of grieving, shock, then anger, and then the pain, self-recrimination, and irrational ups and downs before you accepted this was for keeps, and you had to live with it or not live at all. Skirata struggled with the familiar emotions, even knowing he'd go through a sequence of helpless feelings. But this time, those lost to him could come back. This wasn't death. He had to focus on that. I wanted them to have the freedom all other beings have. I wanted them to have choices. Well, they have. And they chose, and if I don't like it, too bad. His head knew that. But his heart remained stubbornly ignorant. He forced himself to concentrate on the room that was filling up with his family and guests. Prisoners? Friends? He didn't know. He wasn't sure if it even mattered. My clan. Isn't this a miracle in its own right? Not one of us should be here. Misfits, rejects, fugitives, disposable lives. Somehow we're making it work. Have a drink, Fai said. He folded Skirata's fingers around a glass of ale. Fai had definitely come back from the dead as profound a symbol of vindicated hope as Skirata had ever seen. We'll think of something to be grateful for. How's about we start with Bard Ike? A new brother. We can have sibling rivalry and fight over stuff and everything. Yuthan stood surveying the food, but it was clear her mind was elsewhere. Skirata wondered how many times she'd replayed the news about Jibad in her head just to try to absorb the enormity of it, the genocide of her world, something few could ever have experienced. Scout hovered close by her like a doting daughter. Skirata bet on Helamar leaving her with orders to look after Yuthan while he was away. I believe in coming out fighting, Yuthan said. She took a plate from the stack, none of which matched another, and placed a few morsels on it as if to show willing. So this is the point where the Empire has to start worrying about me. An antigen for the galaxy, but a special surprise for Coruscant. Skirata took a pull of the ale. Casual. Act casual. Coruscant? A planet of a trillion people, crowded together. The ideal scenario to spread a pathogen. She chewed and nodded polite approval. The heart of the Empire. Take out the heart. My boys are on Coruscant. Not just Dar and Niner. The other commandos I trained, too. So you've got an antidote, Skarada said. This wasn't the time for a debate. Good work. Can we spread it quietly? So Palps doesn't know he'll be firing blanks in the future? Silently. Yuthan said. But you realize that spreading it here means the garrison will be immunized, too. You'll lose your most effective weapon against the Empire. Skirata caught himself hesitating for a second. The Stormies were clones much the same as his boys, not volunteers, not conscripts, slaves. He knew he was going to have to get a grip of this feeling, or the Empire would have him beaten from the start. Shab, we'll just have to shoot them the old-fashioned way, then, he said, and hoped he meant it. I can always engineer something new. Skarada didn't answer. The room was noisier now, and didn't leave a ringing silence for anyone to interpret. Yuthan had a cause for war with the whole empire. 
All Skirata wanted was a small corner where his family could live in peace and not invite trouble to visit them. So what do we do if Dar or Niner send us intel that's no use to us, but would help a resistance somewhere? What do we do with that information? He put the idea to one side. It might never happen. He watched Bessany standing with her arm around Ordo's waist, clearly devoted to him, and Parja fussing over Fi, and Corr whispering something in Jilka's ear and getting a laugh out of her. This was what Skirata wanted for his lads, the normal life that every other human male took for granted. Rebellion was someone else's problem. New York sat down next to Skirata on the cushion-strewn seat and nudged him with her elbow. What are you going to do about the others? What others? How are they going to find someone to settle down with in the middle of nowhere? And what if they can't bring them home to meet the folks? Romances break up. But disgruntled exes always know where you live. She was right, and he tried not to think about it. Kirimura was already less than a secret. Rav Brawler had refurbished the place with local labor, and every clone who passed through would have a location that could be revealed. It's a risk we'll take, Skirata said, not knowing where to start to solve it. Mandos keep their mouths shut. What if one of the boys meets someone he likes who isn't a Mando? We'll have to lock her in once she gets here. He gave New York a wink, but she just smiled as if she didn't understand. It was just as well. He couldn't worry about his own needs while there was so much to do for his boys. We'll think of something. Cad tottered around from person to person, getting picked up and fussed over at every stop. When he reached Ordo, Skirata watched, knowing what was coming next. Ordo scooped him up in his arms and took a few steps away into a space. Ordo wasn't a natural with kids, but he looked determined to learn. Skirata saw his expression change as the boy stared into his face with that wide-eyed expectation that disarmed adults every time. Cad I.K., your daddy couldn't come back this time. My fault. Bad Uncle Ordo did something silly. He tapped Cad's nose with his fingertip, which usually made the kid giggle, but not this time. We're going to see if we can make something clever that helps him talk to you. He misses you. Would you like that? It was hard to tell what Cat understood, because he always reacted as if he knew exactly what the grown-ups were talking about. Skirata could see his chin wobbling and a frown forming. He could have been responding to Ordo's distress rather than feeling upset about Darman. But Cad didn't cry. He rarely did. He just took it and got on with life, even at this early age. Skirata tried to imagine the man he'd grow into. He'll make a great dad one day, New York said. Cad? Ordo. He's still getting the hang of it. Look at Bessany's face. New York smiled sadly. Bessany was watching Ordo with complete adoration, oblivious of everything else. She was a striking woman anyway, but the beatific expression made her luminous. We're pushovers for guys who are kind to kids and animals. We can forget the rich and powerful Ossic then. Being rich really doesn't solve life's problems. She had that right. The rapidly growing fund in the clone savings bank, as Jane called it, hadn't brought Dar or Niner home or stopped the rapid aging yet. True, Skarada said. But it gives you more options than being poor. Skirata shut his eyes and visualized the tick list of things that still needed to be sorted out. Juzik could now go to retrieve Maze, and maybe take Ru or Levitt with him. They both deserved a break. As soon as Hilamar and An got back, they could start building Yithin's virus factory, then get her back on track with the anti-aging research. Then there was Arla. What the shab was he going to do about her? and the Jedi, they couldn't stay here forever, and they couldn't leave. 
I'll think of something. He shut his eyes and half dozed, soothed by all the relaxed conversation around him. Cat scrambled onto his lap, smelling of sticky preserves and baby powder, and fell asleep. I'll think of something. Beer? A hand gripped his shoulder gently. He opened his eyes and stared up into Jane's puzzled face. I'm not dead, son. Just rehearsing. I've recovered a fair chunk of the data from that chip, Jane said. It looks like a gold mine. I've still got to bypass the encryption on some file contents, but from what I've skimmed, it looks like the complete guide to how to hide escaped Jedi. Safe houses, sympathizers ready to give aid, ships, locations, comm codes, arms caches, the whole shebang. Obram must have got that far with his recovery program and realized what he had. Skirata sat up slowly, trying not to disturb Cad. Sure it's not a decoy to throw Palpatine off the real trail? Even Jedi aren't naive enough to risk recording all that on data chips. Slicers like me rely on naivete, bear. It might only be a small part of their network, of course, in which case it's not as dumb as it looks. So why was Obram sweating bricks about getting it to us? No offense to our guests, but I really don't give a moth shebs how many Jedi the Empire catches. I'd happily pay my taxes if it got all of them. There's a file on there that might be closer to home. Skirata was wide awake now. How close? Ships and names. Friendlies. You'll know at least one of them. Skirata felt slightly queasy. He knew what was coming next. He really should have let his natural suspicion have the upper hand. It was his fault for not asking a very obvious question months ago. I was blinded. Grief and greed. Attain dead, the chance of a genetic break right in my lap. Grief, greed, and getting too soft. Skirata looked slowly around the room to see where New York was. She was talking to C.O.V., the sergeant from Yayak's squad. It was nice to see the Yayak's boys joining in. They tended to keep themselves to themselves, rarely coming in for meals with everyone else. It's New York, isn't it? Skirata said quietly. Jane nodded. Yes, Bear. It is. Commander Melissa's office. Special Operations, 501st Legion, Imperial City. I'm sorry, sir. Things got a bit out of hand. Niner took the fact he was sitting in Melissa's office rather than standing to attention in front of the desk as a good sign. But then Melissa was a hearts and minds kind of officer. And this was just a routine report about discharge of weapons in a public place. A grenade round versus a repulsor truck, and the grenade won. Holy Roly didn't need to know more. Meaning? Melissa said. I should have alerted the police. Niner found it hard not to say CSF every time. I use lethal force to stop a vehicle thief. I don't think that's going to be a capital offense under this empire, Sergeant but I'd like to know why you did it. You're experienced. Special forces. Not some trigger-happy security guard. Niner reached for an outright lie. It was easy. He hadn't realized just how easy. I think I'm overreacting, sir. I'm finding it hard to switch off from the war. Everything starts me off. Ordinary stuff. Melissa just looked at him, not with that I'm waiting for the truth expression Zay would have worn, but with concern. Real concern, not an act he'd learned on leadership courses. He might just have been a great actor, of course. 
Niner wasn't about to abandon caution. I'd be surprised if it didn't, Melissa said at last. And I don't think there's a quick cure, because it's a part of what makes you a fine soldier. You've been in life and death situations. You react instantly to stay alive. It doesn't come with an off switch. Niner felt terrible. He was getting sympathy he hadn't earned. There was nothing wrong with him, nothing at all. He wasn't like Darman, erupting and lashing out when things got too much. Was he? I'd know. I'd know if I was losing it. I'm sure I would. But an insistent little voice reminded him that he always felt pursued, spied upon, threatened these days. The Empire kept an even tighter watch on its citizens than the Republic had. Conspicuous new public holocams were springing up everywhere, so he knew he wasn't imagining all of it. But it was not knowing where to draw the line between the real and the imagined that was eating away at him. I know Darman wasn't with you at the time, Melissa said. I want to talk to both of you, though. He got up and opened the doors to summon a droid. Niner heard him. 5M, get Trooper Darman, please. The doors stayed open for a change and Melissa sat down. Niner hadn't seen Darman since he'd walked back through the main gates and reported the incident. It wasn't concealable from his end, whatever Obrim might have done with security Holovids, and he decided against discussing it with Darman and dragging him farther into it. Does Dar even know I came back? There wasn't a lot that escaped notice in a small closed world like this unit. Niner kept his gaze fixed on the wall wary of making eye contact with Melissa and falling into conversation, because the guy was just too easy to talk to. Anything might spill out in that state, Niner thought. Eventually, he heard brisk footsteps in the corridor. Darman marched in, helmet under one arm, and came to attention as if he hadn't even noticed Niner was there. At ease, Darman. Melissa gestured to the chair next to Niner. Take a seat. Darman sat with his fingers meshed on his stomach, elbows braced on the arms of the chair. For a second, his eyes met Niner's. All Niner could see was quiet disappointment, not surprise or anger. Melissa closed the doors from the desk control, sinking the office back into that soundproofed, padded silence. I've not been entirely honest with you, he said. But I think you know that. Niner tried to stop himself from guessing where this was leading, but he couldn't help it. He evaluated threats fast. He'd been drilled to do that since infancy. Only he and Dar were here, that meant it wasn't about Squad 40, and it wasn't about former Republic commandos, because Enin was absent, and Enin had a Karelian training sergeant. Common factor, two men from a Mandalorian trained commando company. Narrow it down, Darman hadn't been involved with blowing the truck up, so it wasn't about the incident. Niner could have just waited to see what was coming, but he couldn't switch it off. You probably noticed that my first move on taking over this unit was to single you out, Melissa said. It wasn't all about being dazzled by your dispatch of Camus. Darman, you really bothered Agent CUIS. I like that in a trooper. I haven't had much contact with Agent CUIS, sir. Darman seemed to be playing it dead straight. I'm sorry if I gave him cause for concern. I'm not. You knew he was a force user, didn't you? And he knew you knew. Darman's larynx bobbed as he swallowed. Can't help but notice the past tense, sir. Agent CUIS was killed on duty. I don't get to hear every detail, but I hear enough. Intel is riddled with these mystics and their little cliques. At the risk of being exposed by telling you this, I want you two to report direct to me, only to me, and not deal with our otherworldly chums. Are you up for it? 
How did anyone say no to that? Define deal with, sir, Niner said. I don't mean neutralizing them. I'm eccentric, but not nuts. I mean to gather intel on them, maybe even derail their schemes when need be. Isn't that treason, sir? For us, I mean. Depends on your lawyer. Me, I think of it as keeping tabs on the enemy within. They're not on the Empire's side. The Empire belongs to its ordinary citizens. I won't see it bled dry by these mumbling hand wavers. Otherwise, we've just swapped the Jedi for another secret cult. Melissa was definitely not putting on an act. He was as enthusiastic and affable as ever, but Niner watched his hands on the desk. He held his stylus in a white-knuckled fist, thumb scraping rhythmically up and down the metal clip and twanging the end with a nail. His other hand was flat on the polished wood as if he was going to stand and slap it down hard. We're not the only commandos who could do this, sir, Darman said. Good point, and Niner wasn't sure why he was included in this conversation, other than being part of the double act. I can spot force users. So can you, obviously. No magic to it. I know what they used to say about Omega Squad. Overrated Manda-loving weirdos. Sergeant Barlex was a little more neutral, born-again Mandalorians. Mandos aren't awed by Force users. Some Mandos really hate them. Plenty of men left from the Mandalorian-trained squads, Niner said. Quite a few from Cal Scaradas and Wallen Vavs, in fact. But nobody left who's been so close to the Null Ark troopers and so steeped in Mandalorian nationalism, except you too. Scarada zone. Niner didn't take the bait. We're good, sir, but even two of us aren't the army you seem to need. The smaller the circle, the lower the risk, Melissa said. But just as the Intel Force users can't keep everything secret from us, because they can't avoid contact with common beings, your comrades got to know a fair bit about you. And I think you're as motivated as I am in your own way to reduce the dominance of Force users in galactic politics. He didn't elaborate. Maybe he knew something, and maybe he was fishing, so Niner didn't rush to fill the silence that followed. Neither did Darman. Melissa waited a little longer, then seemed to accept he was dealing with expert stonewallers. There might well have been speculation in the ranks about Darman and Etain but the chances of Melissa knowing about Cad were remote. Darman stared at him a little longer, then put on his harmless voice. Your family's from Drummond Koss, aren't they, sir? Melissa seemed caught short for a moment, lips slightly parted. The Drummond system is just a myth. If you say so, sir. Neither Niner nor Darman knew anything more than where Holy Roly came from but it was a big card to play. He hadn't a clue how they know anything about an obscure Sith world that wasn't even on the Republic charts. The look on his face told Niner that he felt he'd bitten off more than he could chew with Darman. Niner decided it was a good place to park the Sabak game for the time being. Melissa seemed to take the hint, too. Besker, he said, not so much changing tack as skipping some preamble. It all hinges on Mandalorian iron. You know all about Besker, don't you? Well, Imperial Procurement's done a deal with the Mandalorians to mine it. Besker is overkill given the existing size and punch of the Imperial Army, so this is for dealing with Jedi and other Force users. Ever seen it in action? You mean have I seen Besker Gam deflect a lightsaber blow? Niner couldn't recall. Skirata swore by it, though, and the Nulls all had genuine Besker armor. Most of the Mando training sergeants wore it. It beats Durasteel and other alloys hands down. Besker Gam, Melissa said. Armor. Means iron skin. Mandos live in their armor. 
Anyone who wanted to put Force users in their place would do well to have a supply of this stuff, wouldn't they? Niner could follow the logic. Melissa wanted to find some edge over Palpatine's dark side intel operatives. But did he know Palpatine was a Sith too? If he did, he was biting off a lot more than anyone could chew. If he didn't then, it was all the same in the end. Niner gave Holy Roly a life expectancy of a couple of months. But isn't that why we're still here, and not on Mandalore right now? Because Dar wants to protect Cad from all this. And our whole clan? Common cause. And a supply of Mando ironsmiths who know how to work Besker, Niner said. You'd be needing that, too. Melissa looked as if he hadn't considered that. A quick flash of the brows, a glance to one side for a fraction of a second, and seemed to choose something over. You can walk away from this, and we can forget anything was ever said. Dharma Noon meshed his hands. You can rely on me, sir. He didn't say for how long. Niner hated these discussions made up of double meanings and inferences. Ordo called it ambiguity. Niner just saw it as being given enough rope to hang himself, but he nodded anyway. I don't have any memories of Draman Kass for what it's worth, Melissa said. I grew up without my father. And one day, you can tell me how you even know the world exists. That'll be interesting for both of us, sir. Melissa paused for a beat. Dismissed men. Niner just took the revelation with a nod and left with Darman. They walked in silence until the doors to the central lobby closed behind them and they reached the parade ground, as private a place as any. Dar didn't even look at him. They had about two minutes' walk time to deal with the unsaid stuff before they were back within walls that might well have had ears. Sergeant Barlex, Niner said, trying to make his peace with Dar. Second Airborne, 212th Battalion. Remember him? Miserable decut. He called us born again Mandos, and his loadmaster said they'd been up against Mandos fighting for the Seps, and he called us. You should have gone, Darman said. Why the shab did you come back? What did you actually do? I told you to go. It all went belly up. Stupid bad luck, and I had to finish off a Chikar who saw a bit too much. That's not why you came back, though, is it? No, it's not. I don't want this guilt. You can't dump it on me. Hey, I'm not being a martyr, okay? My choice. I wouldn't have had a second's peace on Mandalore worrying what was happening to you here, and now that I know what Melissa's got in mind, I'm glad I stayed. Well, dropping the dead about his homeworld got his attention, so he's got to live with some uncertainty, too. Darman slowed down. It had been raining. Small puddles had formed on the parade ground, and the night air smelled of damp permacrete. But I like the guy. Him and Calbir, shame they're on opposite sides. They're both at war with the Force for the same reasons. I think they both just want the Force to leave them alone, actually. You know the killer question I forgot to ask? What? Whether Holy Roly thinks Mandalore should be part of the Empire. He does believe in the Empire, you know. Just not its management team. Does the garrison at Keldabe scare you? For Cad, I mean. Dar shook his head. They had ten slow strides to wrap this up. Not with the whole clan there. No. Good. I'm going to try to send Halvid messages to Cad, so he doesn't forget who I am. That's the spirit. Oya. Oh, yeah. Darman reached out to tap the security key code to the barracks block door. And thanks, Niviodi. It would have been hard here without you. The doors parted, and the evening's dramas were over. 
Darman was on an even keel again. Sooner or later, though, the question of when to make a run for it would come up again. All Niner knew now was not yet. Freighter Cornucopia, next morning, inbound for Freydian, mid-rim. It'll be good to see Maze again, Juzik said. He's not a bad sort when you get to know him. Ra gazed around the cockpit of the freighter. A quick change of transponder codes had given New York's ship a new identity for the time being, at Aden's insistence, and Monarch-class vessels were some of the most common sights around Freydian. Nobody would be looking for a specific one here, not yet, if they were looking for it at all. I'm impressed that New York trusts you with her transport, Ra said. I'm a safe pilot. Goes with the extra midichlorians. Everything living had them in its cells. The more you had, the more able you were to exploit the force. Nothing special. Just the way I am. Juzik had always treated it as a knack he happened to have, in much the same way that Jane had a flair for data technology. The knack used to be labeled Jedi, both explanation and identity. Now Juzik found he had expunged his sense of Jediness simply by changing a word in his head to midichlorians. He was a Mandalorian who simply happened to have more midichlorians than other Mandoade, and had been trained to use them. I'm still finding out who Bard and Juzik is. Now I've peeled off the label, I can see what's actually in the bottle. Have I got midichlorians? Ru asked. Every living cell has them. The more you have, the more potential you have to use the force. Even animals and trees. Yes. A thought struck him. So what happens if you're a nerf with a high midichlorian count? Is this a quiz? She asked. Juzik was appalled that he never asked that question before. He didn't have an answer and from that moment he knew he'd always be plagued by the idea. No, it's me thinking out loud. Well, latent force user or not, I'd bet someone ate it. Nobody assessed its potential except for stew and cutlets. Ro was an oddball. Juzik couldn't think of her as an older female in the way that he did New York or Yithin although being at least ten years older than him should have moved her into the category of folks he expected to know more than he did about life. Instead, she came across as a restless teenager who'd seen too much, too fast. It was the way she switched between utterly open questions and weary cynicism. I'm not sure I'm ever going to eat Nerf again, he said. Or Saurus Greens. Veggies have midichlorians too. Now you're just winding me up. No. Illustrating a point about our inability to fence ourselves off completely from causing pain. Being alive has a price. Riz scared him sometimes. This was his brand new sister. He recalled how excited Fi had been to acquire an instant family by adoption rather than blood, and now he understood how important those formalities were to folks. So you don't trust Maze, she said. You didn't give him the coordinates to Kiramorat. Just in case he's compromised. It's nothing to do with trust. Even our troopers can be tracked down. We found Sol when he was in hiding, remember? One day, the Empire's going to send a loyal clone to infiltrate. Don't you think Kalbir's thought of that? That still doesn't deal with the problem of what happens when it does. Juzik felt a brief pang of vague, formless fear, an animal reflex that cramped the muscles in his throat. But that was exactly what Palpatine traded on. Fear kept beings in line. Fear, shadowy things, unspecified things, things that you couldn't actually see and grab hold of, made you mistrust and suspect everyone. It separated folks. Everyone retreated to the sanctuary of their own head, unable to trust even those closest to them. And divided people didn't form up into groups to rebel. 
Fear was a cheap and easy pathogen to unleash on a population, every bit as destructive in its own way as Yuthan's viruses. We're ready for it, Juzik said. And until then, it won't stop us helping brothers in need. Ri just shrugged and sat back in the co-pilot's seat, arms folded across her chest. Dad's a bit jumpy at the moment. Did he have a fight with New York or something? Juzik had noticed. Something had shifted slightly at the gathering yesterday, and Calbert gave off a distinct anxiety in the force. It could have been the fallout from the aborted rescue, because everyone was struggling to put a brave face on that. But Juzik knew him too well. Something else had upset him, and he was still on edge when they left. Maybe. Juzik checked the NAV computer. Half an hour to re-entry to real space. He might be feeling the pressure from Aiden trying to marry them off. Juzik realized that might have been a little insensitive. Sorry. I forget that you lost your mother. It was years ago, Ru said. And Dad's more than earned the right to move on. Do you miss Corellia? I never miss anywhere. I never fit in. Not even in Kiramorat? That's different. It's Misfit Central. Juzik didn't ask if she missed her two brothers. If she wanted to discuss that, he had the feeling she'd tell him in no uncertain terms. He activated the holochart and studied the street plans of Fradians or Terminal. Mays had carried out Order 66, more or less. Juzik hadn't yet met a clone who had, and for a moment it made him feel odd. Ordo said Mays had actually arrested General Zay, but that Zay had asked him to finish the job, to spare him whatever Palpatine had lined up. Zay got a blaster bolt to the head, but on his own terms. And Juzik still felt guilty for the unkind thought that never left him, that the Jedi Order had sowed what it had reaped, and that its acceptance of a slave army had set up its own punishment. The Force had balanced the books. He avoided the discussion with Scout. She was a Jedi. He wasn't. He wondered if he would ever swing back to the middle ground and see his former allegiance more neutrally. Cornucopia dropped out of hyperspace on schedule, and Juzik landed with all the other ore carriers and supply ships. There were no Imperial troops patrolling the port, just local security, but he decided to change out of his armor. Mandalorians were highly visible. If a security holocom caught them, it might prove to be one more piece in a puzzle that some Imperial agent was putting together. Ru watched him transfer his calm kit from his helmet to his erudic clothes. We could do with some discreet body armor, she said. Concealed armor was one of the few things that was hard to come by on Mandalore. Everyone wore Besker Gam, up front and in your face. Hiding it just wasn't in the Mando mindset. I'll acquire some, Juzik said. But we'll be okay today. Just in and out, and home for dinner. We checked the power level on her blaster. That's what I said just before I ended up in a Republic prison camp. What did you call us? Carbon flush, barvez, criffing. I mean how you referred to the Republic. We called you seps, separatists, but you called yourselves the Confederation of Independent Systems. What was your nickname for us? Ro looked as if she was running through a long list in her mind's eye. Jackboots she said. Logical. Control. Surveillance. Checks. Every movement and calm message logged. All for your own good, all to protect you. And you all fell for it. Ru pulled the power clip out of her blaster with a loud snap and swapped it for another. The only thing Republic citizens ever really needed protecting from was their own government. And now they've got what they deserve. She was Cal Scarata's daughter, all right. 
Juzik marveled at the similarities in outlook, even though Calbert hadn't been around to influence her view of the world. But Corellia and Mandalore had one big cultural thing in common, they didn't take kindly to being herded. Juzik secured the freighter, and they walked through the loading yard toward the gates, dodging loader droids ferrying pallets to the ships. You including me in that? No, she said. You were institutionalized, and you still managed to tell them to shove it. Institutionalized? Brutal, but true. All families are institutions. As far as I was concerned, the order was my family. Liar. You must have known there was something missing, or you wouldn't have latched on to Dad, and you certainly wouldn't have hung up your lightsaber. Rue, ambling casually as if she did the Freydian or run every day, glanced at his belt. Where is it, by the way? Somewhere I can't draw it without thinking. Smart. I'm getting used to thinking blaster first. Verpine pistol, actually. Yeah, I noticed Dad loves his verps. The security guard at the gates was reading a holozine, arms folded on the countertop in his booth. He looked up as Juzik and Ru inserted their identichips in the scanner, squinted at the readout, and waved them past with a grunt. For a moment, Juzik completely forgot which bogus identity he was traveling with today. Something odd was distracting him, and he wasn't sure yet what it was. It was like his forced sense of danger in some ways, an urge to look over his shoulder, or a compulsion to pay attention to a specific place. But he didn't feel under threat. He just felt that there was something he'd missed. This was all down to her going on about surveillance and jackboots, nothing more. She'd made him jumpy. Better check your buddies there, she said. Juzik opened his comm link. Maze? How you doing? Maze took a couple of moments to answer. He sounded tense. Welcome to Tin Town. Picturesque, isn't it? The terminal looked like it had been designed by an architect who hated his job and wanted to get fired. Some industrial landscapes held their own stark, utilitarian beauty for Juzik, but Fradian was just plain ugly. I must buy a holocard to send to the folks, Juzik said. Okay. Shall we meet up at the tap calf with the least food hygiene violations? I've borrowed a speeder. Let's not. The lawful owner's unaware, of course. Juzik felt reassured that he could still tell when someone was under stress. Poor old Maze. He'd been tied to HQ as Zay's aide and rarely got out to do all the stabbing, stealing, and sabotaging that the other ARC troopers did. He wasn't used to taking vehicles. Okay. What transport have you got? Freighter. Can it take a small speeder? Two-seater? Cornucopia's cargo doors were full with. Sure. But you don't need to hang on to it. We'll kid you out with everything you need. I'm in the speeder now, and getting out will be... awkward. Maze didn't elaborate. Can you get to the waste processing area and park up ready to open the hatch for a quick exfil? Juzik consulted his datapad. Give me ten minutes to walk back to the ship. I'll land on the junction with the service road. Good plan, sir. Maze still thought of him as General Juzik then. I'm just barred in now, Naviogi. So you are said Maze. Juzik closed the comm link and caught Ru's arm to turn her around back to the ship. That explains my weird feeling, he said. Maze got himself in a spot. He's a bit out of practice. Now you tell me about the feeling. For stuff, I assume. Yeah. Ru strode at an impressive pace. And he wants to bring his speeder on board. Yeah. I think that's weird. 
Juzik recalled all the abandoned vehicles that Skirata's illicit activity on Coruscant had left in its wake. It had been a full-time job for Anaka the Wookiee to make sure they were all recovered, disposed of, or put back in the transport pool with new ID and livery. Abandoned vehicles made cops suspicious and left trails of evidence. It's only in Halvids where nobody worries about basic logistics, Juzik said. And Maze is pretty weird. Bardike, I don't like this. Look, you got caught. He hated himself for saying that the moment he said it. Nobody's ever caught me. Relax. As they walked back through the gates, the security guard looked up from his holozine and frowned. I.D., he said, looking Juzik over. Left something behind? Change of itinerary. I need to move the ship. You're booked in for three hours. So he wasn't that unobservant after all. Juzik drew his ID chip. I'm an annoying pilot who's going to mess up your day with extra admin work. You decide to turn a blind eye because it's not worth the trouble I'm going to turn into. You'll forget us the minute we take off. Juzik handed the guard both chips, his and Ruz. The guard sighed and handed them back. You're just going to mess up my day with extra admin work, he said. Beat it. And no refunds for unspent time. Juzik just smiled and walked on. He hated using Jedi mind influence, but he made a deal with himself to do it only when his family or another clone was in trouble. This was justified mind messing. He wouldn't make a habit of it. Honest. But sometimes it really was the kindest thing to do. Ru didn't say a word until Cornucopia's cockpit hatch sealed behind them. So what the stang was that, Spoonbender? A persuasive technique they taught us at the academy. Juzik started up the drives, one eye on the bulkhead chrono. We weren't the miscreants he was looking for. Something like that. Something like when you knocked me out cold without laying a hand on me? I never left a bruise, did I? Sometimes you creep me out, Niviodi. I promise I'll never use force tricks on you without your consent. Make that just never. The freighter lifted clear and skimmed low over kilometers of elevated conduits strung between air shafts and processing plants. The waste facility glittered below it like a lake in the barren, dusty landscape. But as Juzik brought the ship into land, the surface of the water resolved into a sewage treatment reservoir. Nothing could remain a lovely illusion for long here. He could see a speeder parking area with rows of vehicles and a few plant workers standing around a mobile generator, chatting and drinking from flimsy cups. He come Maze again. Maze, have you got a visual on me? Juzik said, keeping the repulsor drives running. Monarch class crate. Flashing my NAV lights now. Got you. You're hard to miss. Cargo doors open. Come on in. Juzik could now feel something very odd in the force, almost as if something had swept in with the grit and hot air when the cargo hatch opened. He tried to concentrate on the task in hand. He still didn't know where Maze was. Have you nicked one of the waste company's speeders? They'll notice when I start the thing. I've been holed up here since daybreak. I still don't see why he can't get off his shebs and walk out to us, Ra muttered. They won't stop him. They probably won't even know what he is, let alone who he is. I'm moving now, May said, voice tight and strained. Just hold position until I'm in. Mays was clearly under a lot of stress. Juzik didn't need to be told that. He couldn't pick out the speeder in the rows of vehicles and waited for movement to catch his eye. Then one speeder, bright red with white markings, lifted and began moving slowly out of its bay, crawling at regulation safety speed along the road toward Cornucopia's position. It had to pass a knot of workers. 
Ah, Stang, Bruce said. Get a move on, Maze. Maze sighed audibly. Juzik still had his eye on the plant workers, and as the speeder slipped past them, one looked around casually as if to check which of his buddies was moving out. Juzik couldn't hear his shout, but he saw the pointed finger, the way the rest of the workers all whipped around, and then the billow of dust as Maze hit the accelerator and sped toward the freighter. The workers started running after the speeder. Buckle up, Rube, Juzik said. It's going to be a fast exit. Hundred meters, Mays said. Juzik felt sweat prickle on his top lip. He had to sense where Mays was in relation to the ship and his speed and build an instant three-dimensional moving picture in his mind. Every other bad feeling in the force that was clamoring for attention had to wait. Juzik shut his eyes. Remember you've got brakes, Mays. Fifty meters. Start braking, Niviodi. Whoa. I said break. Juzik felt the speeder as a disturbance in the force that was about to crash through the back of his skull. The airframe shook. Riz swore. Maze's voice said, Clear! And Juzik hit the hatch control, shutting the cargo doors. He didn't think about anything else until the freighter was hurtling into a sky getting darker by the second. He headed for the jump point as soon as they were past the upper layer of Fradian's atmosphere. So what if that isn't Maze? Riz said at last. Juzik breathed again. Maze? He could feel something very wrong now. He took out his verbine. He was sure that it was Maze he could feel in the Force, but there was someone with him. Juzik sensed a Force user, and a presence he thought he knew but that shifted and wavered like a bad calm signal. Maze was an ARC trooper, and he followed his orders like a pro. He had one of Palpatine's Sith agents with him. Juzik knew it. Ru, when the NAV computer indicates, hit the jump button, Juzik said. We can't dump things out the airlock in hyperspace. Just do it. Juzik scrambled down the ladder and made his way cautiously down the shoulder-wide passage that connected the forward cargo hold to the cargo bay itself. He reached for his weapons, verpine in his right hand, lightsaber in his left. The blade sprang to life, green and humming. Ambidexterity was a useful ability. In the dim deck headlighting, he could see a dusty speeder vibrating slightly in tune with the ship. One hatch opened, very slowly. He aimed the verp. Maze, get out. Hands on your head. Stand clear where I can see you. The hatch opened far enough for Maze to step out. Yes, it was Maze. He was wearing a grubby brown tunic and a couple of days' growth of stubble but it was him all right. Maze put both hands on his head, fingers locked. It's not how it looks. And your buddy. Juzik looked to the left-hand hatch. If Maze tried anything, he could drop him with the verp, but the force user would need the little extra persuasion of a lightsaber. Get out on deck. Hands on your head. Just freeze, or you won't have a head. Juzik felt that wavering presence in the force change from something vague and shifting to something he knew very well indeed. He wondered if it was a trick. There was no telling who or what Palpatine had signed up to work for until these days. And even if the shabby form that squeezed out of the speeder hatch was hard to recognize, the suddenly clear presence in the force wasn't. General? Juzik said aghast. Master Zay? The man who stood before him obeying his instructions was a lot thinner than the Zay he'd known, and looked as if he'd been through each one of Corellia's nine hells. I'm not armed, Zay said. Maze took my lightsaber. Juzik looked to Maze, still keeping Zay in his view and ready to take his own lightsaber to him if he moved. He was shocked by his own reaction. 
You shot him. Ordo said you shot him. The Knight of Order 66 Ordo's not half as smart as he thinks he is, Mays said. Well, he is, but he got this one wrong. You lied to me, Mays. You set us up. I just left out a detail. You want us to save him, too? Is that it? Or is he a peace offering for Cal to play with? Yes, Mays said. I'm asking you to help both of us. We must have been listening on the ship's system. Sixty seconds to jump, she said calmly. Last chance to dump them out the airlock. Juzik looked at Mays. The man deserved better. But he had no idea what to do about Say, or even how he'd concealed his presence. This wasn't a Jedi rescue operation. This was for the men they used and discarded. He only had seconds to decide. He did the compassionate thing, but he didn't lower his weapons. He made himself a promise that he'd use them later if this all went wrong. And he'd have some explaining to do to Skirata. Thirty seconds, Bardai K, Ruh said. I say flush Maze for being the lying Barvet and flush the Jedi just because. Fifteen seconds. Ten. Jump, said Juzik. Twelve. Everyone's got some serious dirt in their history, ma'am. In the days of the Old Republic, we Mandalorians wiped out at least one sentient species just to prove that we could, the Kathar. Are we ashamed of that? I hope so. But if anyone tries to wipe us out again, I feel better knowing we once did something to deserve our fate. It's easier to take than just being spotless victims. Wadi Tehai, historian and mercenary, in conversation with Kinaha. Kirimorat Mandalore. But I was never part of this, New York said. I never joined anything, signed anything, or agreed to anything. There was a helplessness about being innocent that left New York floundering. What could she say? Some Jedi had added her name to a list of pilots who could be contacted to move fugitives. They hadn't asked, she didn't know. All she knew now was that people she loved and trusted were looking at her as if she was a traitor, a traitor who could have brought the Empire to their front doors. Aiden, ever the loyal friend, leaned on the back of her chair with his hand resting on her shoulder. It's okay, we know, he said. We just want to backtrack a bit so we can work out how, because how might tell us what else the Shabla Jedi's have lumbered us with. It felt like an interrogation even if she was surrounded by friends, Skirata, Ordo, Muriel, and Aiden. New York felt guilty of being gullible. She never thought of herself that way. What scared her more than anything wasn't the Empire, she realized, but being despised by the only friends she now had. Cal, you believe me, don't you? Skirata sat in a chair by the door, occasionally rubbing one hand over his face as if he was tired and trying to focus. His gaze wandered back to her, and he fixed her with that implacable blue stare that could have been hatred or just distraction. No, he was thinking about something else. He blinked, and suddenly he was really looking at her. Resources he snapped his fingers. Everyone and everything is a resource for them. Take a ship, take a pilot, take an army. All in their holy cause, all justifiable, and they don't even think about what they leave in their wake, because they mean well. New York thought that sounded a lot like Skirata's approach, but she was in no position to lecture him at the moment. Well, we got to it before the Empire did, Bordo said. Thanks to Niner and Obrim. That man saved my Sheb's way too often. Skirata went to get up, but Ordo motioned him to sit down again and refilled his cup. There seemed to be a kind of telepathy at work between them. The question now is who else has this information? Because the chances of them keeping it on one chip are zero. 
Muriel sucked his teeth contemptuously. Along with their chances of learning that the safest place to hide something is in your shabla head. It's not chaff, then, Aiden said. Not planted as a decoy. Not with New York's data on it, Bordeaux said. They couldn't have known it would end up here. You sure? If they'd been able to plan that far ahead, Bordeaux said, Palps wouldn't have been able to pull off the purge, would he? Well, we can sit waiting for the other shoe to drop, or we can get out and manage this, Scarada said. Let's see what else Jane shakes out of it. Then we can work out who might have what. I'm sorry, Cal, New York said. She felt like a naughty kid, with the grown-ups talking over her head about what should be done about her. I'm really sorry. She expected Scarada to tell her that it wasn't her fault. She needed to hear that. All the sweat, all the pain, all the lives that had gone into creating this safe haven, and now she might be the cause of its downfall because she was gullible. She could hardly bear to think beyond the next terrible second. It's my fault, Scarada said. I never stopped to ask the obvious. You told me there were Jedi looking for somewhere to hide. Once you mentioned Kinaha, I never stopped to ask why you, why out of all the pilots they could have picked, they ended up with you. New York tried to reconstruct the sequence of events. Freight pilots and illegals went hand in hand. Some pilots did it for credits, some did it out of pity, and some didn't know they were doing it at all, because they didn't secure their ships or check their holds well enough. She did it out of pity. And she even did it for Aiden to get whatever information she could about her husband's ship, transporting the Ark Trooper Sul off Gaftaker to save him from being shot as a deserter. I knew New York would help refugees, Aiden said. The other freighter pilots used to say she was soft. That's how I got to know her, and why I asked her to run errands for us. The Jedi worked that out too. Like it or not, Bear, we have way too much in common with the Jedi when it comes to exploitation. New York had no idea she was seen as such a soft touch. She wasn't sure if she felt insulted or not. Well, I never dumped a stowaway out of the airlock or called the port cops, she said. Some I just kicked out when I found them on pre-launch checks. Some I felt sorry for. Scout approached me and I couldn't say no to a starving Jedi kid so soon after Etain died. So I said maybe. Skirata slurped his CAF and got up to wander around the kitchen. We're already vulnerable. Palpatine's got saber jockeys of his own, all kinds of foot soldiers who can sniff out other force sensitives. They could detect Cad and Bardai K if they got within range. I'm making a dangerous assumption that having Kinaha and Scout here doesn't add to the problem, and it's a trade-off against the benefit we can get from Kinaha's genetic material. But as soon as Yuthan's done with her, Skirata stopped dead but New York continued his train of thought. You want them gone, she said. But they know about this place. And even if they won't give that information away, they can have it extracted from them the hard way. Which leaves you with one option. Tell me you're not going to take it. He looked broken-hearted. He often did these days, but she knew what was going through his mind this time. You're not one of us. You're not the woman I thought you were. New York, I swear that not one more clone will die to save a Jedi's hide, he said. Not one. Do you understand? If you ask me to choose between a Jedi's life and a clone's, I'll choose the clones. The Jedi had it easy for centuries, and now they're not special or privileged anymore. They're expendable just like my boys were. We owe them nothing. He tipped the dregs of his CAF down the drain and left the room. It's okay, Bordo said. Bear knew it was a risk from the start. He's just angry with himself.
If he told you to get lost and refused to hide Kinaha, he'd be beating himself up now for passing on a chance to get her DNA. Aiden squeezed New York's shoulder. Even if Palps had that data chip, how's he going to identify you, or the ship, or even know where you are? Anyone looking for Mandalorians knows where to start anyway. Even a weak way. They were nice boys, kind boys. She couldn't bear to see anything happen to them. Tell me what I need to do to put this right, and I'll do it. Whatever it is. Nothing you can do, Mariel said. Nothing anyone can do. I think we learned a long time ago that there was never going to be a point where we could shut the door, put our feet up, and say, well, it's all going to be plain sailing from now on. We don't live in that kind of world. We're always going to be fighting. Skirata came back a few minutes later with a few sheets of flimsy in his hand, reading as he walked. Jane thinks he's got about 90% of the data, or he will have in a couple of hours. Then it just needs someone to sift through it and evaluate it. Me, Mariel said. Seeing as I don't have a date tonight. Yeah, you need the rest, Ordo muttered. Altus crops up a lot. Skirata seemed to have forgotten his near argument with New York. He's a busy boy. Looks like he's running at least a couple of escape routes. Somebody find me some intel on Pletswell. Never heard of it, but that's a challenge I can't resist, Mariel said. Any clues? Jedi safe house, by the sound of it. Maybe that's where all the survivors headed. Skirata looked up and caught New York's eye. She hoped he wasn't thinking the worst. He said he wasn't getting involved in anyone else's wars now, just looking after his own. That'd be dumb, huddling in one place. You think they'd have learned from us? Balan Shevla. Scatter. Don't present a single target. Coordinates? If Jane can find them, that'll come in handy. New York didn't dare say a word. This wasn't the time to provoke Skirata. She knew him well enough by now to realize that he switched into a savagely protective mode when he thought his family was under threat, and in that state of mind he'd think nothing of destroying whole planets, let alone individual beings. She wasn't even sure he'd regret it afterward. He's not like the men you knew back home. He grew up without rules. He's always been on the edge of survival. He's not Papa Cal all the time. Hasn't Bard I.K. called in yet? Skirata asked. Not yet. Give him a couple of hours. Skirata seemed placated. He walked over to New York's chair, eyes still fixed on the flimsy sheets and patted her on the head just like he did the clones. They used you up, New York, he said, still not looking at her. Now it's our turn. He settled down in the chair again and went on reading. Occasionally, he snorted to himself, or said, Shab, and shook his head. Eventually, Jane came into the kitchen with a thick sheaf of printed flimsy and dumped it on the table. There you go. And that's just a third of it, he said. Poor old Camus. It would really tick him off to know we were pawing through all his data. Can I have a CAF break now? Son, you're a genius. And modest with it. No Bardike yet? Maybe we got him back for that force punch at the POW camp. She's a chip off the old block, Kalbir, never forgets a grudge. Munit Tongtail, Skoda Isa. Skirata winked. That's long memory, short fuse, New York. The Mandalorian character. She didn't know what to make of that. I'll leave you lads to it, she said, getting up and passing his chair. Time for my rounds. New York, it's no big deal. Skirata caught her arm, as if he did that all the time. We're pretty sure you were just a name on a list. 
nothing else. I know, she said. But she also knew he'd corner Scout and ask her why she'd approached Cornucopia, just to double-check, and that in his position she'd have done exactly the same. New York wandered around the house, checking who was where, as if the place was her ship and she was securing hatches for launch. Habit was comforting. Scout was with Yuthan in the lab, deep in a conversation that looked as if it was doing both of them good, two lost souls whose societies had been wiped out in an instant. Kinaha was dozing in her room, or maybe she was meditating. Bessany was trying to get Cad to stand still to measure him for clothing. He was growing fast. Parja stood outside Arla's room. The door was slightly open, and New York could hear Lasima talking. Parja tapped her blaster in its holster. Not taking any chances, she whispered. The sooner Midge I.K. gets back with something stronger for her, the better. Outside, New York could see Jilka and C.O.R.R. ambling arm in arm along the edge of the stream. That was definitely a romance in progress. In the distance, she could hear the sound of vibrasaws and occasional shouts as Levitt and the Yayax boys built a fence. Or maybe it was a barn. She really didn't know what they got up to most of the time, but they seemed happy enough doing it. Whatever was happening in the rest of the galaxy, life here was making a ferocious effort to get back to normal. Her rounds took her the full distance of the perimeter, enough of a walk to clear her head and put things in perspective. As she completed the circle and walked back through the yard, dodging the Nuna as they squabbled over mudworms, she spotted Fi sitting on the wall, staring across to the woods. He didn't notice her for a moment. He looked utterly dejected, shoulders sagging, and he hung his head for a moment as if he was crying. When her boots crunched on some gravel, he looked up and instantly transformed into cheerful, wise-cracking Fi again. So, are you going to call the cops and report your freighter stolen? He said. Bardike's probably wrapped it around a tree by now. He's as mad as a box of Hapan Chags when he gets into a pilot's seat. New York sat down next to him, wincing at the sharp edge of the brick under her backside, and put her arm around his shoulders. Cut the act, Ad I.K., she said. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm not stupid. Okay, I'm upset about Dar and Niner. I really miss them. I really need to see them again. Am I going to live long enough to see them come home? He looked at her for a while as if he was expecting her to tell him to get a grip. She hadn't realized how rapid aging would start to trouble the clones. Maybe they all felt a sense of life racing past them now, faced with the changing seasons on a rural planet. Time was visible here. Yes, Cal. I do understand. I understand why you'd do anything for these boys. Of course you will, Fi, she said. It's not going to be forever. And everyone beats the odds here, right? Look at you. Good as new. Not quite. But good enough. New York kept him company, pulling up her collar against the chilly spring wind. She hoped he was joking about Juzik's piloting skills. Liability or not, that freighter was her last link to her old life. There were memories of Terran in it. She wasn't sure when she'd be ready to let go of them completely. Kirimorat Mandalore. Cornucopia settled on its dampers, and leaned back in her seat. The silence in the cockpit almost throbbed. Okay, I'll head Dad off, she said at last. You know he's going to go nuts, don't you? I'll deal with him. Juzik unbuckled his seat restraint and turned to fix Maze and Zay with a warning stare. Not a word until I've placated him, okay. May's arms folded, looked more intimidating now than he ever had in his smart white armor. Juzik wasn't sure if it was just the stubble or the look in his eyes. 
I'm not afraid of the old Barve, Maze said. I did this. I'll be just fine telling him why. Zayi looked crushed. He was a big man, a big personality, but all Juzik could feel from him was a sense of guilt that dwarfed him. I could just turn around and disappear again, Zayi said. It'd be better for everyone. Ra leaned across the console and pressed the hatch controls. Not now you know where we are. You're not going anywhere until Dad says you can. Maze gave Juzik a mock bow of the head. After you, Bardai K. It had to be done. Like all awkward things, it was best done quickly and without prevarication, Juzik decided. He wondered if he should have warned Ordo before the ship landed. But that just meant someone else had the task of breaking the news to Kalber. Juzik couldn't dodge his responsibilities like that. The hatch ramp beckoned like a condemned man's last walk to a scaffold. What made it worse was Skirata's warm welcome when Juzik stepped off the ramp onto Kiramorat's soil. Ordo stood right behind him. Good to have you back, son, Skirata said. You might change your mind when you see what I brought back with me. Ah, never. Skirata, all smiles, looked past Juzik into the open hatch. Maze is okay. Isn't he, or Daike? I don't mean him. Say it. Just spit it out. Beer, Maze had someone with him when we picked him up. And it was me who decided not to dump him out the airlock. Skirata half smiled. As long as it's not some death watch Shabir. No. I brought back Arligan Zay. Somehow, Juzik had managed to forget what would be the biggest shock for Skirata, the fact that Zay was still alive at all. Skirata just stared into his face, blinking, as if he knew he hadn't heard right and was trying to guess which words his failing hearing had mangled. But the news didn't stop Ordo in his tracks. Maze shot him, Ordo said. I heard the blaster discharge. I left them both in Zayi's office. Well, whatever, Zayi's alive, and Maze saved him. Juzik stepped forward and caught Skirata's shoulders. Beer, I'm sorry. I had to make a snap decision. It was probably the wrong one. Skirata looked ashen. That was worse than seeing him erupt into a rage. He looked slightly to one side of Juzik probably not believing that Zayi really would come out that hatch. Why, son? His voice was a whisper. Why didn't you come me first? Juzik wanted to die of shame. His first substantial act after Skirata adopted him was a moment of madness, dangerous madness that made everything worse. He didn't deserve a father like this. Stupidity, Juzik said. And maybe I'm not as Mandalorian as I think I am. Ordo stepped in and took over, as he always did when he sensed things were about to get out of hand. He stormed up the ramp and vanished into the ship. For all Juzik's extra senses, he wasn't taking in the feeling in the force because he was so fixed on the shocked pain on Skirata's face. He heard raised voices, Rumaze, Ordo, and he was aware of movement in the background as Phi Bessany and New York came out of the house to see what was going on. Juzik knew that the quieter Skirata was, the worse things would get. Kalbir found it easier to let off steam about smaller matters. His silence had begun a shock and was now turning into a logjam of fury, resentment, and hurt. Juzik sensed it all in the force. At point-blank range it was like standing in front of an open furnace. A real Mandalorian wouldn't even blink about ditching Zay. Am I still a Jedi deep down? Is Kalbir having doubts about me? Is his hurt coming from me? Skirata seemed distracted by what was happening behind Juzik. When Juzik turned, Zay was stepping down from the ramp, flanked by Maze and Ru. Ordo was right behind them as if he was shoving them out of the ship. 
I didn't think you'd be pleased to see me, said Zay. He held out his hand uncertainly, but Skirata didn't take it. Thank you anyway. Nothing personal. Skirata's voice was hoarse, as if the conversation was choking him. But if any Jedi is going to come back from the dead, it ought to be Atain. I heard, Zay said. I'm so sorry. I just can't believe you're Jerla enough to stroll in here. That's nerve. That's arrogance. Ordo gave Juzik a look of pure ice and turned Skirata around bodily, facing him back toward the house. Get inside, Calbert, he said firmly. We can't sort it out here. New York? New York, get the ship under cover. Come on inside. Now. Juzik felt Skirata's anger swallow him whole, a great red tunnel where sound and light were instantly an infinity away. There were times when Juzik became so attuned to another being in the force that he almost felt what they felt, and this time it scared him. He fell into that red vortex for a second. Skirata's pounding pulse shook his whole body and Juzik's with it. It took all Juzik's will to jerk himself back out of it and stand apart again. Kalbir's frustration, three years of a hated war underpinned by decades of resentment, was looking for a valve to vent from. It would spurt out in the direction of Zay. Skirata stormed back inside. Scout and Kinaha peered at the doors but stood back as if a speeder had nearly run them down. Juzik held out his arm to stop them following Skirata and Zay into the Karii, but Kinaha drew herself up to her full height and withered him with a glance born of centuries. I would never abuse your hospitality, she said. But this man is a Jedi, and so he is my business as much as yours. I was his Padawan. Juzik said, as if it was an answer. Are you sure you still aren't? It was hard to hide doubt from another Force user. Juzik was so wounded by the comment that he didn't bar the door. An angry little group gathered in the Karii. May stared at Kinaha and Scout, almost ignoring Skirata. The captain had never seemed the shockable sort, but it was clear he hadn't expected to see Jedi here. So you didn't have the stomach for it then, Maze, Skirata said. Or did he spin you some asik about his respect for all life and what a great little clone you were? How dare you bring him here? Juzik tried to get the situation back under control. It's me, Bear. It's my fault. Don't blame Maze. No, I want to know why he thinks it's okay to bring a Jedi here especially now that there's an imperial garrison on our doorstep. Whether he shot him or not is his business, but when he wants to bring him here, it's mine. May seemed distracted by Kinaha and Scout. Well, looks like it's Jedi Knight at Cal's, if you don't mind my saying so. And a Kaminoan? Going soft, Sergeant? So you're going to lecture me on consorting with the enemy, are you? Cal, let's discuss this calmly, Zayi said. I don't blame you for being angry. This place is for clones, Skarada said. Get it? They're the ones who need help. Not Shabla Jedi whining how tough things are and how they need protection. Is this some experiment to see how much insult you can add to injury without the whole galaxy imploding? Zayi didn't even try to defend himself. Juzik tried to gauge who was going to snap first. He bet on Ordo. I'm not proud of what we were party to, Cal, Say he said. I'm not claiming innocence or that I was only following orders. But don't you think we got our punishment for that? So what do you want from us? We're collecting so many Jedi here that we're going to show up like the Shabla Jedi Academy on Palpatine's force radar. You know he's a Sith, then. Of course we know he's a Sith. We did business with them for generations. We know stuff about Sith that the Jedi Order erased from the records. You just can't hide history from everyone, Zay. There's always some other source. 
Our only problem is spotting the difference between you two gangs of crazies. Cal, you know that the Sith are bad news. They're evil. They've always been the cause of endless war and carnage across the galaxy. Oh, that's a good one, Skarada said. He mimicked Zayi's baritone growl. My decapitations are more morally valid than your decapitations. Only difference I can see is that they plan to end up with trillions dead, and you do-gooders manage it by accident. I'm not asking you to save the Jedi Order, Cal. I'm not even asking you to save me. I can leave. I should never have come here. The only way you're leaving here is dead, Zay. Because I wouldn't trust you not to shop us filthy Mando savages to the Empire. It was pointless telling Calbert that Zay was genuine and broken. Scarada would find no pity. He even seemed torn about May's. Juzik felt the conflicting waves of sympathy and anger when Scarada looked at the man. Scarada stared up into Maze's face. Just tell me, he said quietly, that you didn't do this out of loyalty. Maze leaned over just a fraction. No, he wasn't intimidated by Scarada at all. I did it because I thought he should get a fair trial. And because he used to make the CAF in the office. It's funny how the little things tell you all you need to know about the man. So, give you a pot of CAF, no sugar, splash of cream, maybe some nice cookies, and it's okay to send men to their deaths without asking them if they mind. Ordo hovered, ready to intervene. Maze wasn't scared of him, either, even though the Null had once punched him out. Maze stabbed a finger at Skirata but stopped short of jabbing it in his chest. Zay's here, he snarled. I'm responsible for that, the war's over, and you need to change the recording, sergeant, because it's getting kind of monotonous. He'll get you killed. So? It'll be my choice. I'm not one of your poor dumb victim clones. You didn't free them from the Jedi. You just brainwashed them from Mandalore. When are you going to let them think for themselves? Right now, said Ordo. Just as Ordo's fist came up, Juzik reacted instinctively and force pushed him backward. May staggered back a few steps as if the aborted punch had landed. The wake of another force push tugged at Juzik as it ebbed. For a split second both clones looked disoriented, and Zay grabbed May's arm. That was you, was it? Maze asked. Sorry. Zay shook his head. Don't fight over this. Please. Come on. Juzik stepped between Skirata and Maze. Bear, go for a walk. Everyone, get out and leave us to talk. You too as well. Ordo herded Skirata to the door, somehow forcing Kina Ha and Scout ahead of them. Maze scowled but looked to Zay for a nod to go. Just remember what you are, Bard I.K., Bordo said. It was one of those moments when Juzik felt he was broadcasting his innermost fears. The doors closed and he was alone with his old master. The truly odd thing was that he had no sense of the past now, no memory of how it actually felt to be tied to Zay in apprenticeship. He recalled all the details. He simply couldn't reproduce the emotions. Some things can't be undone, Zayi said. I should have known Skarada would react like that. And he's right. He owes me nothing, and all I can bring him is more trouble. I'm sorry, Bardan. Juzik struggled. He wanted to be a good Mandoad. So where will you go? Why am I asking him that? Am I shaking him down for information? What are you going to do? I don't know. I can't run forever. And Maze? He put his life on the line for me. As an equal, in case you were wondering. I've got to consider his welfare. Juzik decided not to mention Altus. 
I need to know something. He didn't feel right calling Zay by any name now. Master, General, Zay Arley, anything. He didn't know what Zay was to him any longer, only that the man had been instrumental in his youth, and that had to count for something. Are you going to try to rebuild what the Jedi had before? Is this a trick question? I need to know if anything I do to help you will end up cutting my brother's throats one day. What did we ever do to you, Bardan? What did I do to you to drive you away like this? It's not just a principled stand about the degeneration of the Order, much as I respect that. I'm still working it out. All or nothing, that was how Juzik was, and he knew it. He was raised in one cult, and he moved seamlessly into another. He knew all that. He understood why the bond of combat transcended even family, too, but that didn't mean he had any control over it. He'd settle and find an equilibrium in years to come, but not now. He couldn't face his Jedi past for so many reasons. Mandalore represented unquestioning acceptance and space to work it all out. This is my family. I need to be here for them. I'll do what I can for you, but not at their expense. Was it losing a tain that tipped you? Zay asked. We all lost too many friends. There's nobody left. Maybe there is. Juzik felt Zay's pain. Maze must have been the only person left that he could trust. Did you think Maze would shoot you? Zay ran his huge hand through shaggy graying hair, eyes shut. Right up to the moment the blaster bolt hit the wall a meter from me. I didn't even sense his emotions. Good man, Maze. Good friend. Yes. Come on, I'll show you to a room. We've got plenty. Cal will calm down, and then we can talk sensibly. Bear means father, doesn't it? Yes. He adopted me. Say he didn't say another word. He just put his hand on Juzik's shoulder as they walked down the passage diverting via another corridor to avoid the kitchen. Juzik could hear the voices there. He showed Zay into one of the spare bedrooms still waiting for deserters in need of a new identity, threw him a towel from the cupboard, and left him to clean up. Then he went in search of Jane. Jane was in the small workshop that he'd set up in another bedroom. Screens and scopes covered every shelf and a thick wooden plank of a workbench stretched across the width of the wall. Kamarke had claimed a corner to himself and was hunched over a 2D holochart, tapping numbers into a data pad, completely absorbed in the calculation. Who'd have thought it, Bardai K? Jang said, not looking up from the screen in front of him. Saucy old D-cut, showing up like that. Moral of the story, always go back and check for a pulse. Ordo's never going to live that down, Kamarke muttered. Ha ha. Jane printed out some more data. Is it hard for you? Zay, I mean. The master Padawan relationship must be pretty close. No different from families. Or marriages. Juzik didn't want to be dissected. Some are great. Some aren't. Some don't get on at all. Me and Zay, I don't know. More managerial than paternal. But he's not an innocent bystander like Kina Ha or Scout. Command ranks got to mean something. Jane paused, smiling to himself as if he'd found something juicy in the files. Still, it's hard to cap someone who's just standing there looking pathetic, even when you know you'll regret it one day if you don't. I'll do it, Kamarke said. Nothing personal. Just necessary. Or we could use them to our advantage. Jane tapped his finger on the pile of flimsy. Because one day, the Empire's going to really tick us off, and we'll need the skills of some saber jockeys who owe us. Kamarke laughed. They've owed a lot of people for a long time. 
don't see much of them repaying their debts. Yes, but there are ways of enforcing moral obligation. Jane grinned. He always did. He enjoyed problems and had complete confidence of his own ability to solve them. Like by keeping a firm grip of their gedesi. Juzik could see the logic. And he found it telling that Jane could think of him as both an ex-Jedi and a non-Jedi in the same breath. There wants the Jedi out of our lives, advantages or not. Let's not be too hasty. We know where their bolt holes are, and with a little ingenuity we can track their movements. They step out of line. The Empire gets a treasure map with here be Jedi on it. Kamarke laughed again. That boy's sick. You got that location yet? Jane asked. Chop chop. Get a move on. In a minute. It's looking like the Plow Rift. What is? Skirata asked. Their main safe house for their kids. I think they call it Pletswell. Some of the data on here is from the Jedi Temple archives. Blackmail. It sounded ugly, but having dirt on others and others having dirt on you was a glue that bound folks together across the galaxy. It was as much a power for balance and harmony as the Force. Of course, if we know where they're holed up, we could just wipe out the rest of them now, Kamarke said. Or even do a deal with the Empire. But I don't trust any of them. Juzik took to heart the Mandalorian saying that an enemy's enemy wasn't always your friend. If they were, then it wouldn't be for long. Ordo thinks I'm going soft on my old associates, Juzik said. I can't blame him. Are you? Do you think I am? Nah. Do you want me to shoot you if you are? Kamarke had that kind of deadpan humor. But humor had its serious purpose in life. Yes, Juzik said, half meaning it. Make it before I do any real damage. Jang just looked up at Kamarke, the slightest pause as if it wasn't funny. You got it, Niviodi, Kamarke said, and went back to his holochart. 501st Special Unit Barracks, Imperial City. The droid came in to fix your helmet, Reed said, strapping on his belt. It's over there. He said there was nothing wrong with it, and you need to read the manual. Darman draped his towel around his neck, rubbing his wet hair with one end, and stared at the helmet sitting on the bunk. He couldn't recall reporting a fault. Then it dawned on him. The droid was Jane's buddy the one that had modded Niner's bucket to give him a secure route to the nulls. Jane didn't hang about. The audio link was installed. I can talk to Cad. I can talk to Fi and Otten too. And Kor. And Kalbir. Darman's mood lifted instantly. It was almost as good as being there. He checked the chrono on the wall and tried to work out what time it was at Kiramorat, then realized he had no idea because he didn't know where the place was. Without a reading for longitude, he couldn't work it out. I'll call anyway. Whoever answers won't mind being woken up. We haven't got a manual, Darman said. Maybe he was joking. Maybe Reed was, too. It was hard to tell. The kid soaked up experience and knowledge like a sponge, and Darman found it a bit unnerving. He found himself saying things that Skirata used to say back on Kamino, when he was surprised by how fast clones assimilated things, and how they changed before his eyes. They grow up too fast. Is that Sergeant Cal's voice, or mine? And who am I talking about, Reed or my son? A month was nearly a couple of years in terms of Reed's development. Darman watched him going through the checklist on his DC-17, with none of the unconscious ease that years of using the rifle had given the Kamino commandos. He wondered if that meant Reed would carry on aging at that same rate. It was a pretty depressing thought. 
The new clones might be even worse off than Darman's generation. He knew that Kalbert had Dr. Yuthan working on a way around that. But he wasn't going to bank on it. Niner was still in the freshers, but Enin was sitting on the edge of his bunk, half-dressed in his undersuit and lower body plates. He was staring at the floor tiles. The squad was supposed to muster at 0600 hours, which didn't leave any time to slob around. Darman wrapped the chrono on the wall to get Enin's attention. Hey, look sharp, Naviodi. Doors to kick down, stuff to blow up. Enin took a few moments to react. What's the point? Where's the peace and freedom and all that garbage we were supposed to see when we got the job done? What is all that, anyhow? Darman knew it was about missing Bry. He'd seen it before with other men. They would go on coping with losses for a long time, and then one death, not always their closest brother, but usually, would hit them hard enough to knock the stuffing out of them. Enin had fought for three tough, bloody years alongside Bry, and now Bry was gone. Dar and Niner had something to look forward to. It might have been out of reach at the moment, but it was there. It was full of promise and potential that he could still see, even through the daily pain of thinking of all the ways Atain wouldn't be there to share it with him. I've got a son. I've got a home to go to one day. So has Niner. You want to talk, Niviodi? Enin glanced at the chrono on his wrist. We got to go now. He stood up and attached his chest and back plates. The war's over. It's over, and Brian made it, and then he gets killed when it's over. If I thought there was a purpose to it, something more than this, I think I could take it. But it's just going to be this day after day, isn't it? Until we're all dead with nothing to show for it. The sound of running water stopped. Darman could hear Niner whistling as he dried himself. In the sergeant's absence, he had to deal with this. Enin, you just have to get through this bad patch. How could Darman tell him he knew how pointless life could feel, because he'd lost his wife? We've all been there. Even Delta, remember? Look, Holy Roly doesn't mind us going to cantinas. When we get back, how about we go and get an ale, and work all this out? Enin stared at him for a moment as if he was looking for the catch, then nodded. Yeah. Let's do that. If I had something to make sense of this, some end in sight, it'd make a difference. I just can't see anything. Is he asking? I don't know how guys get to find out about Kirimorat. Shall I tell him? It was a tough call. Just mentioning the place was a big risk, because it revealed what Darman knew and suggested he knew a lot more, which he didn't. Enin hadn't been raised by Mando Kiwi Val Dar anyway. But neither had Levitt, and Niner said he'd deserted to Mandalore, too. I'll find a way to tell him, but not now. I need to ask Ordo how to do this. Niner reached for his undersuit. We all okay here? Ready to roll, Enin said, putting on his helmet. He switched completely. All a guy could do was get a grip and carry on for the moment. Still the lower level sweep? Niner nodded. The cops did a routine stop on a human male with a stolen speeder, and he pulled a lightsaber on them. Wisely, because they're not total DQ, they pursued him at a safe distance, and now they've got a wall of squad speeders surrounding the place he holed up in. Why they always bolt to the lower levels I'll never know. Too obvious. Mandalore was an obvious bolt hole, too. But unlike Mandalore, the lower levels of Imperial City were still a place where people could vanish. What's de cute? Reed asked. Don't encourage them, kid, Enin said. They'll turn you into a Mandalorian. You wouldn't want that. Reed paused. 
Darman could always tell when he was consulting the head-up display in his visor because he wobbled a bit, as if he'd lost his balance for a split second. He wasn't used to the mass of images and telemetry filling his field of vision while he was trying to look past it at what was in front of him. He just hadn't had enough time alive to get used to it. It was still disorienting. Darman and Niner had worn huds almost every day since they were old enough to hold a spoon to feed themselves. I know now, Reed said. He'd obviously digested the data under M for Mandalore. Yeah, I know what a Mandalorian is now. Niner leaned close to him as they filed out. That database, he said, will tell you nothing worth knowing about Mandalore. Reed didn't answer. Maybe he couldn't yet read his HUD, watch his environment, and talk at the same time. There was a LAT slash I gunship waiting for them on the landing pad. Darman hadn't expected to see so many still in service, given the speed with which the Empire had rolled out new hardware, but they were brand new vessels by military standards and the Empire wasn't stupid enough to junk everything from the old regime. Like the metamorphosis from Chancellor to Emperor, the change from Grand Army of the Republic to Imperial Army was often a lick of paint and a new name. The gunship had the new Imperial livery and symbols. It's still a lardy. Darman was secretly pleased to see it. He jumped in knowing where everything was. In pitch blackness and upside down, he could find every switch, handle, and safety device. It was a little bit of what he used to think of as home and the engine's noise was, as it always had been, a soothing voice speaking of rescue, resupply, and safe haven. Reed stood beside him in the crew bay and grabbed a deckhead strap. You ever done this in the city before? Niner asked him. It's like nothing else. Just seeing as much of a building below you as above you is weird. Yeah, and the neighbors love us flying by and gawking through their windows. Ennen said. You'll be amazed what you can see. Use your infrared filter for a real laugh. Per read, Darman doubted his flash training, flash training ten times more rushed and compressed than any Kamino clones, helped fill in the gaps there. The pilot had the cockpit door closed, so there was no opportunity for banter. The gunship lifted off high over the barracks making Darman's teeth vibrate with that familiar frequency, and wove its way between the towering city blocks. Fi loved this. He really got a kick out of the city. I can talk to him now. It's been, what, best part of two years. He's married. He'll have kids by the time I get to see him. Niner's voice cut in. The lack of an audio icon in Darman's HUD told him this wasn't an official comm channel. So you're wired, Dar. Can they hear us? No. But Ordo or one of the others probably can. That was fine. Darman had no secrets from them. When we get back, I'm going to ask to talk to Cad. I want to tell him why I'm not there for him. Yeah, we can do that from time to time. Have you spoken to the others? Not yet. You know what I'm like, Dar. Still got to be careful. I think we should let Enin know about Kiramorat. He's pretty down, isn't he? He needs some light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, but clear it with Ordo or Calbear. The gunship darted through a forest of glass high-rises and for a few moments it ran level with a vast advertise screen urging imperial citizens to keep an eye on suspicious newcomers to their neighborhood in the upheaval that followed the war. They can look just like U.S., it warned. Darman wondered who us was on a planet of a thousand different species, but he got the idea. Is Enin a safe bet? Will he shop us to the authorities if we let him know he can desert any time? Darman just didn't know. He'd have to talk to Ordo. Niner was right. Ordo would have a sensible answer. Reed, 
looking a little nervous judging by the way he edged to the sill of the lardy to look below, pointed down. Wow, they've cordoned off a lot of sky lanes for one guy. Darman leaned out to look. The ship was flying a few levels above the target area, and the cops were taking no chances. They blocked off every intersection for four levels, and in a three-dimensional street grid, that meant a lot of police speeders making sure that nobody wandered into the cordon area as well as stopping anyone trying to get out. Darman hoped they'd evacuated the immediate area. It really crimped his style when he had to worry about blowing up the neighbors as well. He's a Jedi, Niner said. Got to take precautions. I've never fought Jedi, Reed said. Is it as tough as they say? Darman doubted if Reed had fought at all. It wasn't the time to embarrass him by asking. They're definitely not invincible, Darman said. They make mistakes like everyone else. And they die like everyone else. He knew that better than anyone. 13. Mandalore's Beskar reserves far exceed its domestic needs. The population is four or five million a village by our standards. They earn revenue from the shipbuilding and equipment contracts we place with them. They have enough or to equip a moderate fleet of their own, limited, mind you, because they're a troublesome people, and that will keep them happy while we concentrate on the business of stockpiling Besker. A material that's effective against force users must never be sold to any other government. Of course, we'll need the cooperation of Mandalorian metalsmiths to produce the finished Besker, but we'll address that problem when we come to it. Churg Anaris Hedge, Deputy Head of Imperial Procurement. Imperial City, Lower Levels. The gunship dropped through ever narrower skylanes until it reached the nearest landing platform to the cordon. It was a few meters longer and wider than the average police vessel but Niner doubted that the escaped Jedi had factored that in when he went to ground down here. The squad jumped out of the lardy and jogged for the knot of police officers taking cover behind their speeders at the perimeter of the cordon. Niner glanced back at the ship to see the pilot tap the chrono on his forearm plate with an exaggerated gesture. The meter's running. Niner didn't know him, but at least he had a sense of humor. A job like this could take minutes or hours. Where is he? Niner asked, looking for a name tab on the nearest cop's uniform, Anskow. He didn't know any of these cops. They weren't any of Jala Obrim's officers. The blue strip on their badges showed they were part-time community cops, usually drafted for crowd control at big events or traffic duties. Have you got remote surveillance operating? Anskow pointed at a shuttered cantina. It was flanked by a grocery store and a lingerie boutique whose window contained items that Niner decided didn't look sensible or comfortable. You'll laugh, he said, but for all the holocams in the city, we don't have anything watching down here. Which is where most of the crime is. Funny how they're spending like crazy on snoop devices for up top, but not here. I think the Emperor's more interested in a different kind of crime. Got a floor plan yet? Anskow took out his data pad. Best we can do is this one from the planning authority, but it's old. There might be some changes to non-structural walls. Niner took the data pad from him and transmitted the plan to the squad's HUDs. Okay, that looks pretty straightforward. We don't think he's got hostages. Place doesn't open until the evening. The cook's normally first in. Jedi don't take hostages. Niner glanced at the cops standing behind the protection of their vehicles, some with blaster rifles resting on the roofs. I've never known them to indulge in a shootout, either, but they're running for their lives now. What have we got, then? What do you mean? Padawan Knight Master? Any clues? Padawans wear a skinny braid, but they'll have cut those off unless they're idiots. Just a guy maybe 25, 30. 
The lightsaber was about all we had time to notice, on account of it taking one of my guy's hands off. Probably not a Padawan then. Does it matter? They're all dangerous, right? It matters to us. Niner glanced at Darman, who'd gone back to the walkway above and was strolling along to get a better look. Niner could see the POV icon in his HUD. Orders. Padawans, we take alive. Masters, we shoot on sight. Knights, depends, but probably lethal force, too. Anskow gave him a long, dubious look. Okay. We've evacuated the stores and the residential units up to this line. Area at the back of the cantina is industrial, repair shop, fuel storage, and so on. We shut that off, too. We'll try not to hit it. They make a mess when they blow. Anskow gave Niner a look that said he didn't know if he was joking or not, then motioned his officers to take up position. Darman, now accompanied by Reed, stabbed his finger down at the entrance to the cantina. He's not going anywhere unless he can fit down a sewage pipe, Darman said. He's stuck in there. He'll have a reason, of course. Jedi could get out of some pretty tight corners. Niner took nothing for granted and reminded himself what had happened to Bry. Even the most high-minded Jedi was likely to fight dirty when the entire sect was being exterminated. It looked like a dumb place to get cornered. It had to be a setup, just like last time. No unnecessary risks, Vod, Niner said. I want everyone coming back with their heads still attached. And he knows we're all out here waiting, so... He upped the volume on his helmet's external speaker to loud hailer level. Jedi. This is the Imperial Armed Forces. It just didn't sound right, not yet. Come out, lay your weapons on the ground, hands above your head. He kept an eye on the POV icons on Darman's position. Last chance, or we come in. Predictably, there was no response. Darman took out a roll of detonite tape from his belt pouch and tossed it in his hand. Knock, knock. Okay, stick a charge on the front doors. Niner signaled to Reed and Ennin. Ennin, on my signal, stick a flashbang through the lower floor window. Reed, you place one through the roof light. Can you reach it from there? Yes, Sarge. Okay. It's going to be quick. Simultaneous doors, flashbangs, then in. Niner looked up for a moment. Above him, beyond the cordon ceiling, he could see the undersides of stationary speeders hovering for a better look. He was sure the operation had an audience, and whatever they did would be on GNN sooner or later. He needed to get this over and done with fast. He's too old for a Padawan. Niner moved closer, twenty meters from the doors. Shoot first, worry about Intel's recruitment needs later. What? Reed said. Never mind. Everybody in position. Niner watched Dar drop down from the walkway on his rappel line and hug the wall as he made his way to the cantina doors. It took him seconds to slap detonite on the weak spots and take cover. Niner checked the POV icons. Reed was lined up on the skylight in the cantina roof and Ennin was fixed on the big transparent steel window. Fired from the Dece attachment, the stun grenades would punch a hole in anything before exploding in a harmless but disabling ball of deafening, blinding light. Go! Niner said. Dar could always rig a spectacular detonation for rapid entry. He hadn't lost his touch. Boom. Niner ducked as the dead went off and sent the doors crashing in. They rushed into smoke, tactical lamps raking the unlit counter and reflecting off bottles and mirrors. Niner could hear boots clattering and shouts of, Clear! Then would splintered somewhere. 
he found himself face to face with Reed. He gestured left. Ennin appeared and pointed behind them to the kitchens. But they didn't get that far, because the familiar VZZZM of a lightsaber cut through every other sound and made them all turn at once. The mirror behind the bar was lit with soft blue light. Counter, Ennin said. Under the counter. He dived for the open end of the bar and opened fire. Niner was still waiting for the booby trap, the ambush, the feint. From his position, it looked as if everything was happening simultaneously, a figure rising from behind the counter, the white flashes of a D emptying its magazine, a blue shaft of energy that left an afterimage and tumbled to the floor. Enin kept on firing. It seemed like minutes before he stopped. It could only have been seconds. The silence was sudden and complete. That's for Bry, he said. He stepped over something, crunching on broken glass, then grunted. Niner braced, expecting him to trigger a device. That was the kind of stunt a smart operator would pull, a sacrificial act to take Imperial troops with them just as Camus had tried to do. Maybe the Jedi who'd been stranded here had been ordered to do maximum damage. It didn't sound very Jedi-like to Niner, but then neither did trying to overthrow Palpatine by violence, and they'd done that, too. But he's a Sith. Does that make it okay, or not? Can't detect any explosives, Ennin said, standing up again. Let's see who this Joker is. The noises sounded as if he was rifling through the guy's clothing. Less than three minutes from entry to finish, something to impress the locals. Imperial stormtroopers didn't mess around. Niner opened his comm link. Ansko? Building secure. We'll check for booby traps, just in case. Maybe we should have done that first. Reed peered over the counter. Did they leave just the dumb Jedi behind? Or are they all that useless? Ennin stood up, fanning out a sheaf of identichips one-handed. Stang, he said. He tossed the chips to Niner and strode out. Stang. What's up with him? Darman asked. Niner looked through the IDs. They were all taxi pilot licenses, each with the same image but with different names. He turned over the body and shone his lamp in the face. There was enough left for a positive ID. I think we just got a random thief, he said. Which explains why he didn't put up a fight. Probably all he could do was to switch on the lightsaber and wave it around. He searched for the hilt and found it in the carpet of shattered bottles. How could he get hold of it? Reed asked. Were you around for Order 66? I wasn't deployed then. It was chaos. Jedi cut down everywhere. Buildings on fire. It wouldn't take a criminal genius to grab a lightsaber from the debris, just an opportunist. Okay, job done, Darman said and walked out. Well done anyway, Reed. Anskal looked at the IDs and spent some time on the comm checking with someone. He even took fingerprints from the body. His embarrassed expression told Niner what information he was getting back from his control room. Well, he took a guy's hand off with that saber thing, he said at last. What were we supposed to think? Niner shrugged. Better safe than sorry. We won't bill you. It was an anticlimax, but it wasn't the first foul-up Niner had been involved in, and it wouldn't be the last. There'd be some questions about how the guy might have come by the lightsaber, and someone, not them, he was sure would be tasked to check the man's contacts just to make certain there was no real Jedi connection somewhere. 
Niner put it out of his head and climbed back into the LAT slash I. He'd file a report later. Lawful warning given. Suspect failed to surrender. Drew lightsaber. Neutralized by trooper IC 4447NN. What a dumb way to die. All for a stolen speeder and a dangerous souvenir. Idiot. Did he have a family? What a rotten pointless end for his folks to have to live with. It was just a speeder. A couple of months in jail, maybe. Not worth losing your life for. Some people just ran, even though it must have been obvious they wouldn't get away. The LAT slash I lifted off the platform and they headed back to barracks. You okay, Ennin? Niner asked. Ennin was sitting on the starboard side bench, arms folded tight across his chest, head tilted back so that his helmet rattled on the durasteel panel of the bulkhead. Yeah. Fine. He wasn't. Niner knew it. Darman took off his helmet and scratched his chin. Ennin, if that guy had really been a Jedi, it would have been a good take. Don't beat yourself up. Criffing moron, Ennin muttered. He was asking for it. What kind of carbon flush thinks it's a good idea to wave a lightsaber around at a time like this? A moron who wasn't carrying a blaster? Reed said. Darman turned on him. If you don't take a lightsaber seriously, Naviodi, he snarled, you're going to end up dead. You DCI Dar, Niner said. Let's all relax. Nothing we can do about it now. Niner kept an eye on Ennin's POV icon all the way back to base. It stayed fixed, as if he was staring at the deckhead, although that was no guide to where his eyes were directed or even if they were open. When the gunship landed, Ennin was the first man out, and he stalked off as if he had something pressing to attend to. Niner knew he'd have a tough job ahead of him to knit this squad together as tightly as he had Omega. He let Ennin go. The doors to the fresher slammed shut behind him. There, at least, a guy could have a few minutes of privacy. He'd come out when he was ready. Maybe Dar could take him out for that ale later. The open invitation to the old Coruscan Security Force Staff Club still stood for all Skirata squads, and it was as good a place as any. Let's hang around and wait for him, Darman said. So he knows we don't go off and leave a brother when he's in a mood. What's Udici? Reed frowned at the scratches gouged in his armor by the broken glass. I'm trying to keep up with your slang. Poor kid. It's Mandalorian, Niner said. It means take it easy. Calm down. Relax. Reed looked to Darman. Neviodi, he said. Buddy? Brother, Darman said. My brother. Or my sister come to that. Reed just gave him a puzzled look. Ennin's been a long time. Yes, he had. Niner walked up and down the corridor a couple of times. Nobody takes that long in the freshers. I hope he hasn't fallen in. I'll go see how he is. Darman walked in and called Ennin a couple of times but the doors closed before Niner heard any reply. He waited, watching Reed fussing over his armor. Before long, the kid would be only too happy to see damaged plastoid as battle honors. You'll never keep that pristine, Niner said helpfully. In fact, the more. Dap. The crack of a discharged blaster stopped him dead. The fresher doors muffled it but the sound was too loud and too distinctive to be anything else. Niner pushed through the doors before he thought about it. Darman was hammering on one of the stalls. Enin? Enin? 
Open the shabla door, will you? Niner tried to smash the locked door with his boot while Darman scrambled over the top of the partition. He froze as he looked down into the stall, gripping the top of the duraplast panel. Fearfeck. Is he breathing, Dar? Niner knew the answer. Darman had seen enough casualties. If he froze, it was because there was no point in doing anything else. Please, don't tell me he's done something stupid. Darman dropped back, saying nothing, and rammed his shoulder against the lock. This time it gave way. Enin would probably have felt he hadn't done anything stupid at all. For him, it was the right thing. The man sat there, staring sightless at the ceiling, helmet on the floor, no visible marks on his face but clearly dead. His DC-15 sidearm had fallen halfway under the stall partition. Reed, get the med droids, Niner called. Obvious or not, someone medically qualified had to pronounce him dead. Tell them to bring a gurney. Darman didn't say a thing. A suicide was unusual in the commando ranks. Niner couldn't recall another one, but then he wasn't sure he would have been told about it. He didn't know how often the meat cans decided they'd had enough, either. All he knew was that he'd failed one of his men, and that he'd never forgive himself for letting Enin struggle on without realizing how close to the edge he was. What tipped him? Capping a civvy? Or not capping a Jedi? More commandos started showing up. You couldn't discharge a weapon in the barracks without drawing attention. Beat it. Niner snapped. He's gone. Enin stopped himself, per Shabir. Now get back to whatever you were doing. It's not a criffin cabaret. Reed seemed uncertain whether he was in the get lost category or not, and hovered until Niner beckoned him back with a jerk of his thumb. Two med droids whirred into the freshers with a repulsor gurney and emerged minutes later with Enin's body covered by a sheet. Well, he's not miserable anymore, Niner said, not sure what was appropriate at a time like this. It's terrible, but at least it's over for him. I didn't know he was that far gone. Darman sounded numb. He stared at his hands. I was going to take him out and get him to talk about it all. Yeah, well, I don't think he was the talking type. Niner had to report the incident to Melissa now. What happened in these cases? He never dealt with a suicide before, and he couldn't even recall if there were any regs to cover it. At least they had a commanding officer who would make sure Enin got the funeral rite that he wanted, though. I should have sorted him out a lot sooner. Shab, I should have. Darman kept taking one of his gauntlets off and sliding it back on his hand again, over and over. He wasn't really paying attention to Niner. That's the last time, he said, that I ever put off doing something until later. There's never going to be a later. He picked up his helmet and made for the doors. Niner had thought Da was doing okay and surfacing from the worst of his despair, but anything could tip him over the edge again now. There were only so many times you could lose those close to you before you snapped. Even if Enin had been hard to get to know, he was still a squad brother. Dar, where are you going? Niner went after him. Hey, hang on. Darman slowed and turned. It's okay, Niviodi. I'm not going to top myself. I've got something to live for. He went to put on his helmet. And I'm going to call him the first chance I get. Kirimorat, Mandalore, ten hours after Zayis' arrival. Valve was back, and he was mad. Ordo watched the conversation between him and Calbear skid downhill without breaks. Valve's expression of smug good humor evaporated two steps down the cockpit ladder of Jilamar's shuttle, and Ordo was pretty sure the words Zayis turned up alive had something to do with it. Helamar and Aden carried on unloading the lab supplies as if they'd seen these fights before, which they had. 
The Skirata and Vav show had been a staple diversion during the off-duty hours on Camino. Are you out of your mind? Vav boomed. He never shouted. He was an ermine aristocrat, heir to Count Jessel before his father disowned him, and the gentry did not yell like common folk. They could be loudly disapproving, though. The entire homestead could hear the two veteran sergeants letting rip. What do we need Zay for? Do you understand the risks? You lunatic. You think I invited the Shabir to drop in for CAF and cakes? Skirata had no problem with yelling. He's here. I don't like that any more than you do. But he is, so deal with it until we solve the problem. Skirata stormed off. Ordo gave him a couple of minutes to cool from a rolling boil to a slow simmer, then went after him. Vav didn't dislike Zay as far as Ordo knew. He'd almost seemed to enjoy the verbal sparring necessary to get one over on the general, even knowing that Zay was aware he was being conned somehow. But there was a place for Jedi, and that was not Kiramorat. I agree. We all do. But we don't seem to be able to avoid them. Skirata leaned on the wall by the roba pen, throwing his three-sided knife into the thick Veshik gatepost a few meters away. One of the roba, an old boar with an impressive beard of reddish hair dangling from his multiple chins, stopped rooting in the mud with the others and stood on his hind legs with his front trotters on the wall to see what was going on. It's okay, Niviodi, Skirata said to the animal. He sent the blade thudding into the same spot on the post every time, and took three paces to retrieve it. It's not time for the butcher yet. Just venting steam. Vav will see sense. Ordo had an unnerving feeling that the robo was following the conversation. Look at it logically. Zay has as much to lose as we have by revealing our location. Skirata retrieved his blade again and flicked the sharp point with his thumb. More. And I'd see to that personally. Jane's right. There's always an advantage to be gained from these situations. Only out of necessity. I never wanted to see another Jedi as long as I lived. But I can't seem to get away from them. Skirata inhaled, held his breath, and let the knife fly again. Ordo often wondered what went through his mind when he did that. And if you think Vav's mad now, watch what happens when I tell him we're thinking of doing a deal with Altus. Skirata patted his arm and went back into the house, leaving Ordo leaning over the roba pen wall. The dilemma was painful. The general principle of putting an end to Jedi influence in the galaxy, or Jedi dominance, depending on how serious a threat Mandalorians considered them to be, was always based on anonymous Jedi or at least Jedi who were disliked. But faced with poor little scout, the venerable Kinaha, and a fairly pleasant man they knew well, putting an end to anything became brutally hard. That didn't mean Ordo wouldn't do it, of course. He just wasn't sure how badly he might feel about it afterward. But he'd been trained to kill dispassionately because threats had to be removed and he could see no real difference between a threat you didn't know and a threat with a familiar face. And what was known, the location of Kiramorat, couldn't be erased any other way, unless Juzik had more force tricks up his sleeve. Ordo realized he was now standing almost nose to nose with the roba boar. The animal looked up into his face and grunted. In that moment of eye contact, he felt a connection to the animal much the same as looking a human being in the eye, and wondered how he'd feel when he eventually came to eat it. Is that it? Is it just not knowing that makes killing okay? Ordo shook himself out of the mental debate, and went to see how unloading was progressing. C.O.V. and his brothers had volunteered to convert an outbuilding into what he called a bug farm for Yuthan and the four clones were puzzling over a plan sketched on a sheet of flimsy. Only a few months ago, Yuthan would have cheerfully unleashed a pathogen specifically designed to kill them, and Ordo, 
and all his brothers. Now she was treating them like favorite nephews. Yes, knowing did seem to make all the difference to some folk. Yuthan certainly seemed pleased with the hall of equipment and lab supplies, managing a smile whenever she pried open a crate. She might have been pleased to see Hilamar back, of course, and Ordo took heart from that. Everyone knew there was a burgeoning romance there, and nobody minded. Somehow, the sheer impersonality of her mission to wipe out clones took the sting out of it. The matter of mass slaughter was closed. She had her comeuppance before she even got around to her crime. Vav could come to terms with Jedi made safe by mutually assured destruction then. Some fights to the death could be stopped and turned around. Kalbert certainly seemed to have overcome his ingrained hatred by placing Scout and Kina Ha in a slot marked not really Jedi. Ordo wondered if it was ever possible to explain to an outsider, a Ruatai in the most literal sense, how deep an enmity could run. More than 4,000 years of wars, betrayals, and massacres, how could the two sides ever trust each other? It was as deeply embedded in both factions as the religious schism of Serassia, except there was a third side in the hostilities, and that was Sith. Sometimes they were lumped in with the Jedi as a variation on the Force user theme. Sometimes they were enemies, uncomfortable allies, or even employers of the Mandoade. Ordo doubted that many of the Grand Army's clone troopers could have seen it this way, but there was something timeless and inevitable about a Sith Lord using an army effectively made up of Mandalorians to attack the Jedi yet again. Only the date had changed. Oh, thank you! Yuthan bent over an open crate to examine the contents, then straightened up looking as if she'd been given a birthday present. Midge, you remembered? Ordo expected to see something exotic and wonderful in the crate. Instead, there were just packs of wood pulp sheets, the kind of absorbent material used in med centers. That's because I wrote it down, he said, smiling. And if you look in the cool pack... I always say the way to a woman's heart is with a lovely box of noxious pathogens. Nibelia and Rhinoceria virus samples. Knock yourself out document. Yuthan positively glowed. I'll find a home for them right away, she said, making the viruses sound like a bouquet in need of a vase. As soon as I've modified them, we can make a start on the cell cultures. Hilamar turned to Ordo. Where did Vav go? Is he still arguing with Cal? I'm hanging around in case they come to blows, Bordo said. Well, it's a bit of a shock. Fancy old Maze pulling a stunt like that. Can't wait to hear how he got Zay off the planet. I'm sure it'll be riveting, Bordo said. Although I'm not sure why he felt the need to dupe me into thinking he'd shot Zay. If I'd wanted the man dead, I'd have done it myself. Ordo didn't have to look hard for Vav and Kalber. He just followed the angry voices drifting on the air. Skirata seemed to have decided to lance the boil early and tell Vav the whole plan. Everyone else had found something pressing to occupy them, except Juzik, who looked ready to part the two of them if it came to blows. I'm going to do the deal, Skirata said. It's not like Altus is the kind of Jedi who's interested in political power and building big temples. Is he Bardike? Ordo ambled around the Karii as casually as he could. Juzik caught his eye and gave him an almost imperceptible shake of the head. Vav still looked livid, jaw muscles twitching. Murd, always a reliable indicator of its master's mood, was lying flat on the floor in absolute silence gaze darting from Vav to Skirata and back again. They say half of his followers aren't even Force-sensitives, Juzik said. And apparently thousands of Padawans trained at his academy, based on board a ship. If he was really into power, we'd know all about it by now. No wonder he got away, Skirata said. Keep moving. Smart Shabir. 
Are you taking any of this in? Vav snapped. Have you completely forgotten the last three years? The whole point of the war? Not Palpatine's war. Django's war. Vav turned and stabbed a finger in Ordo's direction. Why do you think he was created? To fill some emotional void in your sorry life? No. Django did it to put an end to the Jedi because we can't trust them. We've never been able to trust them. He banked everything on letting Dooku use his DNA to build the only army that had a chance of taking these Hakyun down. And now you're talking about making concessions to them. You make me sick. In case you hadn't noticed, Skirata said, suddenly unnaturally calm, the winning side doesn't like us much either. We're still under the heel of Force users. Just one with a red lightsaber. So why put us at risk? Why not just shoot Zay and have done with it? Kinaha, that I can understand. She's a lab specimen. Scout, part of the package. But Zay? Let him go, and he'll search out his pals and try to rebuild the old order. You don't need to do a deal with Altus to take them off your hands. You need a Verpine rifle and some guts. Okay, Mirsheb, you go and finish them off. An old woman and a child. Ori Jajic. Big man. You think I wouldn't? If you don't, then what are we going to do with them? We get this far. Vav spread his arms. We get this far. We finally get rid of the Jedi and its groveling lackeys. And what do you do? You help them survive and regroup. You of all people. One minute you hate their guts and see them as the enemy, the next you go soft on them. Oldest trick in the book. Put children and old folks and pitiful wrecks in the line of fire to shield a cowardly army. You know how we despise an enemy that tries to exploit that. It's not about that, Wallen. Vav made a sweeping gesture of disgust. If Fett were alive today, he'd spit on you, you know that? What did all those clones die for, Cal? So we could give the Jedi a second chance? Shebersian Veruatai. But Kisser. Traitor. Ordo waited for Skarada to swing a punch. He didn't. He just took it in silence. Vav turned and stalked off, snapping his fingers at Murd to follow him. Juzik shuffled his boots and looked embarrassed. I think everyone revises history under stress, Juzik said. He's forgotten that nobody knew Django had set this up until the purge happened. None of us had any idea what the clone army was really for, beyond something the Jedi Council didn't ask enough questions about. He's right though, isn't he? Skirata still stood staring down at the floor. I go out of my way to do the decent thing for Jedi. But I won't help my own Mandalore. You make it sound as if you had a plan that took account of all this, Bear, Bordo said. Your only plan was to save as many of us as you could. You never set out to smash the Jedi Order, Fed did. It's a separate issue. Sure it is, Skarada said. I'd better see what Zay's up to, just in case he's rebuilding the Shabla Jedi Temple here and Maze is helping him. He got halfway to the doors and turned. It's not them being Force-sensitive that gets to me. It's the organization. The way they trample us all in the process of keeping power. Juzik waited until Skarada was out of earshot and shrugged. I hate it when they're both right. Come on. Better stand by to stop him throttling Zay. Vav had been far closer to Django Fett than Skarada ever had. He understood, perhaps too late, but eventually, the depth of Fett's loathing of the Jedi. They'd cost Fett everything he held dear. The Death Watch had robbed him of more, a family and a surrogate father, 
but Fett still bided his time for years and saved his supreme act of revenge for the Jedi. That told Ordo everything. And you won, Django. Shame you didn't live to see it. Bardai K, you know Zayat, a different level from me, Ordo said. What's he likely to do if we let him go? Juzik took a long time to reply. Zayat's a pragmatist, he said at last. He thinks in terms of living beings with faces and names, not spiritual concepts. That's why Maze gets on with him. That doesn't answer my question. I know he wouldn't rush to turn us into Imperial Intelligence, but would he try to rebuild the Jedi Order along the old lines? I don't think he would, even if he could. This might upset you, but I'm prepared to execute him. Yes, it upsets me because I know him too well to turn my back on him, and yes, I understand completely. Ordo expected that from Juzik, honest, compassionate, but ultimately pragmatic, as pragmatic as Ordo himself, as pragmatic as the Jedi Order spending the lives of the clone army for an imagined greater good. We're all the same. Except Juzik and I say it out loud. We all decide that one life is worth less than another. If it really needs doing, Juzik said, I'll be the one to do it. Okay? That was typical Bardike. Always taking responsibility, almost to the point of martyrdom. The last thing we want Kiramura to become is the Jedi Remnant's worst kept secret, Bordo said. That's a security measure. But you see Vav's point. Ever cleared ground thorn weed? If you leave so much as a centimeter of root, it sprouts again. I think the lives of our clone brothers should buy more than a temporary reprieve. They wandered out into the lobby, one of the circular hubs of the complex from which passages sprouted like spokes of an eccentric wheel. The house was a chain of redoubts connected by surface corridors and underground tunnels, but the quaint charm was coincidental to its purpose. This was a bastion built to withstand a siege. Ordo never forgot that. I can't shut off my four senses any more than you can think stupid, Juzik said. And I get these premonitions. Jedi call them certainties in the Force. I don't accept fixed futures, but I've got the feeling that the Jedi will rebuild one day, just like the Sith have. The best we can do is to stay away from both factions for as long as we possibly can, and definitely never fight their wars for them again. That was the most sensible idea Ordo had heard all day. They found Zayi and Skirata watching the construction work for Yuthin's virus kitchen, no visible trace of any animosity between them, just two tired men of a certain age wishing things had turned out differently. Zayi didn't turn his head. He seemed focused on C.O.V. and Jind, who were sawing lengths of wood and cutting interlocking joints into them. These were men he'd commanded. Where did you learn carpentry? He asked. From a manual. Jind almost said sir but stopped himself. Same way that Levitt is learning to farm. So what are you building? C.O.V. glanced at Skirata for his cue. Storage, he said at last. Skirata took over the conversation. Doctor. Yuthin is reversing the clone's accelerated aging. She needs more lab space. There was no point telling Zay that Kirimorat was about to handle live pathogens. But once he settled down and started talking to Kinaha and Scout, even if that was when they were all long gone from Mandalore, he'd hear it all. The FG-36 virus, every detail that would be of interest to the Empire, and not in a healthy way. So the Imperial garrison confines itself to the Keldabe area? Zay asked. Far as I know, said Skirata. Doesn't that worry you? Not half as much as you do. Cal, I swear that. Zay stopped dead. He looked over his shoulder, then turned and stared toward the door behind him. Ordo wondered what had stopped him in his tracks until he saw Cad trot out 
and stand on the doorstep. There was no hiding him now. There was certainly no way of hiding him from a Jedi Master. Oh my, Say he said. I can feel who that is. I had no idea, oh poor child. Juzik spared Skirata the burden of answering. Maybe he could sense things in Zane now that nobody else could. Yes, Juzik said. That's Atain's son. Darman's son. Now do you understand the stakes a little better? Zay's eyes filled with tears and he squatted down to toddler height. Cat edged up to him, wary and grim-faced, then looked to Skirata for reassurance. Yes, Zay said. I do. Yuthan's laboratory, Kirimorat. So how are you going to test this? Scout asked. She looked very different in a laboratory coverall, gloved and booted like a technician with a cap over her hair. How do you know if it works or not? Yuthan opened the conservator door and took out the sealed virus samples. Jilamar's resourcefulness amazed her. She wondered where he got his medical and lab supplies, and how the vendor reacted to a Mandalorian in full armor showing up and presenting him with a shopping list like that. But a man who could steal an operating table from a med center wasn't easily daunted. Well, I need to infect a test subject with the modified Rhinoceria virus, and then expose them later to FG-36. Yuthan placed the samples in the biohaz safety cabinet and sealed it. But we need a human. So I'm planning to test it on myself. If I live, it works. It's too important to trust computer modeling or isolated cells. But then how would you know that both the FG-36 virus and the other thing are actually working? That's a good question. And that means you're going to have a deadly virus sitting in a bottle here. Not quite a bottle, but you got the deadly bit spot on. Cal and Midge must trust you a lot. Yuthan lined up the containers of enzymes and chemicals ready to modify the Rhinoceria's DNA, and thought that over. Yes, they obviously did. She hadn't actually thought of it in those terms, because, well, that was how she did the job. She handled dangerous pathogens. It was the first time that she'd stopped to think how much faith these people had placed in her not to kill them or wipe out their entire world. Given how she'd first met the clones, she felt uncomfortably guilty for a moment. My world's gone. They might think I've got nothing to lose. That I'm still determined to wipe out the clone army. The more she thought about it, the harder it got. Scout was a smart girl, learning fast, and remarkably dexterous. She followed her instructions to the letter, preparing the electrophoresis gel, sterilizing vials and containers, and lining up the various enzymes, reagents, and nutrient solutions in exactly the right place. She didn't fumble or drop things like so many technicians Yuthan had trained at the university. Yuthan hadn't noticed until now how precise and sure Jedi were in their movements, that extraordinary visual-spatial ability. But Scout's expression told her that she was less interested in the techniques of gene splicing and switching than in Yuthan herself. Would you use it? Scout glanced sideways at her. Knowing what it does, what it really means, would you use the FG virus yourself? If you'd asked me a few days ago, a few weeks ago. I never thought of myself as a monster, Yuthan said. I'm not. Am I? I'm no different from most beings, I think. But there's part of me that wonders if I have a blind spot about this. And then I think, does the weapon matter? Does the number of dead matter? If I shoot one enemy with a blaster or you cut down an enemy with your lightsaber, nobody would think we were monsters. How many more do we have to kill, and how, and why, before we cross that line into becoming monsters? Scout chewed her lip thoughtfully. That's one for a Jedi Master. 
We don't need Jedi Masters to define morality for us. I suppose I'm saying I don't know. Have you ever killed anyone? No. But you're armed. You'd use your lightsaber if threatened. Scouts seemed to be scanning Yuthan's face for proof of lack of monsterhood, and Yuthan found herself regretting that she'd not seen Scout grow up even though the girl was a stranger. It was the oddest feeling like having a daughter who'd only reappeared in your life after too long an absence. Like Cal and Rue. That must hurt him sometimes. And her. All that lost time that can never be recovered. I'd probably think I didn't have any other choice, Scout said at last. But it wouldn't be much different from what you did, thinking you had to kill in self-defense. It's just the feeling that it's different. Not a reason. Yuthan smiled at her. I enjoy our conversations. After nearly three years of having no company except Sokoth flies and third-rate doctors who thought I was a lunatic, you have no idea how good it feels to have a challenging conversation. So the Sokoth flies thought you were crazy, too? Yuthan had moments when the sheer weight of Jibad's destruction left her unable to think straight. She wasn't sure whether to hate herself for the other moments, the ones when she got on with life and even took pleasure in it. She let herself laugh anyway. I gave them names. Flies. What do they know? From the window, she could see the herd of Roba rooting on the edge of the woods while Murd watched them at a cautious distance. Rural life went on around her an existence that hadn't changed much in perhaps five thousand years. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, she said to herself. Pardon? Nothing. Doctor, do you think it's right to infect everyone on the planet with this? Scout asked. It's just a bug that spreads like any disease. Nobody can avoid it. They don't get a choice once it's set loose. Let's put it this way, Yuthan said. It's a lot more ethical than watching Palpatine use FG-36 on the population and knowing I could have saved them. Mama knows best. Isn't that always the way? But once everyone knows there's a countermeasure for the virus, Palpatine will simply use something else. It kept Mandalore a few steps ahead of the worst the Empire could do to it. If she couldn't bring down Palpatine, the next best thing was to look after a planet that could be a severe pain in his imperial backside. It's a bit like baking cakes. Scout looked up from the curved transparent steel cover of the small biohazard cabinet where the DNA samples would be replicated and broken up into their component genes. Wow. Can you hear that? Yuthan stopped shaking the transparent steel flask in her hand. The homestead's acoustics and the quiet of this remote place meant that sound carried, but all she could hear was the faint up-and-down buzzing of voices. It didn't sound like an argument. She'd heard plenty of those in the last few days. A female voice. Not Bessany or Jilka, not New York. Arla, maybe? Definitely not Lasima or Kinaha. Let's go and see once this batch is set to run, she said. Whatever it is, the antigen comes first. What's wrong? It's Arla. She's getting worse. Arla was living with horrific memories. Maybe the medication shut them out, or maybe it simply trapped her with them but left her unable to scream or flee. Trauma did different things to different minds. Skirata had been galvanized to survive, Ordo had learned to shut it away most of the time, and Arla simply couldn't handle it. There were no rules in psychology that Yuthan could follow, not like the more predictable and orderly world of microbiology. It bordered on shamanism. Helamar seemed to be getting more frustrated each day, almost blaming himself for not being able to fix the problem. He was a man with pain in his past, too. Had anyone in this place escaped some kind of tragedy or suffering? 
Yuthan didn't think so. It was a colony of the damaged and dispossessed. And me. Pain has found me, too. None of us is normal. But then, normal people never do anything of note, nothing magnificent or world-changing or on the knife edge of risk. I belong here. Okay, let's leave this batch and come back later, she said. She placed the flasks in the cabinet and set the heat cycle to run. Three hours. Check your chrono. Now let's go and be sociable. After years in solitary confinement, Yuthan found it hard to get used to a house full of the activity of thirty-odd Mandalorians, Jedi, clones, and assorted beings who'd thrown their lot in with them. Even back on Jibad, she never lived alongside more than three or four people. She wondered how Skarata kept track of them all. But then this was a small family by his standards. Somehow, he looked after and trained not only the Nulls but an entire company of more than a hundred commandos as well. So had he Lamar and Vav. She found that astonishing. Hilamar was standing in the corridor near Arla's room with Juzik and Jane, all three of them muttering as if things weren't going well. Hilamar held a hypospray in one hand, filling its reservoir from a plastoid vial. Anything I can do? Yuthan asked. Hilamar held up the hypo. Just debating whether to use this or not. Stop about the juice. I'm really not happy topping her up with Sabenadone, but she's doing herself damage now. Yuthan could hear the sound of thudding coming from inside the room. The doors were slightly open. It sounded as if someone was hammering plaster with a soft mallet. Is that her? Yeah. Hilamar took a breath and lowered his chin like a nerf ram about to charge, stealing himself for the fray. I like a shootout. Or a good old-fashioned fist fight. But overpowering ladies just doesn't sit right with me. Why don't I do it? Yuthan said. She was very conscious of scouts standing to one side, eyes closed. Juzik was doing the same. This force business unnerved her. She's much calmer around women. I don't look threatening. And I do know how to use a hypo without rupturing soft tissues. No. Juzik held out his hand, eyes still closed. You're going to think I'm a callous Shabir, but I say leave her for a while. Withdrawal's pretty unpleasant, I know, but there's something surfacing in her. It feels rational. Sharp-edged. Real. Scout, can you sense that? Yuthan fought an embarrassed urge to laugh. Scout, eyes screwed tightly shut, tilted her head back to concentrate. She was a skinny little thing, and Juzik was a small man alongside Jane and Hilamar. They looked like two starving waifs sniffing the aromas of someone else's dinner. But this was serious. The scientist in Yuthan rebelled at the idea of diagnosis by communing with the invisible. She wanted lab results, numbers, reagents that changed color. Yes, Scout said at last. It's like another presence, almost, but it's her. It's more solid. It feels to me like, oh, this is going to sound dumb, I know, but I'm feeling a big block of dark granite tearing through thick drapes. Mine's all sharp edges, black and white contrast, Juzik said. Yuthan wondered if Jedi were all synesthetic. Like something's forcing itself back into her conscious mind, her old self, and it's not what she wants to see. He opened his eyes. Suppressed trauma, obviously. I hate doing this to her but I feel it's better if we find out what it is. I think we know that, don't we? Yuthan said. The Death Watch slaughtered her family and kidnapped her. 
We need to be more specific than that to help her. Helamar looked riveted. He was still clutching the hypospray in the filling position. Has anyone ever done a brain scan on you? He asked. I'd give anything to see your brain activity while you're sensing this stuff. Agreed? Juzik said, lips set in a grim line. We let all this stuff come out. Might as well. Helamar put the cover back on the hypo. Because it's that or just keep her drug to her eyeballs until the day she dies. If you're going to try psychotherapy, this is the only way. She's not scared, Scout said, eyes still shut. What? Usually, she's scared. I could feel it. Not so much now. She's full of hate and guilt. Well, that fits her memory resurfacing, Helamar shrugged. Hate for the Death Watch, guilt that she survived and her folks didn't. No, that's not it. It's about her. She hates being herself. Yuthan watched, fascinated and horrified. Psychologists were all the same, even amateur ones like Jedi. It was all so nebulous. Well, I'm still going in to talk to her. Isn't Lasima around? She's taken Cad to visit Rav, Juzik said. With Bessany and Ordo. Until Kalba relaxes a bit about having the kid in the same space as Zay. Okay. Yuthan took off her lab tunic. She didn't want to look like a medical orderly. How hard can this be? At least I know what survivor's guilt feels like. Yuthan opened the doors wider and stepped into Arla's room. It was big and airy enough not to feel like a cell at the Valorum, with a pretty view of open countryside, so at least the poor woman wouldn't feel she'd swapped one prison for another. Arla had pushed her bed into one corner and was kneeling on it facing the wall. She was banging her fist on the wall, pounding her hand against the plaster. Yuthan edged around until she was at the head of the bed and could see better. Arla? It's me, Kale. She risked getting a little closer. She was a meter away, just out of range of a punch if Arla snapped. For a moment, she took a panicky glance at what might be in reach that Arla could use as a bludgeon but she was sure that a male wouldn't have been able to get this close. Arla, my dear, you must feel wretched. Would you like me to get you some CAF or sit with you? Yuthan thought Arla was using the heel of her fist. But she wasn't. Yuthan could see now that she was using the knuckles, the bones covered by paper-thin skin, and there was a wet patch of blood on the honey-colored wall. Two thin trails of blood ran down and vanished behind the bed. Arla, she said. Can you stop that for a minute so we can talk? Yuthan put her hand out, slowly, nervously, and just got a fingertip to Arla's shoulder when the woman wrenched away and scrambled to the other end of the bed. Don't touch me. Okay, I'm sorry. But your hand's a mess. That's got to be painful. I'm a doctor. Well, not a physician, but it's worth a try. Let me take a look. Don't. Arla stared at her hand for a second and then dug her nails hard into the inside of her opposite forearm. She drew blood. Yuthan could only stare in horror. I'm filth. I'm filth. Stay away from me. Nobody thinks you're filth, Arla. You don't know. I know that's got to hurt, and that you need a doctor to see to those wounds. You don't know what I am. You don't know what I've done. Arla started rocking, arms tied around her knees, head buried. The blood was now everywhere. 
I'll be okay in a minute. Leave me alone. You don't want to be near me. Get away. Yuthan had never been so scared in her life. She could handle privation, danger, any extreme that came her way, but watching someone else so devoured by despair and self-loathing was terrifying. She had no control over the situation. And she didn't know how to begin to make Arla Fett feel better. I know everything about the fabric of life. How cells work. What makes us what we are. What drives the living machine. But I have no idea how to reach out to another being in purgatory. But she was going to try. Nobody's judging you, Arla, Yuthan said kindly. How could she? She had no idea what had driven Arla to kill, only that she'd lost her family in the most horrific circumstances. Yuthan knew plenty of killers who never so much as lost their appetite for their next snack. And here was this unlucky woman, institutionalized for years, harming herself in the agony of guilt. Yuthan decided to say whatever might soothe her. I'm sure you had reason to kill, to defend yourself. Not that, Arla spat. Not them. They were nothing. I mean bad stuff. Disgusting stuff. Arla rocked herself a little longer, and then her breathing slowed, and she seemed to be calming down, or at least she'd exhausted herself. She shuffled into a cross-legged position, braced her elbows on her knees, and rested her head in her hands. It seemed as good a time as any to slip out. Yuthan backed away to the door, and Helamar peered in. Oh, Shab. Juzik craned his neck. Yuthan ushered them back a little way along the corridor and closed the doors. Jane was engrossed in something on his data pad. Well, I'm getting a better picture of why the Valorum docks kept her so heavily sedated, Helamar said. She doesn't even need anything sharp to self-harm. Midge, I don't know what she was talking about, but she blames herself for something. You said you wanted me to hack into the criminal justice database, Jang said, brandishing his pad. Well, here you go. Arlevet spelled right, three counts of murder, and at least six more thought to be down to her, but the court ruled there was insufficient evidence. Convicted, but transferred to a secure mental unit after serving a year or two in a normal prison. That's our girl. So is any of that of use to us? Juzik said. Ah, but it's who she whacked that makes it interesting. Assuming that the six they couldn't convict on are hers, then they don't look random. But they don't look logical, either. At least not serial killer logical, if you know what I mean. Helamar took the data pad from him and read, brow puckered in concentration. All male, all business owners, one tap calf, one haulage firm, one catering supplies, and hey, that name rings a bell. Vargalia. He was a bounty hunter, way back. The three men looked at one another. Yuthan had the feeling that they would have felt better if Arla had been the kind who only killed males with red hair, a consistent lunatic. Scout tugged at her sleeve. I just get the feeling of the most awful guilt, she said. The poor woman's tearing herself apart with guilt. And not over her victims, judging by what she said, Juzik muttered. So what can we do for her? Yuthan asked. Juzik looked guilty himself. We could hire a proper psychiatrist, except that we don't want any more visitors than we already have. It's getting like Galactic City Spaceport here. I say we let her surface some more, and see what we're dealing with. And then? Juzik shrugged. I have no idea. Me neither, said he Lamar. But if it's insoluble, we've always got the meds. Jane didn't say anything. 
Juzik had insisted on rescuing Arla, but nobody had imagined the form that her psychosis would take. It was naive and well-meaning, a spur-of-the-moment reaction that any compassionate being would have had about someone in torment. But now it looked as if Arla could never lead a normal life or return to Concord Dawn. It was my idea, Juzik said, and so she's my responsibility. One way or another, I'll get her out of this. Compassion was a burden. Yuthin realized she'd avoided it for most of her life and Juzik had made a vocation of it. She wondered which of them was the happier. 14. A betrothal token should be portable, capable of easy conversion into credits in case of emergency, and if worn, should not impede the wearer in combat. Earrings are out. So are long chains. Gems and rings should be in a rub-over setting and shallow enough to be worn under gauntlets. You really don't want to see what happens if you catch a ring in a moving cable or machine part. Purchasing advice for Mandalorian suitors from Sabin Drill, jeweler and artillery specialist. Koth Furis Space Station, Expansion Region. Darman knew better than to trust anyone as much as he trusted Skrata, but Roly Melissa was an all-right kind of officer. He asked how they wanted to play things now that Enon was gone. Yes, he said that. His very words. How do you want to play it, men? Can you handle a replacement for Enin yet, or would you rather operate as a three-man squad for a while? Nobody had ever done something that simple, that thoughtful for them before, except Kalbir, of course. Darman didn't want to replace Enin yet. It was hard enough bonding with Reed. If the squad had been ordered to, he'd have done it, of course. But at the moment it felt less painful to stick to the tight circle he knew, brothers who had lost a buddy in a particularly awful way. Niner said it would be easier to operate as a smaller squad while they had a wild card like Reed to train. Dar didn't think there was very much wild about Reed at all. He just absorbed everything at a frightening rate, and he knew more about them than they knew about him. Reed was just over a year old, and he'd spent nearly all that time in a gestation tank. What was there to know about him? You know what makes this business with Enin worse? Niner said, chin resting on folded arms as he watched the station's security monitors. Not just that he killed himself. It's that we didn't get on with him. He didn't like us, and I'm not sure we liked him. And I never thought I'd say this, but well, it feels even worse in some ways than losing a brother you loved. Darman tried to look as if he was more interested in the assorted views of the space station's main thoroughfares. He sat watching the bank of screens, running his thumbnail down his chin. It probably didn't fool Niner. Guilt, Darman said. Guilt eats you alive! Niner couldn't say it in front of Reed, but they both knew what Darman blamed himself for not doing. I don't think that would have stopped him, Dar. Oh, yes it would. If he'd known there was somewhere he could escape to and start his life over again, he wouldn't have stuck a blaster in his mouth and pulled the trigger. It wasn't just Bride dying that tipped him. It was not having anything else to make surviving worthwhile. What would have stopped him? Reed asked. Niner filled the gap without a blink. Us trying to understand his Corellian thing. I liked him, Reed said. He was pretty good to me. Is it that much of a problem, you guys all having different cultures? We weren't all different, Darman said. Most of us had Mandalorian sergeants, and that's what we grew up as. Only a quarter of commandos had erudic sergeants. Yeah, I know what that means. It wasn't Reed's fault that he wasn't Fi, or C.O.R.R., or Otten. Darman made a conscious effort to remember that. He tried to imagine what it was like to reach adulthood without any real contact with other beings, having everything you knew piped into your brain 
while you floated in some nutrient soup. That was Darman's definition of a nightmare. He couldn't believe that Reed could behave so normally under the circumstances. Tell us if you feel we're shutting you out, Niner said. We don't mean to. You were Omega Squad, weren't you? Yeah. Niner sat up a little. Something had caught his eye. The boys in boring black. That's what Delta called us. How do you feel about your buddies deserting and leaving you behind? Niner put his hand on Darman's arm in less time than it took Darman to inhale in preparation to give Reed an earful. Darman took the hint. We miss them, Darman said. But I'm going to talk to them soon, and to my son. He willed Reed not to say something insulting about them just in case he lost it with him. You always miss your brothers. All of them. Dar, I think that's our boy. Niner tapped his finger on the monitor screen, then jumped up and went into the adjoining control room. A crew of droids and three Celestan security officers were keeping an eye on the public areas of the station. See this guy? Follow him. Keep a cam on him at all times and we'll take the feed in our HUDs. Now lock down the departure gates and seal off sections A9 through A15. Emergency escape routes, too. I want that part of the station watertight. Airtight, said one of the guards. He ran a practiced eye over the crowds milling around on his screens. With that number of bodies moving about, safest thing is to run a routine fire evacuation. Bring down the internal bulkheads. It's triggered a dozen times a week by vessel emissions anyway. Way too sensitive. Thinks everything is a fire or a fuel leak. Whatever it takes. Who is this guy anyway? Boric Yeldo. A Jedi Knight. Stang, are we going to have any station left when you lot are done fighting? We promise not to breach the hull, Niner said. But it's going to mean getting the civvies out of the way first without alerting him. Those weren't their orders, not the ones from Palpatine's command, anyway. Once you let Jedi know they could hide behind civilians, that you wouldn't risk collateral damage, they'd exploit it. Darman knew that Palps was right for once. But Niner had always been uneasy about that kind of thing. All the civvies had to do was turn in Jedi and stand clear of them when ordered to do so. And when this job's done, I'm going to find a quiet corner before we head back to base and call Kiramorut. Somehow, being light years from Imperial City made that call feel safer. Darman veered between nerves and excitement as he planned what he was going to say and who he'd talk to. It pushed the capture of the Jedi into an insignificant second place. Okay, if we cut through the service passages, we'll end up the other side of Alpha 15, Niner said. Then we can move back through the sections as they shut the bulkhead behind us. Darman shoved Reed ahead of him as they followed Niner down the service area corridor, a dimly lit canyon of polished durasteel walls strung with cables, ducting, and pipes. Indicator lights and the glow of control panels provided the only illumination. As Darman jogged along, he could see the alarm system repeater panels flashing. The sensitive atmosphere monitors had detected particulates and ion emissions above a certain level thanks to intervention by the station's security team, and the automated system had shut down all traffic movements. It was routine, like setting off a domestic fire alarm by toasting bread meal sticks a bit too long. Aren't the civvies going to rush into another sector and take Yelgo along with them? Reed asked. All we need do is corner him so he doesn't end up in the service ducts, Niner said. Don't worry. Keep an eye on him in your HUD feed. You can run and watch that at the same time, can't you? I'm working on it, 
Reed said. It took them minutes to run through the service area of the station and emerge into Section A-15. The schematic said it was a passage, but Darman found himself in a wide, brightly lit plaza flanked by stores, tax-exempt boutiques, and eateries. Kothfuras was a popular stopover for passenger vessels as well as freighters. He could tell which beings were regular visitors and which weren't by the level of anxiety, as the public address system told them to evacuate the section in an orderly manner. The pilots and stevedores in scruffy coveralls ambled along, munching snacks and slurping CAF, and the tourists, regardless of species, all seemed to be trotting, not wanting to look panicked. A fire on a space station was as bad as things got. He couldn't blame them for being worried. Nobody seemed to take any notice of three black-armored commandos. Maybe the civvies just saw them as more folks in uniform, part of the fire control team. It was hard to tell. Okay, find him, Niner said. Fan out. Darman kept one eye on the HUD feed from the security cam, trying to work out where he was in relation to the shop fronts that Yelgo was passing. The Jedi, maybe twenty, human, with a distinctive break in his nose and a scattering of freckles, was walking at a brisk pace like everyone else, not looking over his shoulder. He didn't need to, after all. He could sense his surroundings. Isn't his sense of danger going to kick in? Reed said, keeping up with Darman. Sometimes they can't pick out one source of danger from another, like on a battlefield. But there's no real danger here. Yeah, but the civvies don't know that, and I bet they're generating enough fear or whatever it is he picks up on to put him off his game. Darman could see individuals pausing to try emergency doors and finding them locked. He was coming up to a crossroads in the station where one passage crossed another like a street. The curved shape of the space station, a ring rotating around a central gravity core, like a giant fiber reel, created a weird horizon. It made Darman feel as if he were constantly running down a hill, and he could see farther than he would have been able to on the flat. In his HUD image, he saw Yelgo pause at one of the departure areas but turn away when he found it shuttered. He was a hundred meters from him, maybe less. Niner picked it up before Darman could. Tap calf, he said. Turn right at the intersection, follow the overhead sign for Departures Green 6, and look for the Cheery Traveler franchise. That's where he is. The crowd was walking briskly toward the A5 bulkhead, which would seal behind them while the fire was contained, or so they thought. It wasn't going to open. Shops were pulling down their shutters, staff filing out with irritated expressions that said they did this way too often and would have to work late to make up for lost time. Darman slowed to a fast walk so that he didn't catch Yelgo's eye. The evacuating crowd were all facing the same way now. They knew where they were going. Darman, lost in the sea of bodies, realized he had lost Yelgo but he had to be close. Come on, Niner said. Where's he gone? He knows. Reed appeared on Darman's far left, moving ahead and looking back into the approaching stream of civilians. He knows we're here. Come on, come on, come on. Yelgo couldn't get off the station, but he could cause a lot of strife while they hunted him. If only he'd turn around. If only. It was worth a try. Darman decided to give him a tap on the shoulder via the Force. If the Jedi's senses were on alert, then he should have been able to feel hostility this close, targeted hostility. Darman visualized Yelgo's face from the mug shots he'd memorized and the security cam images he'd seen, and concentrated on hate. It wasn't hard. He thought of Etain, and what she'd been robbed of, a future, a normal life, 
and imagined Yelgo being responsible for that. He thought of Geonosis, where the rest of his first squad and half the commandos deployed had been killed in the first few hours of fighting, because Jedi had never had to fight an infantry war before, and squandered lives through sheer ignorance and panic. I don't have to be reasonable. Or realistic. I just have to radiate hatred. Make it personal. Ugly, savage, and personal. It wouldn't get any more personal than what was about to happen to Boric Yelgo. You should be here. Darman didn't even know him. It didn't matter. Die, Jedi. Whoever you are. And a head turned. Just for a moment, someone ahead in the crowd looked back over his shoulder, and a moment was all Dharma needed. The nose, the freckles, him, it was him, and if Dharma hadn't been wearing a helmet, they would have made eye contact for a split second. Got him! Dharma charged through the crowd. It was better to knock folks aside and give them a fright and maybe a bruise than let them get in the way of blasters. Reed, you got him? I see him. Got him, Niner said. Suddenly his voice boomed from his helmet's loudspeaker. Armed Imperial forces. Get down. Everybody down. Predictably, almost everyone froze and dropped. Most folks here had just lived through a shooting war. They knew what down meant. It gave the commandos a second or two as Yelgo bolted and everyone else dithered, not knowing where to go next. In those few moments, the crowd, like a flock of birds, like a shoal of shangifins, reacted as one animal, saw the moving threat, and then moved away as if they'd taken an instant vote on the best place not to be when the shooting started. Darman, Niner, and Reed ran into the gap. Most of the cities were behind them. Yelgo was in front. And the only exit he could reach was now being cut off by the safety bulkhead, dropping from the deckhead like a guillotine. In the Holovids, the hero always managed to skid under the thing in the nick of time and escape, but that was just fiction, and this was reality. The Jedi didn't make it. He came up a couple of meters short, and turned to face the commandos, eyes scanning for a way out. Jedi were pretty good. But they weren't that good. Ever seen an act hurting nerfs? Niner said. Well, it's just like this. The squad had separated Yelgo from the flock, Ax style. His chances of getting off the station were slim. For most beings it would have been zero, but this was a Jedi, and Darman took nothing for granted. Niner aimed his dice at Yelgo. I don't suppose you're going to surrender. Would you? Yelgo asked, reaching for his lightsaber. He was a knight, low enough on the league table to be a dead or alive job. Imperial intel wanted Jedi they could turn, their word for an agent they could threaten, torture, brainwash, or, just sometimes persuade by rational argument to come over to their side. Probably not, Darman said. So, the easy way or the hard way, Jedi? It was too much to hope that Yelgo would fall on his lightsaber or accept a quick end with a round from Adis. Yelgo looked at Reed for a moment, as if he'd identified him as the squad's weak link. You could walk away from this, you know. Not this time, Darman said, and opened fire. Yelgo batted away the stream of bolts with his lightsaber and spun to deflect Niner's shot. Then he took a run at the side wall. As soon as his boot hit it, he flipped himself over in a back somersault, dodging Reed as he moved in for a point-blank shot and landed ten meters away as only a force user could. Reed spun around, firing. And that was probably what Yelgo wanted, to make them empty their magazines. 
The commandos had 20 seconds continuous fire, and then they had to reload. So if Yelgo timed it right, he could grab the seconds he needed to leap over them, force rip a door open, and vanish into the bowels of the station. But Reed paused and just held his aim. Darman thought it was a stoppage that the Ds had frozen on him. But Reed didn't look troubled. He was definitely just aiming. Darman and Niner took up the slack, too stunned to yell at him for a moment. He's too green. He's going to get killed. Idiot. Stupid kid. Reed! Niner barked. Move! Reed darted behind Yeldo. And just as Niner ran out of ammo, Reed opened fire. The kid wasn't so dumb after all. Yelgo was still forced to fend off two streams of fire. If he'd been an ordinary being, someone would have got a shot past him sooner or later and brought him down. But he was a Jedi. He could spin and bat away bolts with the accuracy of a sling ball practice droid. This firefight was like finishing off a dying Keller buck, knowing that its horns could still rip you open if you got too close. Maybe we should have brought a fourth man after all. The dap-dap-dap of rapid fire from three Deces sent the city screaming for cover. The sealed-off corridor was all white-hot staccato light, noise, and the flashing green beam of the lightsaber leaving afterimages in a blurred wake behind it. Ricochets from the lightsaber spat everywhere, searing the walls and scorching black patches on the synth marble floor. He could leap over us, try to rip out a side door. No problem. But then he'll be deep in a crowd of cities. Is he going to bank on us not shooting? The crowd at Darman's back, trapped by the other emergency bulkhead at the far end of the shopping arcade, could only watch and scream. Shab, they didn't stop. Darman hoped they stayed put and didn't run, because the only place they could go was back into the squad's arc of fire. Yelgo was edging away a step at a time toward the transparent steel wall of a snack bar. This had to be a trick. He was going to pull something out of the bag. Darman reloaded, snapping a clip out and in again in seconds. He tried to anticipate what Yelgo would try next. He saw the Jedi's left arm go out to the side as if he was holding something back. Then Reed reloaded and Niner ran across to the far wall firing as he went. Grenade round? Risky. Too confined. Reed got his clip back in. Darman had one eye on the transparent steel wall, one huge transparent sheet decorated on the inside with a glittering green foil logo from floor to ceiling. Reed moved closer, taking out his sidearm and firing the deece one-handed. Nobody could say those sparty instant jobs didn't have guts. Darman saw Yelgo close his eyes, still fending off shots with the lightsaber. The transparent steel wall started to shiver, then vibrate. Darman could guess what was coming next. He'd seen Juzik bring down whole buildings with the force. Oh, Shab, transparent steel. Seven meters by four meters, two and a half kilos per square meter per millimeter thickness, that's. Nearly two tons of razor-sharp shards were about to hit Darman at explosive velocity, force smashed, force channeled into a tidal wave that would miss the crowd but slice through the squad. And Yelgo. Yeah, he's dead too, but he doesn't care now. Dar, read! Niner yelled. Down! Reed suddenly swung his aim a meter above Yelgo's head and emptied his clip into the bulging transparent steel. Maybe it was the enormous stresses the sheet was now straining under. Maybe Reed was a genius at calculating weak points. Either way, the wall shattered and fell, raining glittering fragments like an avalanche of diamonds instead of blowing outward toward them. Yelgo lost concentration at the premature collapse of the wall. 
Reed was on him in a heartbeat. He rammed into him, inside the sweep of the lightsaber. His fist punched down and in. The moment seemed to drag on forever, but it was a blink, a second, and Yelgo was on his knees, staring at the dark blood welling from his tunic as Reed staggered back a pace and then fired twice into the Jedi's head. And it was all over, done and dusted. The silence was one communal gasp. Then it broke, and there was more screaming. No, firefights never ended like that in the Holovids. Cities were always shocked to discover that. Read, Darman said. Read, Niviodi, I'll never say a bad word about you instant troopers ever again. That was Orikandosii. The emergency bulkheads lifted, and stationed security guards appeared to usher the civilians away. Reed scuffed his boot on the ground, trying to get rid of broken transparisteel that had embedded itself in the tread. I take it that means I did good, he said. Shabla brilliant kid. Darman felt suddenly old, as old as Calbear and just as responsible for a young commando. You can stay. The security chief, a tubby Celestin, crunched across the carpet of fragments and surveyed the damage. Could have been worse, I suppose. Nobody else hurt. Charge it to the Emperor's account, Darman said. He went over to Yelgo's body and picked the lightsaber out of the debris. Yeah, some things were worse than being dead. He couldn't imagine what Palps did to Jedi he caught, and that scared him, because Darman had seen enough in the war to imagine more than was good for his peace of mind. Right call, Yelgo. Darman handed the lightsaber to Reed. Don't cut yourself, he said. If you were a Mandoad, you'd wear that on your belt to show how Oribiscaric you were. I can work that one out too, Reed said, admiring the weapon. Darman thought it would be a nice touch if Melissa let the kid keep it and wear it. Inspirational for everyone. He's doing okay for a one-year-old. Niner? I'm just sloping off for a while. Back in 15. Niner knew what he planned to do. And out here, nobody was watching the chrono or wondering where the squad was. In your own time, Niner said, and walked off with Reed. We'll be in the security office drinking their CAF. Darman strolled along watching the stores and booths reopening now that the emergency was over, looking for a quiet spot. Eventually he found a janitorial closet and bypassed the lock. In the sealed environment of his suit, it didn't actually matter where he made calm calls, but he felt self-conscious and needed to hide. What do I say to him? Cad was a baby. He just needed to hear his dad's voice. Was it the middle of the night at Kirimorat? Too bad. If Darman woke everyone, they'd understand. He spent a few moments calming himself with deep breathing before finally selecting the Null's secure channel on his HUD with a couple of blinks. Jane, or that droid buddy of his, knows what he's doing. This calm can't be traced. There was no flashing icon to indicate the status of the calm link, another hallmark of Jane's caution. Anyone casually picking up the helmet wouldn't see anything different from the standard issue. Darman waited. Eventually, he heard a pop of static and a voice he recognized. Dar, that had better be you. Ordo? Did I wake you up? Not exactly. Where are you? Kothfuris Station. Just caught a Jedi. Ordo didn't answer for a moment. Which one? Boric Yeldo. Hey, can I talk to Cad? To Fi? Any of the Vode? How long have you got? Fifteen minutes or so. Wait one. Ordo sounded as if he moved away from a mic 
all scuffing noises and the occasional distant thump. Darman found himself drumming his fingers on his thigh plate. Eventually, someone came back and picked up the comm link with a loud scraping noise. Dar? How are you, Viodeke? It's me, it's Fi. Fi sounded different. The last time Darman had seen him, he was starting to come out of a deep coma. It didn't matter. This was his brother. Shab, he missed him. He felt his eyes sting with tears. Fi, it's good to hear you. It's going to be all right, Dar. When you come home, you'll see. Fi gulped in a breath. I'm sorry about Etain. I don't know what else to say. I'm so sorry. Another voice interrupted. Dar! Stop slacking, you lazy Shabir, and come home. The Roba need mucking out. It was Kor. How are you doing? I miss you guys. Come on, where's Otten? He's getting Cat up to talk to you. What's he like? Is he going fast? Is he... Dar, this is Otten. Here's your son. He wants to say a few words. Darman heard Otten whispering. Cat IK, that's Dada. He's talking to you from a long way away. Say hi to Bear. Darman shut his eyes to concentrate, trying to imagine what his son looked like now. When he heard his voice, it almost stopped him breathing. Boo. I want Boo. Cad was still getting to grips with Bear. Where's Boo? I'm here, son, Darman whispered. He wasn't sure how much a toddler could understand. He realized how little he knew about non-clone kids. Dad, I loves you. I'll come home as soon as I can. There was a long silence. Auden sounded as if he was encouraging Cad to go on, but getting nowhere. I think he's gone all shy, Auden said. But he knows it's you. He's grinning from ear to ear. When are you coming back, Dar? Don't wait too long. Things to do first. Yuthin's working on the aging thing, Fi said. You'll never believe it, but we've got a thousand-year-old Iowa Bait Jedi here, and the doc's working out how they engineered her. And guess who showed up the other day? Zay. That's right. Maze didn't cap him after all. Darman felt his scalp prickle with an awful fear. He heard the word Zay and didn't care who was alive or what Yuthan was doing, because his brain stalled at the word Jedi. Jedi. Jedi at Kirimorut. No. No, no, no. This is a joke, right? Darman said. Jedi, living under the same roof as my kid? Tell me it's a joke. Fi seemed to realize he'd said too much. No, Dar, it's true. But it's okay. Calbir's keeping an eye on everything. It's all going to be all right. Darman couldn't concentrate on the conversation. All he could think was that Kirimorut was full of Jedi, and it was the place where Cad was supposed to be safe from them. He could feel his pulse hammering in his throat. How could Skirata let them in? What was he thinking? Dar? Dar, are you still there? I'm here, he said, numb and shocked. He wanted to tell them to get Juzik, but he couldn't stand to sit here a moment longer, helpless and scared, a galaxy away from his son. I've got to go. Tell Juzik to keep Kat safe. Make him swear it. Tell him that if the Jedi take my boy, I'll come after him. Tell him. Dar, it's okay. It's not like that. Tell him. Dar? I'll call back later. He shut the calm channel without waiting for a reply, and sat shaking, 
hands braced on his knees. Jedi in his haven, with his son. Jedi. He wasn't going to take that. He had to calm down, think things over, and come up with a new plan. There was no point fighting the war against Force users at Melissa's side if the Jedi Order had a foothold in his own home. Kirimorat Mandalore. Is he responding, Ord I.K.? Skirata asked. Is that thing working? New York thought Ordo was starting to look ragged from lack of sleep, but his patience with his father never failed. He handed over the comm link. It's working, he said. I've just raised Niner. Dar's taking it badly. Kelbear, there was never going to be a good way to tell him about the Jedi. Don't blame Fi. I'm not blaming Fi. I'm blaming me. Skirata paced around the carry one hand in his pocket, the other to his mouth, head down and staring at the floor. New York had never seen Skirata wilt under pressure. The more problems he had, the stronger he seemed. She wondered how he'd cope when things finally settled down and everyone lived a routine life here. He was going to miss his wars. But that's never going to happen. Is it? It's always going to be this way. New York, you don't have to stay up, he said. Get some rest. It's nearly two in the morning. I can't sleep now. How do you think I feel? I was supposed to bring Dar home. I should have told him. Again. I never leveled with him about Atane being pregnant with Cad. I let him hold that kid without telling him he was the father. I can't keep doing that to him, or he's never going to trust me to tell him so much as the time of day. The Jedi weren't a secret, Ordo said wearily. We just never got the chance to mention them. It's not like we chat to Dar and Niner all day. Look how long it took us to establish calm contact with them. And it's still risky. New York could hear the faint burble of hushed conversations elsewhere in the house. Bessany wandered into the room, bathrobe pulled tight around her. Even in a scruffy robe, hair uncombed, and no makeup, she looked effortlessly glamorous. Is this a making lots of CAF kind of crisis, or worse? She asked. Ordo moved up to make room for her on the padded bench. Dar's gone off in a huff. He found out the Jedi were here. That's no surprise. He's hunting them while they're here watching his son grow up. That has to hurt, especially with Atane gone. It was brutal and true. Bessany was a clear-headed woman who got to the point. But even in this outspoken, unapologetic society, nobody had ever said the obvious. Nobody had railed at New York for wanting to bring two Jedi here. And nobody had criticized Skirata for agreeing to it. New York felt this was one more problem she'd landed them with. I've put them all in danger. Even if Kina Ha is the key to solving the aging problem, is it worth this? Skirata stopped dead and straightened up. He had that rabid look in his eyes that said he had a plan. Okay, ideas. We can't go on collecting trouble. The immediate problem is reassuring Dar, Bordo said. Niner seems okay about it. Shocked, maybe, but not like Dar. But then he's not got a half-Jedi child to worry about. The bigger problem isn't going to go away as easily. You think reassuring Dar is easy? Anything that keeps cut away from Jedi or any other Force user will placate him. If he'd got his Shebs back here like he was told to, he wouldn't need to be worrying now. Skirata shook his head, eyes screwed up in self-disgust for a second. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Ordo gave New York his back-me-up look and steered the conversation back again. The Jedi are a time bomb. You know it. 
I should have quit when I was ahead with Yuthin, and not got greedy for Kinaha, too. Skirata put his hand on New York's shoulder. It felt comradely rather than romantic. Aiden's matchmaking efforts might have been corralling both of them into something that wasn't meant to be. So I get my just desserts for taking advantage of your good nature, freight jockey. New York tried to be objective. If these had been her sons, would she have done anything different? I can't claim you weren't honest about it. Can I? Well, it's bitten me in the shebs. It's going to cause strife in this clan, and it's my job to resolve it. The fact that I'm standing here debating about it instead of doing the obvious tells me that Vav's right. I don't have the Gedesi to stick to a hard line on Jedi. It was all talk. When it comes down to it, I'm too much of a moral coward to shoot them. Actually, New York said, I think that's moral courage. Skirata just looked at her, as if she'd made a terrible gaffe that everyone else could see and she couldn't. He shook his head. You don't get it, he said. Ordo cut off any explanation. Once Yuthan has whatever she needs from Kinaha, then the choices are to find somewhere to offload the Jedi, or to terminate them. He used the same word the Kaminoans had used for exterminating him and his brothers. Normally, he spoke like the soldier he was and said neutralized or slotted. New York wondered if he was consciously treating Kaminoans as they treated him, or if he'd been so inured to the lives being snuffed out for being inconvenient or falling short of imagined standards that he used it as casually as his creators. And if they remain alive, we need to be sure that they won't lead the Empire to us, willingly or otherwise. Skirata ran his hand down his face, clearly struggling with his options. New York suspected he wouldn't have been so torn if she hadn't been around. He'd have been hearing the same message from everyone. Just get rid of them. You don't owe them a thing. They'll be our downfall. Instead, he looked into her eyes and saw the dread that she'd hate him for taking the brutal but certain option. She wasn't even sure she'd hate him, though, and that scared her. Just asking them to keep their traps shut isn't enough, he said. And you can't make folks forget things to order. Yes, you can, Bessany said. Juzik can. What, that mind rub thing? He told me how he wiped some Trelex memory of being questioned by him and Scorch when you were trying to grab Ko's side before Delta got to her. Skirata snorted, amused. So he did. And that one sordid episode sums me up. I even deceived Vav's boys, all in a noble cause, of course. Just like Jedi. Ends justify means. Ordo's jaw clenched. Drop the guilt now and concentrate on solutions, bear. We were all willing participants in that mission. We're not kids. We make decisions for ourselves. He might have been trying to snap his father out of wallowing in guilt, or he might have meant it. New York could only see complete devotion in Ordo when it came to Skirata. But he could be pretty cutting when he put his mind to it. Sorry, son. Let's ask Juzik whether he can erase memories in other Jedi. And how? Bessany nodded and put her arm through Ordo's. I'm up for that. If I have a vote. Your life's on the line with ours, Bessike. Vote away. I say we aim to help our Jedi guests to forget Kiramorat and then get Altus to take them, Ordo said. Because if we can't, I'm going to take the decision out of your hands and do it myself. I love you, Beer, and I'd willingly give my life for you, but I won't risk it for a Jedi. Not even a kind one. It makes a mockery of everything we've been through. Ordo stood up to leave. Now Bess I.K. and I are going to get some sleep, and in the morning you'll talk to Dar and Niner and smooth them over. Okay? 
you're their father. They'll listen to you. Skirata stood staring at the floor for a while after Ordo had gone, lost, in thought. New York didn't want to leave him to stew alone. He's doing it to spare me getting my hands dirty, he said at last. I think he's doing it because he really wants the Jedi out of his life, Cal. Am I being a bigot? About Jedi, I mean. Well, you are a bigot, but you gave Juzik a chance. And you haven't shot Kina Ha or Scout yet. You left out Zay. And Zay. You feel sorry for him. Skirata didn't take the bait. He put his boots up on a chair and shut his eyes. Maybe. New York boiled a pot of water and started making CAF. Skirata played the knife-wielding thug to perfection, and it wasn't an act. His job was to kill people for payment. But there was still that intelligent, compassionate core that drew her to him. He was an extreme man living in an extreme world. She wasn't sure he'd had a chance to ever be anything else. He saves lives. He also takes them without a second thought. I have to live with that. Do you seriously think that the garrison isn't going to hear about you anyway, Shorty? She asks. You went into the cantina. They had our images on the wall, on the bounty hunter's job sheet. Skirata opened his eyes and reached for a cup of CAF. There's hearing, and then there's finding. New York watched him for a while, wondering how a little boy from a regular working-class Quadi family grew up into a gangster. He didn't seem to mind being watched. She found they could sit together in silence and not feel uneasy about it. A few pots of silent coffee later, Juzik wandered into the kitchen, followed by a worried-looking Zay. Skirata gave them both an appraising stare. New York didn't pick up any signs of animosity. If anything, he seemed baffled by the Jedi. I heard about Dar, Juzik said. Fi's mortified. It's not Fi's fault. Skirata gestured to the CAF pot. But we've got to clear this up. He raised his eyebrows at Zay. You heard too, I take it. Cal, I wish I knew why Darman thinks I'm a danger to his child. Well, apart from being on the Empire's most wanted list, not that we aren't all on it, he thinks you'll take Cad and turn him into a saber jockey, and Etain didn't want that. And neither does Dar. Say looked at Juzik in a where-did-I-go-wrong way. New York wondered how he coped with seeing his former underling go native without so much as a backward glance at his Jedi days. You really see us as baby stealers? Zay asked. You wouldn't like the answer, Skarada said. How about you and your clone sons? Didn't you take them before they were old enough to vote on it? That's different. I did what was best for those lads when everyone else treated them as disposable. New York winced. Skarada had spectacular double standards and the extraordinary thing was that they convinced her. But when she stood back, all she could see was how many qualities, and terrible flaws, Mandalorians had in common with Jedi. One day, she'd have a sensible conversation with him about it. Now wasn't the best time. Even Zay, who didn't strike her as the retiring type, didn't pursue the case. I'm going to find you, Kinaha, and scout a safe haven. Skarada said. It's a long way from here, and you're going to have to forget you ever saw this place. Poor Zay. Here he was, a man who'd held serious power and responsibility, reduced to a refugee and being bounced around like an unwanted stray. You know I'd never do anything to compromise your family's safety, Cal, he said. I know what I have to atone for, both as a Jedi and a man and I'd never seek to recruit Cat. I swear it. Skirata gave him a five-second stare, the sort that usually shook anyone down. I believe you, 
he said. But could you still keep your mouth shut after Palpatine's thugs had been working on you for a week or two? Zayi didn't answer. Very few could, Skarada said. And I can't bet the safety of this place on the chance that you're the exception. If Bard I.K. can erase your memories of being here, I'm going to ask a Jedi sect to take you in. Altus New York watched Zayi's shoulders stiffen. Altus? Don't go all doctrinal on me, Zay, Skarada said. You Jedi Order guys are all but extinct, so this isn't the time to tell me you wouldn't be seen dead in his temple. I wasn't. I just had no idea he'd survived, let alone that you knew him. I don't. But I will. Skarada turned to Juzik. You know how to find him, Bard I.K.A. And you, Zay, all I'm asking is that you saber jockeys learn and stay out of politics. Because if you don't, and I'm still alive to hold a knife, I'll personally find you and cut your throat. Skirata got up with slow care, wincing at stiff joints, and went outside. New York heard the fresher doors close. Zay turned to her as if she was the umpire, and he wanted her to tell him how the game was going. And he'd let us go, for all that. Zay said. He knows where Altus is, and he hasn't turned him in. New York could only shrug. And would that save us? There were no deals to strike with this empire. She was fiercely proud of Skarada at that moment. It wasn't about being kind to Jedi who'd almost become friends. She liked to think Skarada was ignoring his instincts and trying to do things differently, to break the cycle of revenge, even though history told him he was a fool to try. He probably knew that. And New York realized that nothing would change, and that if she lived long enough, she'd see the same old wheel turn. But Skirata was the first to put the blaster aside. It didn't matter if he failed. He'd done it. You're a good man, Shorty. I wasn't wrong about you. Django Fett wouldn't have agreed, but he was dead, and Skirata had a duty to the living. Missourian Outer Rim Juzik didn't need to check any hard data when he landed the aggressor starfighter. He was definitely in the right place. He didn't even have to concentrate or check his instruments. The place hummed with the force presence of a lot of Jedi. It's like walking into the temple again. He'd forgotten that feeling. Being away from the company of Jedi for so long, the sensation hit his senses afresh, and he was briefly disorientated by the sheer wealth of information in it. He shut his eyes and let it wash over him. If the feel of the temple had been serene, restrained, a plain gray kind of sensation, then this gathering felt like a patchwork, a vivid quilt, no two parts of it matching but somehow harmonious. Jin Altus's community, or a large proportion of them, was very close. The sensation was oddly comforting. Does this speak to me? Do I miss what I used to be? Juzik was constantly alert now for signs of backsliding. It worried him. Despite the fear any Jedi must have felt at that moment, the Altus sect seemed happy. Not serene, not purged of passions. Happy, actively happy, in the way of people with fully lived and sometimes turbulent lives. Bard I.K., have you nodded off? Fi demanded. Juzik opened his eyes. Just feeling the force. Who's who, where's where? And? They're here. Well, you did calm them first. That poor woman. Look, lady, no calm number stays secret from me forever. I hate myself for enjoying this sort of thing. You going to tell them their information was compromised? I ought to, but I won't. Calbert can put the frighteners on them. He's good at that. Fi put his helmet on, the red and gray one that had once belonged to Gez Hoken. Okay, let's do it. 
Five, do you think this is a good idea? Well, I like it better than killing old ladies. Even I would bait old ladies. And little girls. Killing kids is plain wrong, even if she is older than me. Oh, unless they open fire on me first. Then they're fair game. Juzik counted on his fingers. Yes, Scout had probably been born a year or two before Fi was hatched. He needed to remember that. It kept him focused on what Kirimorut was all about. This offloading of Jedi, this ducking and diving, that was a diversion, a sideshow. The main agenda was to give his brothers back their rightful time. He would grow old with them, not watch them fade fast and far too young. He secured the aggressor and stood surveying the area. It looked as rough as a bantha's backside. The low-rise buildings were huddled together like conspirators, stucco walls peeling and wherever there was a wall or a gully it was full of windblown garbage. He could smell raw sewage. Some of the walls had blaster damage, their skin coat of garishly painted plaster gouged out in places to reveal the ferrocrete blocks beneath. Most of the stores seemed to be cantinas. Speeders in various stages of decay or dismantlement dotted the streets. Not a place to take a lady, Fi said. Unless she's especially rough. Nothing that a little urban regeneration grant wouldn't fix. Or a turbo laser. From orbit. Okay, I know where we are now. Follow me. I still think it's ever so clever. What? Your homing instinct. It's like watching Murd track Boritz. Yeah, well, this Bort's going to be armed and he can use the force a lot better than I can, so let's not alarm him. You think the Besker Gam is a good idea? Too intimidating? Too dressy? Safer than the alternative, Nevi-OD. Juzik walked casually, surrendering to an instinct that made him want to turn his head in a specific direction as if trying to hear a faint sound. He tried to stay fully aware of every force sense that he used, unlearning every lesson they tried to teach him at the Jedi Academy about feeling rather than thinking. You have to challenge what you feel. You can't just feel things and act on them. If we thought a bit more and felt a bit less, the galaxy would never have ended up like this. Fi started laughing. It jerked Juzik out of his inner debate and for a foolish moment he thought Fi had picked up what he was thinking. It turned out that he was laughing at some kids who looking over the aggressor at a cautious distance. Aggressors were popular bounty hunters' ships, and seeing two Mandalorians swagger out of this one had probably guaranteed Fi and Juzik an uneventful visit. Juzik still wore his lightsaber on his belt. Nobody needed to know that it was his and that he hadn't killed a Jedi to get it. Would you ever go back to being a Jedi? Fi asked. I mean, if Altus is what they say he is, and it's all anything goes in egalitarian, would you think about it? No, I wouldn't. I'm Mandalorian now. Why does everyone keep asking? They're not. And I'm just checking. Why? Well, having your old boss around. They say that you can run into an old flame who once broke your heart and not understand what you ever saw in her, Juzik said. I think it's like that with me and the Order. Except I fell out of love with it over a couple of years, at least. So you met us on the rebound. The sooner Zay and the others left, the better. It raised unnecessary specters for Juzik. Okay, I'm an all-or-nothing type. Fodder for any cult. But you lot had the cool armor. They did a little backtracking and diversion just in case they were under surveillance, even though Juzik felt they weren't. Eventually they ended up on the banks of a canal that seemed to contain more rusting speeder parts, rubble, and dumped garbage than water. It could have called itself a very wet road. 
a rainbow film of oil gave it an incongruously iridescent beauty. A sudden feeling of Jedi, anxious, wary Jedi, hit Juzik like a punch in the chest. The old boatyard on the other side of the canal was Altus's choice for a neutral meeting place. That should have reassured him. Okay, I'll go first, Juzik said. You told him what we'd be wearing, right? Because the helmet tends to upset those of a nervous disposition. Not to mention the verpine piece. He'll know who we are. He can sense me by now. They picked their way across locked gates so overgrown with weeds that it would have taken a direct hit to open them. Juzik walked into the boat shed and looked around. It still seemed to be in use. There were two long, shallow wooden hulled boats up on blocks with half their varnish removed. Master Altus, you can come out now. Juzik waited, hands well away from his sides, trying to look as harmless as he could. Fi was trying too, but Fi was a big guy even now, and he still moved like a soldier despite his disability. Left, Fi said. Armed and unhappy looking. Juzik didn't take off his helmet. He and Fi had a good infrared image in the gloom of the shed, and there was no point being rash. The male human who walked slowly toward them was a force user all right, but there was something different in the impression he left in Juzik's mind. For a moment Juzik thought they'd been set up by a dark cider, but it wasn't that at all. And this man wasn't a Jedi. He was something else. He stood four meters in front of them, a square-built man in an ancient ankle-length coat with deep vents and leather shoulder panels that made him look like he'd stepped out of a costume drama. But the rifle he held on Juzik was absolutely real. Master Altus will see you now, he said stiffly. Follow me. Juzik didn't recognize the strong accent at all. He was starting to feel disoriented by not knowing things that he'd always taken for granted. Suddenly all the beings he'd sensed, a dozen males and females of various species, emerged from hiding places and stood watching. He didn't need to be told which one was Genaltus. He felt him before the eccentric master stepped forward and stared for a moment. Bard and Juzik, Altus said, breaking into a bemused grin. I've heard so much about you. Except for how the blazes you managed to track us down. Let me shake your hand, boy. Master Altus. Juzik's fingers were trapped in a handshake like a vice. This man was a legend, albeit one they didn't talk about much in the temple. A pleasure to meet you. So you're the man of conscience who ran away to join the Mandos and scared all the little Padawans, eh? If you think I can help you, I'll do my best, but you've probably noticed we're in a sticky spot ourselves at the moment. Juzik took off his helmet and nodded to Fi to do the same. He could be forgiven for a little theater. It would make the point so much better than an impassioned speech. This is my brother, he said. Fi Skirata. If anyone needed a poster boy for the clone army, Fi was the first choice. He was still charming, funny, and disarming. It was much easier to tug heartstrings with Fi for a prop than with Maze or Sol, who didn't look like they needed saving from anything and exuded resentment at the very thought of rescue. I bet everyone tells you that you've got a familiar face, young man, Alta said. Now I know they don't retire clone troopers, so let me guess, you're on the run as well. It was just a parking fine, Fi said. But you know how these things escalate. Ah, uh, you want to hide with us? You're very welcome. We're a mixed bunch. Jedi, other Force adepts, all sorts of sector rangers, a couple of fit nonconformists, and plenty of non-Force sensitives. We even have a renegade spy. No obligation beyond pulling your weight in the community. Actually, Juzik said, we'd like you to take three Jedi off our hands. Ah, uh, that's what you're running. 
No, we're running an escape and rehab network for clones, master. But we have Jedi who would be safer elsewhere, and we also need them to forget they know where we're based. For everyone's safety. We've really upset the Emperor. I mean at intel level. It's better that you don't know the detail. Altus tilted his head. Of course we'll take them. Are you going to try memory wiping them, though? That's risky. I know. Have you done it before? Yes. Juzik knew what was bothering Altus. Mind rubs were regarded as a dark side practice. But then allowing marriage and families was anathema to orthodox Jedi thinking, too, and Altus didn't seem to have any problem with that. It hadn't sent his sect rushing to the dark side. I erased a courier's memory of meeting me and a squad of clone commandos. For safety reasons. Ours. Altus just looked at him for a while. Let me know how you get on. Put it this way, Master. The alternative is to leave no witnesses. Do you understand me? And my father doesn't want to take that route. Father? It's a long story. A brown-haired woman a little older than Juzik, rather pretty, he thought, sidled up to Altus as if to interrupt. She looked and felt eager, half-smiling. These three Jedi, she said. Is one a human female called Atane? I met her at Nerif Station. She had a son. We talked about her joining us with her child and her partner. Did she mention me? I'm Callista Masana. Juzik was taken aback. He hadn't known Atane had approached the Alta sect at all. Did she say why she... He couldn't go on. Every force sensitive, and that boat shed could feel his distress. Callista caught his arm. What is it? Atane was killed, Juzik said. Realizing that she could have left and found a safer place, that if she'd gone with Altus, she'd probably be alive now, was almost too much to take. She's dead. Callista gulped in air the way people did when they were caught out by shocked tears. She composed herself quickly. What about her son? He's fine. We have him. His father, he's fine too. Look, if I can deliver these Jedi to you without anything in their memories to connect them to our base, will you take them? Absolutely, said Altus. May I know their names? Master Arligan Zay, a Padawan called Talisabeth and Wanda Esterhazy, and a Kaminoan Jedi Knight, Kina Ha. She's rather senior. A Kaminoan? Good grief, I thought that was a myth. She's about a thousand years old, we think. Altus blinked a couple of times, then laughed to himself. At last, someone I can grumble with about young whippersnappers and dreadful modern music. Are you sure? No, of course you are. How extraordinary. Juzik felt a flood of relief. He'd almost expected Altus to be too wary of a trap to cooperate, but he'd forgotten that he was dealing with Jedi, and one thing he could be sure of was that they felt his true intentions. He looked around at the group. Yes, it was a very mixed bag indeed, six different species, male and female, young and old. And he felt that some weren't Force-sensitive. The man with the ancient coat still perplexed him. So did a striking woman with flawless black skin that looked almost polished. She dissected Juzik with a glance, not unkind, simply thorough, as if she was used to making fast judgments, and went to speak to Fi. Do you know anyone in the 501st? She asked. Yes, ma'am. Really? Yes. I knew some very fine troopers from the Legion. I'm glad there's another life for them if they want it. We never close, ma'am. Open all hours. 
Remember that Imperial Intel is full of dark ciders and would be Sith, she said. So watch your back, soldier. It was looking a bit too mystic even when I worked for them. I'm Helena, by the way. I used to be a spook, but I'm all better now. I leave the intel stuff to my crazy brothers, Vi said. I just shoot things and feed the Nuna. Very wise, Helena said. How are we going to do this handover, then? It's not without risks. Neutral planet, Juzik said. We won't burden you with our location. Are you going to tell us how you found us? Probably not. It was Skarada's job to do the bargaining when necessary. Juzik had the feeling the problem would be stopping Altus from being too helpful and ending up on everyone's calm list. At least they had a resident spook to keep their paranoia fit and healthy. I'll stay in touch. When they're ready to leave, I'll calm you. Altus shook his hand again, and Fies. You sound like very interesting folks. I'd like to meet your father. He turned Juzik around by his shoulders. Now vanish. Because we will. You can't trust anyone here. Juzik resisted the urge to look back. Fi glanced over his shoulder just once as he walked, then faced forward again and whistled tunelessly under his breath. Nice lady, he said. Well, that's one problem solved. But Midge is going to miss Scout. So will Yuthin. Yeah, I know. I might be out of my depth with a memory wipe. You repair brains. How hard can it be? Might be easier with subjects who can consent and cooperate. It's that, or it's index for them. No pressure, then. Nah. Can I drive? Okay. Once we leave orbit. Juzik scattered the small knot of local kids with a tilt of his head and climbed into the aggressor's cockpit. They looked at him like he was the most oribuscaric gangster this side of hut space. If only they knew his self-doubt at that moment. He was going to have to wipe his old master's memory. It wasn't the same as healing injury. He wondered how much Say wanted to forget besides the coordinates of Kiramorat. Are you going to tell Kalbir that Atain had an invite to join Altus? Fi asked. Yeah, Juzik said. Somehow. Skarada had to be told. It was the kind of thing he'd want to know, even if it hurt. 15. It had never crossed my mind that these men felt persecuted by me, that they felt I was a threat and would take Darman's child. I was horrified. I was raised to believe I was a soldier for the light, defender of the oppressed, a writer of wrongs. But Skirata and Darman saw me as just a baby stealer, a monster who would drag Cat into a cult. And so did Attain, it seems. And that breaks my heart. Jedi Master Arligan Zay, confiding in Kinaha. Special Operations Barracks, 501st Legion Headquarters. Imperial City. As far as I'm concerned, said Melissa, leafing through the Koth Fuhrer's report, that's a result. Tidy job. Especially you, Reed. Good thinking. If Intel wants to up their departmental midichlorian count, they can do it some other way. One more Jedi off the list. And Melissa really did have a list. He'd had it neatly printed out on large flimsy poster that reminded Niner of a B.O. Ball League table, with colored lines showing which Jedi was linked to another and how. He got up from his chair, scanned the list of names, more of which were crossed out with a red line each week, and ran his marker stylus through Y.L.G.O. Boric. There really aren't that many left, he said. Look. Scattered ones and twos. Occasional groups of five or six. The only big trench left seems to be Jin Altus and an assortment of other fringe force user groups linked to him. 
makes sense. He was never part of the mainstream Jedi Order, so his people just weren't there when Order 66 was called. Never hung out with the Yoda faction. Never got into politics. Never worked for the government. Never led clone troops. Fought the Seps, yes, but only later in the war, and then on their own terms. So more of them survived. And they're nomadic, based on some ship. Niner quite liked the sound of Altus. He guessed that Darman didn't. As soon as Holy Roly had told that briefing that Altus let his followers marry and have families, Niner could imagine what was going on in Dar's head. It must have made him as bitter as Harren. It wasn't Altus's fault that the other Jedi band attachment, but he could see why Darman might blame them all for their dumb rules. Reed just studied the list on the wall, squinting slightly. Melissa stood in his way and got his attention. Reed, can you get me something, please? I need the details of the Besker extraction deal with Mandalore and the latest geological survey you can find for the sector. On it, sir. Reed trotted off. Melissa carried on talking generally about Jedi numbers, and then switched topics as soon as the office doors closed. It's not that I don't trust Reed, Melissa said. But he's all raw enthusiasm, and I need to know him better before I tell him everything that I tell you. Now, I want you to go after Altus. Niner wanted to check. Us or multiple squads, sir? You. I think we might be a bit outnumbered then. Not a frontal assault. Surveillance, intelligence gathering, and eventually we bring the whole lot down in one operation. It won't be an overnight job. It'll take months. Is he that important? Yes, I think he is. We've got more than enough commandos to deal with the other odds and ends. But Altus is the kind of leader that other Jedi might regroup around, not just his own dippy freethinkers. He's a potential threat now that almost all the other masters have gone. And he might be a charming chap, but the ones who flock to him will be the usual kind of Jedi, and before long they'll be back, running the galaxy from behind the scenes. It was a helmets off meeting, because Holy Roly preferred to make eye contact, but Niner, like most clones, liked to keep his helmet on because it gave him precious privacy. No officer could tell what was going on under that frozen mask. A guy could be mouthing obscenities, but as long as he kept his head still his commander would be none the wiser. It was a safety valve. And it was Niner's biting device, too. He hoped it was picking up some of this briefing for Ordo. He could see Darman's jaw muscle clenching and unclenching. Melissa probably could, too. Shab, as long as that was all Dar did, he was still seething because he'd found out the hard way that there were Jedi at Kiramorut. Instead of calming down, he was getting angrier and more agitated. Dar was always the laid-back one. Never lost it. So calm that we used to think he was asleep. We'll rely on our own intelligence, Melissa said. I'll get cover in place so that they don't start taking an interest in what we're doing. Right now, all they seem concerned about is recruiting force users. Fine. At least I'll know where they all are, come the glorious day. Darman still didn't say a word. Melissa wasn't a fool. He was a soldier soldier, and he was good at reading his troops. Is this a problem I can help you solve, Darman? He asked. Darman had to respond now. Niner willed him not to blurt out something he'd regret. No problem, sir. You're a smart man, Melissa said. That's what whoever bankrolled the army paid for really top-notch soldiers. So I don't think you ever switched that brain off. You know you've been used. You're mad about it. Maybe it's even personal, really personal. 
and that's fine. But the deal is that I level with you, and you level with me. I'm taking a big risk here. That's why I'm keeping this very small scale. Concealable. Deniable. Can I ask why it's personal for you then, sir? Melissa blinked a few times. You were right about Draman Kass, Darman. My family did come from there. It's the cesspit of the Outer Rim. It never had a government, just a cabal of Sith monks. The prophets of the dark side. He sat on the edge of his desk and folded his arms. Guys in black robes with black beards. Absolute power. Everything they predicted always came true, and if it didn't, they'd help it along. Death and destruction, usually. But there were never any Republic missions or Jedi armies to liberate us, because Draman Kos was erased from the star charts a long time ago. So we rotted. And somebody in the outside world must have known we were rotting to take us off the chart in the first place. It's what you do when a reactor blows, isn't it? Tough luck on the poor fools working there. Lock them in, and stop the contamination getting out. Melissa leaned forward a little and lowered his voice. Niner could see the pulse flickering in his throat. He definitely wasn't playing for effect. My father tried to get people to change the world themselves rather than wait for help that was never going to come. I was six when I watched him get killed. The prophets predicted he'd be a long time dying. They were right. They always were. Melusser seemed to shake himself out of the memory, and stood up with his back to Darman and Niner for a moment before smoothing the front of his tunic and sitting down behind his desk again. I'm sorry, sir, Niner said. This must be really hard for you. He had to ask. Ordo would want to know, but Niner needed to. Has this got anything to do with Imperial Intelligence? Melusser shuffled the files on his desk. They're all the same, he said softly. Whatever brand of can't they mumble, they're all about power. They're not on our side. And we have to do something about that. Niner found that he'd actually held his breath without realizing it. Darman was frozen. Melusser had issues, vast ones. He also had good reasons. Understood, sir, Darman said. Reed reappeared with three date pads, and the talk of force users stopped. Got it, sir. Reed handed them over, and Melissa tapped a few keys. You should have the documents and plans in your HUD systems now, he said. Familiarize yourself with them. Every mention of Mandalore now nodded Niner's gut. It was all getting too close to home in every sense. But that was exactly why he'd stayed. And the objective, sir? Melissa looked up without raising his chin. Good stuff, Besker. Never tackle a Jedi without it. Now get some lunch. Niner had no idea what he actually meant, whether he just sent Reed on an errand for any old thing and Besker mining was still fresh in his mind, or whether he was introducing them to yet another angle in his personal war on Force users. Niner needed to check what Ordo or Jane had picked up via his helmet link, so he steered Darman toward the quartermaster's store. Reed, go grab us a quiet table, will you? He said. I'm going to the stores. Won't be long. Reed never questioned why Dar and Niner seemed joined at the hip. He was the new guy. Niner longed to have a tight squad again, where everyone knew everything about their brothers and they didn't have to think before they spoke. He wanted to bring Reed into that circle of trust, but Melissa was right. He had some way to go yet. Niner and Dar slipped into a corridor and put on their helmets. They could both hear what was going on when they were connected to the Kiramorat link now. Niner felt better for that. Ordo? 
Jane? Niner said. Did you get that? There was a long breath. It sounded like Jane. Wow. Yes, it was. Holy Roly makes Calbert look like the Jedi Appreciation Society. And that whole Sith thing. No wonder he loves his job. But you got it all, right? I'm going to transmit the Mandalore mining data, too, in case there's something you don't have. Great. Just a word, though. What? Best to find a way of stalling the boss on Altus. Sorry? Avoid Altus. Leave him be until we tell you it's okay. Why? Because, Jane sighed, we need him for the time being. We've done a deal with him. It'd be very awkward if you crashed in and found him now. Niner was still struggling to understand that news when Darman lit up like a flare. What, is this another Jedi you've chummed up with now? Which Shabla side are you on, Jane? It's business. You want Zay and the others out of Kirimura, don't you? Don't patronize me. I'm going to get back one day and find Cad gone and a thank you note from the Jedi saying it was all for his own good. What the shab is wrong with you people? Why are you helping them after all that happened to us? Niner put a restraining hand on his arm. Steady, Dar. UDCI. No, you butt out of this, Niner. Dar shook him off. I'm not going to take this. I'm fed up with Jedi always sticking there or in. Their history. It's not our job to save their Shebs. You're all way too cozy with them. Dar, shut it. I know you're upset, but... Ah, uh, forget it. Forget it. Darman turned around and stalked away, pulling his helmet off. He'd calm down. He always did. Niner was all for a deal with this Altus if it removed the risk to Kirimorat. He thought it was weird that Skirata was in league with another Jedi, but Juzik had turned out okay, so maybe Altus would, too. Sometimes, you just had to be pragmatic. It wasn't like the guy was General Voss or any of the real Shabir. Niner, he's not going to go off and screw things up for us, is he? Jane asked quietly. It's a few weeks, Max. That's all. He needs to shut up about Altus. Don't worry, I'll keep him on a leash, Niner said. It's all too soon after Atain. Sooner he comes home, the better. Oya, you're not wrong there. Koasii. Yeah, you look after yourself, too. Niner went to the stores and signed for a couple of tubes of sealant for his boots just in case Reed was the checking kind. By the time he found Darman, his brother was already in the canteen, chatting to Reed as if everything was just fine and demolishing a plate of Nerf steak. He wasn't fine, though. Niner could see the tension in him. He probably felt helpless, so far from Cad and desperate to be there to protect him, even if he wasn't sure what the threat was. Funny, the Imperial garrison at Keldaib never even got a mention. Dar just wasn't worried about it. He seemed to have complete faith in Kalbir, and the others to keep that at arm's length. But he didn't seem convinced that Skirata could take a tough line with Jedi. Knowing how Kelber felt about them, even Niner began to wonder what the Shab was really going on. It was just a few weeks stalling. Then it was a couple of months setting up the Altus surveillance, when the Jedi were long gone from Mandalore. By then, Niner thought, Dar would be missing Cad so badly that he'd be ready to be persuaded to desert for good. Laboratory, Kirimorat, Mandalore. Someone's got to test it. Yuthan said. And it might as well be me, because I started all this nonsense. She ran a detector around the seal on the biohaz room doors, 
checking the flashing light that would turn continuous if there was the smallest leak, small enough to let a nanoscale virus escape. Ordo was convinced there had to be an easier and safer way to test the immunogen. It had taken him all night to convince himself that this wasn't some plot to release the FG-36 virus after all so that Yuthan could have the last laugh. She'd lost her world. Ordo thought that if he'd been in her situation, he'd have happily spent his own life taking his revenge on those responsible. But Yuthan wasn't him. She seemed sweet on Helamar, and she even taken Scout under her wing, so maybe she had plenty to live for, and meant what she said. People did, sometimes, even those who dealt in death on an industrial scale. Okay, Bordo said. But give me the vials first. Ordo, dear, I'm going to give everyone a shot before I do this. Even Kinaha and Kaminoans aren't affected by FG-36 at all. I've been working with pathogens all my adult life, and I'm still alive. Okay. He was going to make sure she did it. But I still think you're rash. If I die, you won't get your aging therapy. I wasn't thinking of that. You should. Yuthan flexed her fingers like a keyboard virtuoso as she looked at the small transparent steel enclosure, more like two snack vendors' food display cabinets bolted side by side than a biohaz containment area. She wasn't as relaxed about it as she tried to make out. Now, I should be fully cooked in an hour. Don't forget to baste me halfway through. Be a deer and get everyone assembled in the carry That's everyone, even C.O.V. and his boys. And nobody moves in or out until I'm satisfied we're in the clear. When Ordo and Kam Marque had herded the whole clan into the carry Ordo was suddenly struck by how unlikely it would have been for this odd group of individuals to cling together in anything but a desperate war and its aftermath. Enemies, strangers, blood relatives and adoptees, those without roots and those who clung fiercely to their ancient cultures, it wasn't a recipe for harmony. Bessany put her arms around his waist and kissed him on the cheek. Cal can make anyone feel they belong, she said answering the question in his head and scaring him. Wives always did that, Calber warned him. Joka's talking to me at last. Normally, I mean. Not Frosty Frosty. C.O.R.R.'s a good influence. Will you miss the Jedi when they leave? Yes. Kinaha is a treasure. While you're off sabotaging the Empire... She's the one I end up talking to most of the day. My wife, my best IK, friends with the Kaminii. I should draw some great moral message from that, but Kinaha isn't Ko Sai or Orinwa. I'd still shoot Orinwa on sight. Point made, Bordeaux said. Who's making sure Arla gets her shot? Bardan. Actually, the point I was making was that I spend less time with you now than I did when you were in the army. But we're married now. Bessany stared at him for a second, then laughed. If romance isn't dead, she said, it's certainly coughing up blood. Sel and Spar had both shown up, doing a double act based on how very unimpressed they were by all this. They'd still been cautious enough to present for treatment, though. So there's some shot you can give me to make me immune from the Empire's bioweapon, Spar muttered. Another one. Whoopee. You know how many times clones were immunized against the latest super-duper mega-deadly viral agent some Sep Quack dreamed up? My backside's like a pincushion. We're immune to everything. Even flattery. Yuthan took a vial from the box and inserted it into the hypospray. I am that Sep Quack, she said, and I can assure you the pathogen this protects you from is lethal. Now drop your pants, or roll up your sleeve. I don't mind which. So raised an eyebrow and presented his upper arm. Have you had your shot? Yes. Now you spar. 
So when do we get the fix for premature gray? Spar asked. Is that your recipe too? Soon, I hope, Yuthan said. You want to volunteer for trials? Yeah. Yeah, I do. You're awfully trusting. And Sergeant Helamar is an awfully good shot, ma'am. I can afford to trust you. I might just engineer you some unusual and embarrassing physical characteristics to teach you never to mess with a menopausal woman. Yuthan finished administering the hyposprays and held up the empty box. Friends, if you do get any symptoms, onset should be within an hour. Just sniffles and a slight fever. This does not entitle any males to take to their beds claiming they have acute nemoscoria and yes C.O.R.R. that does mean you and no you cannot have a candy for being a brave boy. Everyone laughed. Ordo rated her at 9 on a fear scale of 10. If she was wrong, and not half as good at her job as she thought she was, she had less than an hour to live. She walked out, Helamar and Scout trailing behind her and there was a noticeable drop in the volume of conversation, as if everyone had the same thought at once. It took the best part of the next hour to run all the safety checks on the biohaz chamber. Ordo simply watched, because he needed to know if she lived or died. Scout hung around outside the main door of the lab, hands in her pockets and looking downcast. Helamar fidgeted, more anxious than Ordo had ever seen him. When Yuthan stood in front of the chamber with her hand on the locking mechanism, taking deep breaths that she seemed to think nobody noticed, he couldn't hold back. As she slid the door aside, he simply wrapped his arms around her and gave her a desperate kiss. She responded. It was a very touching moment. Ordo had to look away. I can't lose two good women in my lifetime. Helamar sounded hoarse. You better be right about this, doctor. Death. Ordo decided he'd have to work on his lines to reach Jilamar's effortless line in affectionate abuse. The chamber closed behind Yuthan, and the door seal hissed. Once she opened the finger-sized Durasteel container and inhaled or touched the contents, she'd infect herself with a planet killer. She paused, then pulled out a thin plastoid spatula. Ordo wondered if she thought of Jibad at that moment. It hadn't occurred to him before that she might be punishing herself in some act of atonement. Shab, Helamar said, shutting his eyes for a moment. Ordo hadn't seen her use the hypo on herself. And if she hadn't, it was too late now. Scout came and clung to Helamar, sometimes burying her face in his tunic because she couldn't bear to watch sometimes stealing herself to look at Yuthan. She really was just a kid, lonely and afraid in a galaxy that wanted to kill her just for what she was. He understood that fear. Yuthan kept taking her own pulse and checking her eyes with a small piece of mirrored metal. She pulled down both lower lids and gave Helamar a thumbs-up sign. Hemorrhaging, she mouthed. Just checking. Nothing. It was a very, very slow hour. Toward the end of it, she took a blood sample from her arm and put it in a stare bag. Helamar shook his head. Got to teach that woman to use a sharp properly. Eh, Scout? You, too. Ordo checked the chrono. Yuthan was well beyond the onset period now, and she still looked fine. After another half an hour, she stepped into the adjacent chamber and pressed the controls to flood the whole space with decontaminant as thick as white smoke. Ordo found that the worst part of it. When she opened the door, the smoke rolled out like fog and she was coughing. Where the stang did you get that thing, Midge? She demanded. It looks like an old GAR field biochem decontamination unit. It is he said, hugging her. They just left it unattended. I always thought I'd find a use for it. Ordo wasn't sure how to take his leave of them, but they seemed happy enough. 
Scout didn't. She turned to Ordo. If Bardan wipes my memories of this place, am I going to forget Midge and Kale? She asked, utterly miserable. Is it all going to disappear? I don't know, Ordo said. I'm not sure anyone does. I don't want to leave, Scout said. Not yet, anyway. Do I have to? I'd never tell anyone this place was here. I'm learning so much. Helamar put his arm around her shoulders like a father. And you don't have to go, Ad I.K. I'll talk to Cal. Don't you worry. He'll have you in armor in no time, Bordo said. Oh, thanks, but I'm a Jedi. I can still be a Jedi, can I? It's all I ever wanted to be. Ordo heard Helamar pause for a fraction of a second before replying. Of course you can, he said. Leave it to me. Ordo decided that this was going to be interesting. Kirimorat, next day. Ah, uh, it's good to hear your voice again, Cal. Shaisa said. Feel safe using a calm now? Skirata tried to phrase the offer sensibly. The more he tried to cover all the bases that had been troubling him, the more insane it sounded. Yuthan stood within earshot to guide him on the technical stuff. But he couldn't imagine Shaisa wanting to ask about antigens and T-cells. Safe enough, Skirata said. I've got something to offer Mandalore. The services of that fine young force using Mandoad? Not that. Shaisa never forgot anything. Skarada took a breath. You know what happened to Jibad? I do. Filthy business. But then we know who we're doing business with. If the old Hutuan plans to use the virus on us, We've beaten him to the punch. But we need to keep it quiet, or he'll just get a tame scientist to invent another one. So what trick have you got up your sleeve? An immunogen. Or some word like that. He glanced at Yuthin and she nodded emphatically. A virus that makes folks immune to the thing. And they pass the immunity to their kids. I don't understand the science but we can spread it to everyone on Mandalore so we don't have folks lining up for hypo and making the Imperials curious. Shaisa made a hum noise. Is it safe? Well, we're not dead yet. You just get a mild fever and a runny nose. But I wanted your blessing to spread it. It's not like we can ask everyone for their consent. Ah... Uh, Cal, I never thought I'd see the day when you got a bad case of medical ethics, you old Shabir. We've just got better scientists than Palps has. You won the Corellian lottery, then? Again. Yeah. Skirata felt a sudden chill down his spine as he realized he hadn't checked the clan accounts with Jilka for days. The numbers multiplied like bacteria. He could bankroll a small army for Shaisa. Natural-born winner. I'll mention to the clans that there'll be a little bug doing the rounds, but that we'll be all the stronger for it. Then we can all laugh at Palps when he tries to wipe us out. I'm glad you're on our side, Cal. You're a strange and dangerous wee fella. Will this make the Imperials here immune too? Yes, if they mix with us. Win some, lose some. Then it's back to shoot an M when they outstay their welcome. Drop by for a glass or two, Cal. Doors always open. Skirata closed the comm link and looked to Yuthin for approval. She gave him a baffled frown. You mandos are thoroughly contradictory, she said. One minute you'll kill the first person to try to impose rules on you. The next you think it's okay to infect your entire population without their knowledge or consent. Forgive me if I say that's rich coming from you. Face it. You're all split personalities. She looked at her chrono, 
lips moving as if she was calculating. We'll stay infectious for a few more days, so better get on with it. Pity we're on the run. I would have loved to submit a paper on this. It was a good excuse to take a few of the ad icon to Keldate. Everyone was getting a little restless, and Skirata wanted to check for himself exactly who was in town. He stuck his head around the kitchen door. Wallen, are you still sulking, or are you coming with us? Vav wiped his nose. Okay. Change of Beskergam, though. No point asking for trouble. Juzik, Hilamar, Vav, the Nulls, and Skirata swapped out armor plates from the stores and emerged in unrecognizable colors. It was enough to avoid the attention of any dumb imperial who had a checklist of wanted mandos wearing certain colors of Beskergam. All the Vode had to do now was take their helmets off and tap caps when prying imperial eyes weren't watching, cough in confined spaces, and touch as many surfaces as they could. Keldib was a hub for the whole planet. Eventually the infection would spread like the work cough epidemic had 40 years before, across the planet and throughout the Mandalore system by travel, and, eventually, around the galaxy. Slow. But covert. Can they charge us with bioterrorism? Juzik asked. Skirata thought of Jalar Obrim for a moment and missed their long, rambling discussions in the CSF staff club over an ale. They can nick us for looking at them funny and being willfully Mandalorian with malice aforethought in a public place. Vav opened the hatch of an old agricultural shuttle laid up in one of the barns and ushered the rest of them inside. A whiff of roba dung and straw rolled out. Murd trotted up expectantly, tail whipping, but Vav pointed back to the house. Zay Murdai K. Guard the Jedi. Murd ambled back through the kitchen doors, grumbling to itself. Skarada knew that it was going to shadow Zay even into the freshers until Vav got back and told it to stand down. It was a pity most sentient species weren't that smart. When we finish spreading the plague, we need to get on with offloading our Jedi, Skarada said. Helamar coughed and this time it wasn't the virus. I was meaning to talk to you about that, Cal. Scout wants to stay, poor kid. Plenty of room for strays. She wants to stay as a Jedi. Skirata strapped himself into his seat and choked back his reflex rejection. Okay. It's not like she's the first. No, Cal, she wants to stay a Jedi not become a Mando. But it's okay. We've got Tagorian Mandos. If they can fit in, Scout can, too. It's only temporary. She seems to need Yuthan at the moment. Interesting choice of mother figure. Skirata could hardly blame Hilamar for wanting to be the archetypal Mando bear to any child in need. He decided to worry about Scout later. So has anyone else got a surprise for me? Yes, said Juzik. Jin Altus. Atain was invited to join them with Cad and Dar if she felt like it. Juzik blurted it out as if he wanted to rid himself of the knowledge. Skirata felt his chest sink under the weight of loss. Atain could have survived Order 66 then. Skirata was learning to stop himself running through endless what-ifs, because a different fork in the road had been taken. He couldn't change history, and he couldn't live with the pain of being reminded that things could have been different. He had to walk away and accept that was how things had turned out. It was a massive effort. He usually failed. Bardike, he said. If I ever make you feel you have to pick the right time to tell me things, I'm sorry. You should never have to tread on eggs with me, son. He didn't mean it as a rebuke. He really did worry that his temper scared his family from telling him things. I just don't like opening wounds, Juzik said. Altus said he'd like to meet you sometime. I'd like to meet him, too. 
especially as Dar and Niner are keeping tabs on him. Dar's spitting blood about it. Jane didn't sound as chipper as usual. He still thinks we're going soft on Jedi. Betraying our principles. I can see that, son. But I can't win with Dar at the moment whatever I do, because he's hurting too much. No, I decided to behave all nice like an arrow to eye, not a mando, and he called me on it. Let's take one hurdle at a time. The shuttle skimmed over familiar woods and fields and then followed the course of the Kelita River into Keldabe. Vav parked the shuttle near the animal market. Seeing as your girlfriend failed to secure a proper bone for Murd, I'm going to see the butcher, Vav said. Never break a promise to a strill. She's not my girlfriend, Skarada said. And Murd got the cookies. Helamar caught his arm by the biceps as they walked into the maze of alleys at the rear of the Oyubat Cantina. You're a long time dead, Cal, he said. I know you put your needs a poor second to the lads, but you've been a widower way too long. Is this a trend? You and Yithin, Jilka and C.O.R.R. Rue and C.O.V. What? Your own daughter, and you don't know where she spends her free time? Skarada was stunned for a moment. He really needed to catch up with Rue. He felt worse every day about neglecting her. Now she had a sweetheart, and he hadn't even noticed. You sure? He said. C.O.V.? He's just a kid. He's roughly twenty-seven. Rose thirty-six, thereabouts. In eight years or so, they'll be the same age. Then he'll start getting older than her. Skarata never needed reminding that the clones were on borrowed time, and that his personal priority was to put that right. But Jillimar's stark analysis in relation to his own daughter really smacked him around the head. When he got back to Kiramorat, he'd do whatever it took to get that gene therapy out of Yuthin. The group split up, very casual, very random. Ordo went off with Ilamar. Now Skarata had to carry out his bizarre mission. He had to cough his guts out and give as many Mandoade a mild dose of genetically modified rhinoceria as he could. Market day, held twice a week, meant the town was heaving with shoppers, drinkers, and scrappers, so Skarata slipped off his helmet one-handed to share his viral gift. Any Imperial who happened to venture into Keldab wouldn't even spot him. Skarata was out of practice but he could still disappear simply by altering his body language and becoming a skinny old man nobody took any notice of until he wanted them to. It was an assassin's skill. It was also a thief's. It had been years since Skarada had gone anywhere with nothing to do except mooch around, and he wasn't very good at doing nothing. He stopped at each tapcalf along the Chortav Meshurkane and had a mug of hot shig, then ambled along the market stalls that lined the alley. One end was all leather items, from gloves and belts to commas. The other was precious metals and gems, and somewhere in the middle the two trades met and mixed. Helamar was right. He had to sort out where he stood with New York. It affected the whole clan. Skirata looked over the gems and wondered what was an appropriate betrothal token for a man whose bank accounts had more zeros than he could count. It wasn't his personal wealth. It was the clone's fund. But he still had access to more creds than he would ever have a use for. Ah, Shab. He didn't even know what New York liked. He'd buy something for Root, too, because he hadn't bought his little girl a gift a personal gift, not cred sent to her mother, for more than thirty years. He put his helmet back on, comforted by the instant access to comms and data, and took his virus further into town. The end of Meshurkane opened onto the ancient paved square in front of the Oyubat, a space filled today with food stalls. A couple of stormtroopers strolled up and down the aisles. 
Skirata wasn't sure if they were patrolling, why would they need to? Or if they were just exploring? Maybe the Imperial Army had learned a lesson and worked out that men needed stand easy time and a little breathing space. Empire or no empire, his subconscious reaction to white plastoid armor was that these were his boys. Under their helmets, they would look like his boys. But they were not. If they were doing their jobs right, they'd check this scruffy little Shabir against their ID images in their HUDs, see the personal death warrant from Palpatine, and they'd pull him in. Thirteen years of constant, sleepless devotion to the liberation of their slave army wouldn't count for Nas. Instead of turning and retracing his steps down the Meshurkain, Skirata carried on without deviating and walked slowly past them. He even stopped to buy a packet of spiced leather meat. He didn't see the Stormies react. They were still facing dead ahead. But then he knew anything could have been happening under that helmet, and they could have been looking right at him. He carried on. They'd be looking for sand gold armor with red sigils anyway, not this dark sea green. When he got to the far side of the square, he leaned on the rail to watch the Kelleter River crashing over the granite rocks below while he unwrapped the leather meat. Another great thing about his bicey, the distinctive Mandalorian helmet, was that the visor could not only give aging eyes a sharp view in infrared, low light, and UV, with a range of 2 kilometers, but also enlarge the infuriatingly small print on food packaging. But there was nothing wrong with his distance vision. When he turned around, something in the crowd drew his eye as familiar things did. It was out of time frame and context. Something that rang a bell but took him a couple of slow seconds to pin down to a specific memory. It was a woman in yellow and gray armor, leather comma swinging as she walked, and a man in red and black. He'd seen that in some place or other every day of his life for the best part of eight years, and the place was Topoka City. Ordo had warned him. It was Isabet Roe and Dread Priest. If Helamar saw them, there'd be trouble. He loathed them with a passion. If anyone thought Django Fett's hand-picked team of special forces experts had been one happy unit, then they really needed to understand what it was like to be marooned indefinitely on Kamino with folks you hated on sight and nowhere to escape them. Priest had run a fight club in one of the shadowy maintenance areas of the Stilt City. He was a six beer. He enjoyed seeing men really damage each other in fistfights, and nobody needed that when they were training lads for armed combat. His girlfriend, Ro, was even worse, always harping on about restoring the glory of the Mandalorian Empire through the iron will of the warrior. Skirata was all for Mandoate kicking the Asik out of anyone who got in their faces. That didn't mean that Arotais were inferior species, just enemies but Ro and Priest really believed they were in need of the firm governing hand of a master state. Cal? Vav's voice whispered over his helmet audio. I can see you. Can you see what's heading your way? Yeah. Where's Midge? Ordo's with him. It's okay. But have you seen them? Yes. You going deaf as well, Wallen? Right in front of me, almost on a collision course. Well, look harder. Skirata doubted they'd recognize him. It had been more than three years since he'd last had to breathe the same air as those two, and he no longer had his distinctive limp. His only worry was that he wouldn't be able to resist the urge to finally slide his three-sided blade into Priest where it would do the most damage but he'd had plenty of chances on Kamino, where the Kaminoans were scared of the Kiri Valdar and left them to run their affairs. It was lawless. And he still hadn't done it. Helamar had punched Priest senseless, though. He didn't like young commandos showing up blinded in one eye or collapsing with brain hemorrhages. The fight club stopped for good after Django gave Priest a good hiding. Skirata was five or six meters away from Priest and Ro now. 
If they'd been here during the war, he'd have known. It was a very small city in a world of only four million people. They'd come back with the Imperials. We're mercenaries. Professionals. It's no big deal. But those two. Skirata still couldn't work out what Valve was so insistent he ought to see. It was only when Ro turned a little to her left that he saw the full surface of her shoulder plate and the dark blue emblem on it. He thought it was a stylized jigaller at first, wings spread and half folded back to swoop on its prey, talons outstretched, forming a vague W shape. But it wasn't. And he had no idea how this woman had made it through Keldabe without getting a punch in the face at the very least. Shab, priest had one of the emblems on his shoulder plate, too. Didn't anyone else here know what that was? Skirata was now level with them, forced by the crowd to stop by the Roba Pie stall for a few seconds. He looked at Rose plate straight on. It wasn't the same as the Death Watch emblem but it was enough to almost trigger his reflex to swing a punch. It looked like a ragged, stylized silhouette of a shriek hawk in dark blue paint. Dread and Roe moved past him and vanished into the crowds. Skirata just carried on walking, shaken. Vav caught up with him, and they headed in silence for the Oyubat. They didn't speak until they got inside, checked for Imperials, and took off their helmets. The barkeep gave them a weary look and set up two mugs of Netare Gal. I told you, we asked the garrison to stay out of the place. The thin head of pale amber foam settled on the black liquid like a mat of pond barley as he contemplated it. I'd lose half my custom if nobody could take off their bicy without being arrested. Skirata noted his mug shot was still on the bounty poster behind the bar, along with everyone else's. The sheet was splashed with some unidentifiable dark stain that might have been blood, or even gravy. Some wag had inked in pointy shutter fangs on his image. Vav and Skarada grabbed their alash and found a quiet booth near a noisy hotter unit, where they huddled over the mugs and tried to keep their voices down. Well? Vav said. I know what I think that is. So do I but nobody else seemed to be taking any notice. When did anyone last see the Death Watch here? Nearly thirty years ago. Update the badge, change from dark red to dark blue, and there you are. Nobody remembers. Some fancy diner used a symbol exactly like the winged circle of the Gukko Pure Light Party, and nobody under fifty thought there was anything wrong with it. Folks forget and kids don't get taught. And so these Hakyun get reinvented. Skirata shut his eyes for a second to recall the symbol. It was a definite W shape. Older Mandos reacted to the Death Watch emblem just like the Gukko reacted to the Pure Light Circle, which would always spell genocide to Gukosi who remembered the invasion. Maybe we're letting the personalities of the two Hakyun concerns shape our judgment said Skirata, realizing he was clutching at straws. You know that's Asik. This isn't the time of life to suddenly discover benefit of the doubt. Vav leaned closer, almost nose to nose across the table with Skirata. I don't care if they're cozying up to the Empire or the holy children of us rat. It's not the company they keep. It's what they are. No true Mandalorian can live alongside the Death Watch. Skirata wondered how many Mandoade had given Amat's backside about the power struggle between Jaster Mariel and the Death Watch. It hadn't touched Mandalorians living off-world. It probably hadn't even touched most of those living in the Mandalore sector. It was between two factions, relatively small factions but it swallowed up the core of the full-time army and the leading clans, and it had been a battle for the heart of Mandian, the very culture, how Mandalore would conduct itself for generations to come. The Death Watch represented the worst excess of an ancient imperial Mandalore. They're rotten to the core. 
They're dangerous. Skirata knew that no compromise could be reached with them. He could rationalize about the folly of trying to rebuild old empires, but in the end it was something he felt in his guts like a reflex revulsion at finding a decomposing body. He couldn't help seeing the Death Watch as something disgusting. Like we don't have enough to keep us busy, Skirata said. So who do we deal with first? Vav's lean face betrayed every twitching muscle. He wasn't just angry. He was possessed. Skirata knew it was stoked by his guilt at not being at Django Fett's side at the Battle of Galadrin. We haven't fought a war of expansion for thousands of years, Vav said. We're strictly home defense or mercenaries. Whatever the Death Watch have in mind, they'll always drag us into the kind of war we can't win. The Death Watch had melted away after Fett finally defeated them. But they had enough Mandalorian spirit in them to guarantee one thing. They knew the strategic value of Beaceland Shevla. And that meant they'd be back one day. That day could be coming all too soon. Keldabe, half a kilometer from the Oyubat. I hope Meriel isn't getting Bard I.K. into bad ways. Ordo checked his chrono, trying to work out where in the city they'd be by now. C.O.R.R. was the quiet stay-at-home type before Mer I.K. got hold of him. But Helamar wasn't going to be distracted by small talk. He wasn't strolling, spreading his virus carefully, but walking with his head thrust forward like a hunting strill on a scent. Ordo knew what was on his mind. Dread Priest and Isabet Row. Calbir shouldn't have come to you, Ordo said. Helamar shook his head. I knew they were here. It was only a matter of time. I meant about the Death Watch angle. That, Helamar said, only makes me want to kill them twice. Ordo found himself wondering how hard a stranglehold he'd have to put on Helamar to break up a fight without hurting the man. Keldib wasn't a big place. The public areas, marketplaces, alleys full of shops, the main cantinas, were all crammed into a small sector, and on a busy day like this the entire population seemed to be circulating around it just waiting to run into folks they knew. But Helamar was a pro, a man used to keeping a low profile. He wasn't going to start a brawl and draw attention to himself. So where have the Death Watch been all these years, then? Ordo said. Depends who you ask. Helamar obviously kept tabs on them, which was worrying in itself. Anywhere from half the planets on the outer rim to Ender. Also holding hands with Black Sun and any other crime syndicate that'll pay them. Ordo tried to calm him down. Let's distinguish between the lowlife sporting a badge to look tougher to their criminal buddies and the real Death Watch. If someone wants to be a designer thug, that's not our problem. But anyone who wants to change Mandalore and its culture to achieve galactic domination, that's very much our problem. You remember Priest Ordo. You know what he's like. And they're all like that, all of them. Ask Arla. Jillimar's resolve to leave the galaxy's ideologues and firebrands to rebel against Palpatine seemed to have been swept aside by a knee-jerk urge to start an equally dangerous fight with other Mandalorians. Ordo scanned every unhelmeted face he passed, hoping that he'd spot a familiar one before Helamar did. I still don't see what the Death Watch would get out of siding with Palpatine, Ordo said. If they want to restore the Mando Empire... He's not the power-sharing kind. Maybe he's franchising dictatorships. The Death Watch gets this concession to keep an eye on the place. That won't be enough for them. No, not if they're still spouting Vizsla's party line. What was Django doing recruiting them? He had more reason to hate the Death Watch than anybody. Priest and Roe weren't exactly card-carrying members. Django thought they were all talk. He only cared about results. So even legends made bad choices. 
Ordo found that oddly comforting. Hilamar took off his helmet as he walked and slipped on a sun visor. Combined with a bandana tied over the hair, the visor gave Hilamar some anonymity in this crowd, and even his broken nose wasn't as distinctive in Keldabe as it might have been on Coruscant. A lot of people had one, including females. I feel like I'm roasting. This fever had better be over as fast as Yuthan promised. Ordo could still smell frying food whether his nose was running or not. He opened the filter on his helmet and savored the scent. Helamar, a pace or two ahead of him, was forced to slow down by the press of bodies as they got closer to the market square. I'll be glad when this is done, Jilamar's voice rasped. I feel as rough as old boots. Kale can make me a nice pot of shig when I get home, maybe with a splash of tihar in it. We're hard as nails, Bordo said. Not. He willed the day to be over without incident. Just a couple more turns around the block, and they could meet up with the others in the Oyubat, then head back to Kiramorat, job done, population immunized. The next problem was waiting to be solved, erasing the memories of their Jedi guests before transferring them to Altus's care. Ordo spotted a few items on the stalls that Bessany might like, a decent butchering knife, a ruby glass vial of perfume, and paused to check them over. Helamar scanned the crowd, managing to look casual. The stormtroopers had vanished. Ordo paid for the knife and the perfume. Then come Juzik for a routine check. How's it going, Bardike? He asked. Mariel's just met a new woman. I'm sure she'll be sneezing and coughing very soon. Ordo couldn't begrudge Mario grabbing whatever chances he could to be young and carefree, but he wanted to tell him to keep his mind on the job. Can't ever call that boy slow. What's the problem? I can feel a lot of angst around. Ordo still tended to forget that Juzik sensed things. Oh, Priest and his crazy woman are in town, and Kalbir said they had death watch insignia or something. That explains what I can feel. See you later. Make sure Muriel doesn't wear himself out. Ordo shut the calm and turned to share the joke with Hilamar. He'd only taken his eyes off him for a few seconds. For a moment, he lost him in the sea of shoppers. Then he spotted his brown bandana and realized Helamar had moved on a few meters. He stood on the corner of an alley that became steep steps leading down to the river. Better stick with him. Can't be too careful. Ordo edged through the crowd and reached out to tap Jilamar's shoulder. Helamar turned slowly but it wasn't toward Ordo. It was as if someone had called him, and he wasn't sure it was a good idea to respond. Fancy seeing you here, said a voice that Ordo hadn't heard in years. By the time Ordo got to Helamar, he could see Dread Priest almost face to face with him, and Ordo knew he'd have to intervene. Come on, Midge, you DCI. Stay cool. Don't make a scene. Ordo saw Helamar literally hold himself back, straining to walk away and save his anger for later. But it was too late. Priest had cornered him. There was nowhere to run, too dense a crowd. Helamar stood his ground. Small world, he muttered. Priest took off his helmet. Calbert had described him as having the sort of face he could punch all day. It was that thin lopsided mouth that did it. There was no sign of Isabet Rowe. She was no work of art either. You never were the kind to worry about the wanted list, were you? Priest said. Been a long time. He glanced at Ordo. Who's this? My nephew, Helamar said. Ordo took that as a hint to keep quiet and not give Priest a clue who was under the helmet. I'd like to say I'd miss you, but you know I was lying. So, working for the Empire? 
The emblem on Priest's shoulder plate really did look like the old Death Watch badge. Even Ordo could see that, and he hadn't lived with it as a specter of dread like Helamar and the others had. He kept his arms at his sides, but flexed his right fist discreetly to make sure the vibroblade in his gauntlet was primed to eject. Helamar still had his thumbs hooked on his belt, deceptively casual. You know how I prefer winners said Priest. Helamar stared pointedly at Priest's emblems. Interesting paint job. Is that a question? Was that an answer? No hard feelings about the pounding you gave me. Oh good. And if you're worried I'm going to turn you into the garrison, I've got more pressing business. Priest looked around. Maybe he was checking for Roe. Times change. Are you looking for work? Helamar froze. Ordo thought he was bracing to throw a punch. Not with the death watch, Hutyun. Things have changed since Vizla. Priest took that ultimate insult calmly. The galaxy is a different place. Mandalorians need to look after themselves better. Not just scramble for crumbs like the deadbeats here. Ordo couldn't just walk away now that Priest had identified Helamar. Plenty of folks here knew that Skirata and his clan were back somewhere on Mandalore, and even if they did some work for the garrison, that didn't make them Imperial sympathizers. But Priest was different, almost an enemy to start with. There was no telling what he'd do. So, new Death Watch? Helamar said quietly. His voice was steady, as if he'd suddenly forgotten the past and every blow he'd ever landed on Priest. New policies? Then he looked around as if he was checking for eavesdroppers. You better tell me about it. Helamar turned and jerked his head at Priest to follow him. Ordo took the cue instantly, closing up behind them. Helamar led the way down the alley. It grew steeper and became cobbled steps that dipped down to the level of the river, deserted and damp with spray. It was just a dead end that had once led to a sluice gate or something, but the gate had long gone, and now the archway cut from the solid granite foundations of Keldabe was sealed off by a metal safety rail. Foaming, hammering white water rushed beneath them, echoing under the arch and drenching the walls with a permanent mist. Deep green frond grass thrived in the cracks. It was the kind of hidden spot where you could lean on the rail and lose yourself in contemplation of the raging river, or meet a lover, or just hide. It was a great place to discuss the death watch without being overheard. But Ordo had no idea what Helamar was up to. He's going to shake Priest down. Double agent stuff. I hope he knows what he's doing. Helamar put one hand out to lean on the wall, which would have looked relaxed to anyone who didn't know him. Ordo stood back, ready to do whatever needed doing. Priest kept glancing at him. He'd obviously pegged him as the hired muscle who'd give him a clip around the ear if he got out of line. I never did like you much, Dread, Helamar said. Or your Chikar of a girlfriend. What could I possibly do for you? Same as always. You're either with us, or you're against us. And us is... Lorca Gedek has big plans for us. Forget your petty personal squabbles with the Aruidic Empire and start thinking about our rightful heritage. We weren't always the Arutized latrine cleaners. We've got the Besker, and we can use it. Say it. Say what? Are you still calling yourself the Death Watch, or have you hired an image consultant to give you a racy new name? Helamar looked Priest straight in the eye with just enough hostility to be convincing. Ordo had guessed right. He just hoped Mijike knew how far to go with this stunt. We're not ashamed. Death Watch it is. So how are you going to build your new Mando Empire? He asked. There can't be more than a few thousand of you vermin tops. 
and you won't be fighting little girls this time. I can't reveal troop strengths to you. Priest shook his head. Helamar didn't voice his usual objection to the Death Watch using the word troops instead of thugs. Still as sanctimonious as ever, Midge. Helamar paused and pushed himself away from the wall one-handed to stand upright. Ordo braced for trouble, keeping an eye on Priest's holstered blaster. His hand wandered just a fraction too close to it for comfort. Yeah, Helamar said. I have trouble forgetting all the lads on Kamino I had to patch up from your fight club. And the ones who didn't make it. The strong survive, the weak die. That's the way the galaxy works. The day we forgot that, we became everyone's lackey. Helamar looked down for a moment. The river was so noisy that they had to stand as close as friends to hear each other. Then Jilamar's shoulders sagged as if he was sighing. It's not vengeance, he said. It just has to be done. Ordo was fast. But he wasn't fast enough. Helamar dropped to a crouch and drew the blade on his belt, bringing it up into Priest's belly in the time it took Ordo to inhale. Priest staggered back, eyes wide with shock, and fell against the slippery wall. For a heartbeat Ordo couldn't work out how Helamar had put the knife through Priest's armor, but then he saw the blood, spurting blood, arterial blood, and knew that Helamar had aimed with a surgeon's precision for the gap between the plates at the top of the thigh. He'd sliced through the femoral artery. Priest had minutes to live. He'd bleed out in minutes. Oh, oh, you scum! Priest's voice had suddenly taken on a high-pitched shakiness, all surprise. He slumped at the foot of the wall, trying to stem the blood with his hands but he was already too weak to apply much pressure. You, you, why? It'll take too long to list. Helamar just watched him. Ordo had never seen that side of the doctor before. But I can't let you live, for so many, many reasons. I sabet? Is he? Help me, help me. Ro wasn't going to hear him. Nobody would, with the racket the water was making. They were going to have a dead body on their hands very soon. Ordo had to think what to do next. Shab, Midge, did you have to? He said. Yes. Helamar squatted down and looked Priest in the eye. I can't let your kind come back to Mandalore. You know that, don't you? and it's the least I owe Django. And all those boys who got broken for your entertainment. Priest was panting now, semi-conscious, and all he managed was an animal noise that faded into nothing. There was an awful lot of blood pooling on the cobbles. Ordo looked down from the archway to see if there was any runoff staining the water, but the churning foam was as white as ever. How can I tell Bessany that my first thought was how to cover this up? It was a war. It didn't matter which war. And Bessany had seen him do far worse. Ordo watched Helamar check the pulse in Priest's neck as if he was doing a house call. Calbear's going to be furious. You got a better idea, son? This Chikar would turn us in if it suited him, too. We'd better dump the body in the river. Yeah. Helamar took something from his belt and held it under Priest's nose. It looked like polished durasteel. The man's eyes were half open. Helamar nodded. He's gone. Kinder exit than he deserved. Help me tip him over the side. Mind you don't get blood all over your plates. Helamar searched Priest and took his data pad, com link, and ID chip, then unclipped one of the shoulder plates with the hated death watch emblem and slipped it into his belt pouch. The opening in the granite wall wasn't overlooked. Unlike Imperial City, 
There were no snoop cams to monitor the place, either. Ordo took a grip of Priest's belt and backplate. Helamar grabbed the other side, and together they heaved the body into the torrent. They didn't even hear a splash. He'll wash up somewhere downstream, Helamar said. The buffeting in the rocks will mash the body a bit, but we don't have Jal Obrim or the CSF Forensic Service here to worry about. Come on. I'll make my peace with Cal. Who's going to make the most noise when they realize Priest's missing? Ordo asked. He checked himself for blood before climbing the steps again. Other than Ro? Does it matter? Helamar cleaned his knife in the spray from the river and shook off the water. We're all borked anyway. Might as well hang for a band as a jackrab. It was time to bang out of Keldabe. They'd infected enough people by now anyway. And Ro, Ordo knew they'd have to deal with her sooner or later. It would take her a long time to work out who'd killed Priest. 16. Your prowess with a lightsaber is childish vanity. Your physical force powers are no more than a conjurer's trick, sleight of hand to dazzle the ordinary beings you should be serving. You profane these powers by using them as weapons in war. And you fail to grasp the single, simple, uncompromising duty of the true Jedi. The Jedi is the rock lion at the gate who says, I will defend these beings with my life. And that is the sum of me. Atain Termukin died to save one life, a man she did not even know, but felt compelled to save, and that is what made her stronger in the Force and a truer Jedi than any of you acrobats, tricksters, and specious, empty philosophers. Kinaha, Jedi Knight, unsure of her exact age, but at least a thousand years old. Kirimorat Mandalore. Arla? It's me. Can I come in? Juzik rapped on her door and waited for a response. It was locked from the outside, but he had to give her some control over the only sanctuary she had. Lasima listened, head tilted in concentration. She's been awful while you were down in Keldabe. Lasima adjusted the balance of dishes on the tray. Hallucinations, muscle spasms, vomiting, the lot. I had to get Fi to give her medical aid while Scout kept her calm. He's really good. He trained as a squad battlefield medic, Juzik said. I always think of him as just the sniper. I tend to forget the medic's side. This is the first time she's been too far out of it to wash and dress herself. That's why I'm worried. What were the hallucinations about? The only thing I could understand was that she thought she was burning. There were flames coming toward her. Juzik didn't know enough to even guess if that was a clue to an underlying problem. And he'd never seen anyone suffer withdrawal symptoms before. It was distressing. When he opened the door, Arla was thrashing around on the bed, clearly in pain, panting for breath. Her eyes were half open. Let me die, she mumbled, apparently lucid. If you understood, you'd end this for me. Juzik turned to Lasima. Better get Mijike. This was medically beyond him. Arla, this is going to pass. I know it doesn't feel like it, but it will be over soon. He put his hand under her head, feeling the matted, sweaty hair, and wondered how medics ever cope daily with the smell of illness. She struggled to focus on him. It won't pass, she whispered. It's not the drugs. It's me. When that stuff is out of your system, then we can fix you. We can. No. It's still there. It always will be. Helamar arrived with an assortment of hyposprays. 
For a man who just killed a former comrade, he looked oddly calm. What's wrong, Marla? Stomach cramps? Throwing up? Head hurt. He placed a blood pressure sensor in the crook of her elbow. That's a bit low. Let's fix that first. Twitching muscles staying my legs. Two for two so far. Helamar gave her two shots and stood back. Should be kicking in any time, Marla. Hang in there. Now, where are you, and what can you see? Bedroom window, you. Bardan, and Lasima was here. You're not hallucinating, then. You're going to feel like a speeder wreck for a couple of days yet. What's your biggest problem right now? Arla rolled over on one side and flung off one of the blankets. I want to stop thinking. I want it all to stop. Helamar bent down to whisper in Juzik's ear. She's lucid and feeling ropey. Apart from monitoring her blood pressure, that's all I can do until something else mechanical or chemical goes wrong. Juzik sat with Arla for half an hour, trying to feel her mental state, and all he could get was a sensation in his mind of her constantly trying not to look at something hanging in front of her eyes. He tended to see solid images superimposed at a point that felt somewhere behind his eyes and level with the roof of his mouth. Then he felt Sei and Kinaha approaching. Kinaha was distinctive in the Force, such a weight of time and experience stored in her being that the Force felt as if it curved around her. Sei was an odd mix now, the old master, impatient and frustrated like an escaping sigh but almost completely engulfed in a terrible regret that peaked and fell on a cycle like a heartbeat. If we can help, Sei said. Just say. Kinaha settled down with majestic slowness and dipped her long neck to gaze into Arla's face. I'm old, she said. And there's nothing you have done that can shock me. I've seen so many. Whatever it is, you're not the most terrible being who ever lived. It won't let you go, so you can't run from it, but you can grab it and hold it where you can see it for what it is. Juzik had no idea what the Kaminoan was going on about, although she seemed to sense that thing that Arla was trying not to see. It was obvious, a terrible memory. It would be agony to relive what the Death Watch did to her family and then to her but it seemed to be the only option left. Sei just watched. Juzik moved back a little. Kinaha took Arla's arm and examined the cuts and deep wounds. What are you trying to cut out of yourself? She asked. Juzik tried not to jump too far ahead, but he could guess guilt, taste guilt, calculate guilt. Arla didn't know her brother Django had survived. But there wasn't a happy ending to that either, so Juzik decided to save it until she was a lot stronger. What I am, Arla said at last. And what are you? One of them. Who? Juzik looked at Zay, who seemed just as lost as he was. Kinaha's thousand years of life, what had she seen and experienced? More than any human, ten times over even more than any hut, even if she spent it all in secluded contemplation. She'd had time to listen to whole worlds. Look, Arla said. I can't say it. She scrambled into a sitting position and struggled to lift the back of her shirt. Juzik didn't know what to expect. He just knew that she'd been hurt, physically and emotionally. Django had told Vav just the barest detail about the Death Watch punishing his father for harboring Jaster Mariel, and his mother shooting one of them dead so Django, eight maybe, could get away. That was the last he saw of all of them, his mother shielding 14-year-old Arla, his father on his knees yelling at him to run. Django thought they'd all died. Arla seemed to think she was the lone survivor, too. Between those two views lay a mystery. 
Arla still fumbled with her shirt. Juzik didn't dare touch her to help her. He left it to Kinaha. Look, Arla said. Kinaha lifted the fabric higher. I can't reach it. If I could, I'd cut it out. But I'd still be in here. It's me who needs to go. Juzik steeled himself to look. He was expecting worse. He wasn't sure if the dark brown mark was a tattoo, or a scar, or a branding mark, but he knew exactly what it was because he'd seen one only hours ago, or a version of it, the Death Watch emblem, the ragged wing W shape. It didn't surprise him. She'd been spoils of war as far as they were concerned, an animal to be used, and marked as their property. A surgeon can remove that, Kinaha said. Would that help? Arla pulled down her shirt again. You don't get it. You can't guess because it's so bad. Whatever it was, you were a child of fourteen, Wallen tells me. When we're adult, we look back and judge our childhood actions by unfairly adult rules. Arla didn't turn around. It's not a wound or a humiliation. It's a badge. Explain. After I was kidnapped, after it stopped being a nightmare, I stayed with them. I became one of them. I stayed. I could have run away. But I stayed. She looked over her shoulder at Juzik. Could you stand being me? Oh, Shab, Juzik said. Stop me remembering it all, she begged. Let me die. Or kill me, but I can't live in this head anymore. I kept trying to die. But the doctors wouldn't let me. Arla was frighteningly lucid now. Juzik wasn't sure if Kinaha had induced some state of clarity, but whatever it was, he'd rescued a woman who didn't want to stay rescued. There was no point telling her that kidnapped victims, hostages, and abused helpless kids often found themselves depending on the very people hurting them, and even growing to like them, because their own lives were held in those hands. Humans generally weren't the magnificent heroes of Holovids who fought back, but simply normal beings doing instinctive things just to stay alive. You know you're not evil or unusual for doing that, he said. Don't you? Maybe. Arla started scratching her forearm as if the muscle relaxant was wearing off. But that doesn't change how hard it is to make it through the next second from the moment I wake up to the moment I fall asleep. When did you get away from them? Arla went quiet for a moment. When I got arrested for the last shooting. Five, six years? Something like that. Try ten, said Juzik. Arla shut her eyes for a second. That long? Say didn't even seem to be breathing. Kinaha looked as if she was resting now, having unlocked that mental door. Now Juzik had to sweep up the Arla that was falling out of it. He wasn't going to start asking her about the killings, not now. Your brother Django survived, he said. He went on to be a legendary soldier and, well, most of my brothers here were cloned from him. He founded the finest army in galactic history. I sort of knew he was doing okay as a bounty hunter, Arla said. The Watch was aware of stuff. But you talk as if he's dead now. That was a shock. Juzik had no idea she even knew he'd survived. But that was before he knew she'd been living with the Death Watch for most of her life. She'd shifted from tragic lost youth to something he didn't understand yet, a sister who never let her brother know she was still alive, but still observed him from afar. I need to stop filling gaps in history with pieces from the obvious. He was killed at the outbreak of the Clone War. I'm sorry. It didn't feel like a good idea right then to tell her that a Jedi killed him, and how much Django had grown to loathe them. We were all good shots, Arla said. 
That was why I did so many assassinations for the Death Watch. She looked over her shoulder again. Now are you going to give me a quick way out? What do you think Django would have done to me if he'd known I was with them? Juzik felt Django would have forgiven her. Would the Death Watch be looking for you now, if they were still around? That made her flinch. Are they? If they are, they won't get near you. Arla looked at Juzik for a long time. You know, she said at last, that this low will wear off, and I'll crash again, don't you? You don't want the medication, obviously. Try it sometime. It doesn't stop you remembering. Just stops you doing something about it. Juzik knew what he might be able to do. He was about to do it to Kinaha Scout, and Zay, after all, he could blank out parts of her memory. He didn't know whether to offer. Shab, he had to. She was his personal responsibility. I used to be a Jedi, he said. I can erase memories. But beyond just removing recollection of the last five minutes or so, I don't know how safe it is, or what else I'll remove in the process. Arla reached down for the discarded blanket and pulled it around her. I was going to die first chance I got anyway, she said. If you can make this go away, no, I don't think I deserve to feel better. Juzik moved automatically into that game of guessing the motivator. She was still trying to atone for letting her parents' murderers become her family. Well, if I practice on you, Juzik said, I'll be much safer when I come to wipe my Jedi friend's memories, and you can still give me useful intel on the Death Watch. A few years out of date beats zero any day. Zay gave him a look that said his little earnest Jedi Knight had grown up rather fast since leaving the Order. Do it, Arla said. And if you turn me into a vegetable, you shoot me. Deal? Juzik nodded. Deal, he said. Kirimorat. Skirata couldn't find it in himself to be annoyed with Hilamar, let alone angry. Priest got what was coming to him. And leaving him alive to tell the tale, no, that hadn't been an option. Hilamar had done what Skirata should have done years ago, just by way of cleansing the Mando gene pool. Vav agreed. But things were still getting a little too close to home. Clan Skirata didn't have the monopoly on Mandalorian resourcefulness. Sooner or later, someone was going to track them down. Skirata flipped Priest's shoulder plate between his fingers like meditation beads, staring at the emblem and wondering just what was out there waiting to return from Baseland Shevla. Does it matter who kills you in the end? Yes, I think it does. So what if Roe works out it was one of us? Ordo leaned on the Roba pen wall, watching one of the sows with her new litter. If I was going to get his smoked Roba slices one day soon. Is that going to make us any more wanted by the Empire than we already are? There's no trail back to this place either way. Barden's planning a relocation for Kiramorat in case the worst happens. Red Linny. It was the Manda watchword for prudence, just in case. Everyone had a plan B. Jane, in his business-minded way, had taken to calling it off-site hot standby. I'm thinking that we should have a bolt hole on Chirav. Why stay in the Mandalore sector? Yeah, we could just walk away from Mandalore and the Empire, Skarada said. Find a remote planet. Build a small town. Move in. Let the Death Watch make a big mistake with Palps and get eaten alive. Or let Shisa fight his guerrilla war. Churn out cutting-edge pharmaceutical products. Drink any tra gal on the porch. Indulge a vast army of spoiled grandchildren. Get old, and let everyone else do the fighting. Ordo gave him a little frown. Logistics, Calbear. 
We'd have to ship and everything on a dump like Chirav, and freight gets noticed. That was Ordo, all common sense. Skirata reminded himself that this whole thing was about Ordo and the rest of the boys. The sow got to her feet and trotted off, pursued by her litter. Skirata liked Kiramurat. The stay so far had been short, but it was already full of bittersweet memories. The unfinished memorial for the fallen clone army, the crops breaking the surface of the soil, and the idyllic spots around the lake where he could fish were all things he didn't want to leave. And wherever he looked, he could see Atain, from the moment she let him first hold newborn Cad to the moment he stood by her funeral pyre. This was his Shabba clan home, and everyone living here had put their blood and sweat into it. So had Rav Brawler. She'd restored the place brick by stone by plank for him. Part of Skirata refused to be driven from it. It was a very un-Mandalorian thought. We're nomadic. Isn't that what Mandoade were all about? Isn't that what we still are at heart? It's dangerous to get too attached to one place. He thought of Master Altus, smart enough to base his Jedi Academy on a ship. He was actually looking forward to meeting the man. He had to. He wasn't sure why. He was certain that a Jedi Master would know how to take care of his own kind. In a few hours, he'd rendezvous with him in neutral space and look the man in the eye. They're very appealing when they're little, Bordo said absently. What are? Roba. They're cute. The babies were play-fighting, ramming one another with their snouts and squealing as if they were having fun. They still had coats of striped ginger hair that camouflaged them in undergrowth until they were big enough to cope without their mother. Roba sows were fearsomely protective. Skirata gave them a wide berth. Doesn't pay to get too attached to them, he said. That's going to be our breakfast. He felt bad about that for a moment. Like Midge getting too fond of Scout. She's going to want to go back to her Jedi buddies one day soon. Ordo was still staring at the baby Roba. Where do you draw the line? What, between house pet and food? Protectiveness. Saving folks. Maze saved Zay, just like you saved us. Midge and Yithan seem to want to save Scout. When does it become crazy to keep rescuing things? Rescue was an instinct, a moment's unconscious reflex. Skirata hadn't even had to think about stepping between Orenwa and the young Nulls to save them. It was simply something that demanded doing. He didn't regret a second of it. It never occurred to him that it might risk his own life, or cause endless ripples of trouble down the years, and even if he had he wouldn't have cared. It just didn't matter. Maze obviously felt the same about Say. Soldiers would die for their buddies. It was the way of the galaxy, the best part of it, that beings cared so much for others that they did dangerous things so that someone else could live. Is this another hypocrisy lecture? Skirata asked. Never bear. It's okay. Even I can see that I've got double standards. New York keeps me fully aware of that. Skirata realized he'd started referring to her as casually as if she were his longtime wife. He edged into the open pen and stood still, one eye on the huge sow. The animal would break his legs if she charged him, and he didn't want to think what her sharp tusks would do to soft tissue. Two of the litter broke away from the others and trotted up to him. Breakfast or pets? You're right, Ordo, there's no logic in it. The babies just wanted to see if he had food for them. They were already learning to root in the mud and find their own dinner. He felt a tug at his heart, but it wasn't quite an overwhelming drive to pick them up and keep them in the house, although he knew many folks would do exactly that. 
In the end, he said, we know which lives we have to save, and those come first. Even if we take insane risks to do it. Ordo just nodded. The Saud turned towards Skarada and let out a long warning grunt that sounded as if she was gearing up to ram him. As soon as her head dipped for her attack run, Skarada found agility he thought he'd lost twenty years ago and almost vaulted over the wall. She raced up to the half-opened gate and stood rumbling a warning, even though she could have carried on and chased Skarada around the yard. This was her turf. She wanted the filthy human interloper to leave her kids alone, that was all. She knows she'll be on Fi's plate one day, Bordo said. What has she got to lose? Skirata decided to leave a couple of weeks before he let anyone venture into Keldae begin to check if there was any aftermath from Priest's death. They might not have found his body yet. But Ro would know something bad had happened to him. Come on, Skarada said. Let's clean our boots and then go rendezvous with Altus. Altus was due to calm them any time now to say he was inbound. All Skirata could think of was how different things might have turned out if this Altus had run the Jedi Council, and not Yoda and his cronies. That was the trouble with the people who should have been in charge. They never really wanted the power that they were better equipped than others to wield. Juzik let Ordo take the aggressor for the journey. It made sense to pack some firepower and speed, even if Altus and his gang were as peaceful as beings could get. Skirata took no chances these days. The fighter dropped out of hyperspace and waited at the coordinates, giving Skirata time to simply gaze out of the viewport at the sheer emptiness of speckled space, something he rarely had a chance or inclination to do. It really was beautiful, clean, so utterly miraculous and perfect compared to the sordid events on most planets that he wondered if Yuthan's virus ever looked up at an apparently majestic ruby sky and didn't realize it was inside some shabby humanoid that cheated and killed. This was why he didn't spend time contemplating stars capes. He remembered now. Ordo cocked his head, listening on his comm link. Here we go, Calbear. It's a cargo ship. Wookie Gunner. They're preparing to let us dock alongside. I admire a man who doesn't overcompensate with a Star Destroyer, Skarada said. I'm going to treat him with caution. Trust was a funny thing. They were now going to dock with a ship, not inside its bay but alongside, with a fragile corridor of flexible plastoid and durasteel as their only shield against hard vacuum. Somehow, both sides thought this was less risky than landing on a planet. Skirata felt suddenly foolish. Ordo maneuvered the aggressor into position and the docking ring sealed with a grinding sound that reverberated through the fighter's airframe. Pressuring up, Ordo said, and hit the control. You can board when the light shows green, Master Altus. It was a demonstration of goodwill, Skirata knew. The Jedi was prepared to step aboard a Mandalorian starfighter alone, taking all the risk. Maybe the docking hadn't been such a rash move after all. Skarada eased out of his seat and stood watching the inner hatch. The plate retracted, and he found himself staring at an ordinary-looking human male, gray hair, late sixties, maybe even seventies. So this was Master Jin Altus. He walked like a workman or a scruffy college professor, with no brown robes, tunic, or monastic look. And he just felt different. I'm Cal, Skarada said. This is my son, Ordo. Altus held out his hand. We're in the same line of work, he said. Salvage. People salvage. We could form a union then. My boy Bardike likes you, Skirata winked. And that's a powerful recommendation. You still up for helping us out? When do you want us to take your guests? 
One of them asked to stay for a while. Kinaha and Arligan Zay. I want their memories of my base wiped first. You can always reach us anytime you're ready. But we already knew you were willing to take the Jedi off our hands, so we're here to talk more broadly, aren't we? We are. Altus unsettled Skirata. He managed somehow to be both very ordinary and also radiate an ancient authority. We're all on the run. I had this idea, Skirata said. He heard Ordo inhale, rightly so, because he hadn't fully discussed any of this. We want to rescue clones and keep our planet free of scumbags. We hear stuff from extraordinary places and there's nothing we can't buy, build, invent, steal, or slice. You have all kinds of extra talents most of my clan don't have, and a different intelligence network, so I think we could occasionally help each other out. Altus chewed his thumbnail. There's a but. I hear it. But I'll only help you if you don't play a part in putting the Jedi Order back in power. Because we hate those Shabir for more reasons than I've got time to list. Altus roared with laughter. He seemed to find it genuinely funny, as if Skirata was sweetly naive about Jedi politics. We've never been close, us and the mainstream Jedi Order. We're the crazy relative in the attic that nobody talks about. Altus coughed to clear his throat. About half of our community these days isn't Force-sensitive, so you can imagine how hard this is for a more ascetic school of Jedi thought to handle. Well, here's something for free, to show goodwill. You might think you're the harmless eccentrics, but the Empire singled you out as a potential rallying point to rebuild the Jedi Order and it thinks that lots of the surviving Jedi will try to regroup around you. Altus wasn't inscrutable or serene, and he didn't look as if he was trying to be. He frowned. Oh, that's worrying. Plets well. It was just a trick, throwing in one scrap of half-understood information to see what else fell out. Jalar Obram would have been proud of him. You're still moving kids there? That was a real flyer, based solely on a snatch line of radio comms mentioned by Darman. Skirata watched Altus's pupils flicker. Ah, uh, Cal, you are well informed. I ought to be scared of you. Not at all. Only if you hurt my boys. All I'm saying is that if you help us out occasionally, we'll help you out. You might want to start by faking your death. We're good at making that look convincing. And we'll help you find somewhere to hide that's not on the database that your more careless colleagues managed to lose. Skarada paused for breath as much as effect. Yes, he definitely got Altus's attention. One day, I know I'm going to get the bill for this, Altus said. It'll be a favor. Probably for one of the boys. Maybe for their families. Like you, we just want to be left alone to get on with our lives. So where do we go from here? I'll calm you when we get our Jedi situation sorted out. We'll be there. Stay safe, Cal Skirata. Koyasii, Master Altus. Altus winked. Chin, please. Skirata stood and watched in silence while Altus crossed back through the narrow sleeve of plastoid and the air lock at the far end snapped shut behind him. Ordo sealed the aggressor's hatches, waited for the red indicator to turn green, and disengaged from the docking ring. Worth the journey? He asked, moving the fighter away from Wookie Gunner's hull. I think so. Altus was different. Skarada didn't want that. It blurred the line. Before long, he'd be what Darman accused him of being, soft on Jedi. He couldn't afford to forget the bigger picture just because Jin Altus wasn't the kind of Jedi he was used to. If only because he can give us tips on how to handle housing a whole community on a wandering ship. If you can't get rid of Force users, Bordo said, 
then you might as well buy a bunch of your own. Not that I think Altus is Bible, but he knows a mutual interest when he sees it. Skarada decided he probably had been a bit generous in his offer, and the dumbest way to open negotiations was with a concession. But nothing had been traded yet. Two old guys who had to find a way to work together in a galaxy that wanted them dead had sized up one another and decided they could get on. That was all that had happened, nothing more. Jane was right. We'll find a use for them, and they'll find a use for us. So here we are, drawing the line between one kind of Jedi and another. Isn't that what we did with Bardan and Atane? Yes, Ordo said. I suppose it is. Ordo was an outspoken lad. If he had any real misgivings about Altus, he would say so plainly and undiplomatically. Instead, he programmed a course for Mandalore on the NAV computer and took the aggressor up to jump velocity. The transition to hyperspace always left Skirata feeling off balance for a moment or two. When he focused on the viewport again, the serene starscape that made the galaxy look like a really nice place to live was gone. I gave Altus another bonus, didn't I? Maybe I'll save that card for later. Skarada had shaken the man's hand. And he was still infectious, still carrying a virus that would protect against the FG-36 bioweapon. Now Altus would spread that to all his followers, and another population would be immunized. I should have billed you, he muttered to himself. Never mind. Jim Locker Room, Special Operations Barracks, 501st Legion Headquarters, Imperial Center. Darman had his best ideas in the freshers. He always did. It was something about the soothing effect of hot water hitting the crown of his head and the continuous rainfall sound of the shower. He hovered in a relaxed state closer to dozing off than being awake. He knew now that he'd made a serious mistake by not grabbing the chance to desert to Mandalore when Ordo came for them. There was no point trying to do the best for Cad from so far away when he was always going to be relying on others to take the information he'd gathered and do something productive with it. Dar? You asleep in there or something? Darman let the voice drift over him. It was Niner. He could wait. No, he was going about this all the wrong way. He could be stuck here for the rest of his life, and that wasn't going to be as long as a regular human's. He didn't have time for another mistake. There was one solution. Examples of it had been staring him in the face for a year or more. Dar! You're going to be as wrinkled as a strill's shebs if you stay in there much longer. Darman couldn't break off from his train of thought to answer. When Fine needed help, when Skirata needed to get him out of that med center before they pulled the plug and let him die, Bessany and Obram went in and got him. When Skirata needed to save the young Nulls from the Kaminoans, he went and did it himself. Even the evacuation on the night of Order 66, even though it ended so terribly for him and Etain, and for Niner, Skirata and the team went in and pulled people out. You have to do things for yourself. Calbear showed you everything you needed to know to be a good father. What would he be doing now? Darman was certain that he wouldn't be standing here in a shower stall when his son needed him. Calbear was a wonderful father, a kind and patient man and the best example of how much you could change the galaxy when you didn't accept the hand you were dealt. But he had a lot of other clone sons all relying on him, and he let too many Jedi spin him sob stories and take advantage of his guilt about Atane. Darman was feeling worse by the hour about all those Jedi being under the same roof as Cad. Atane wouldn't have wanted it. That reason alone was enough for Darman to do something now. He was going to Mandalore, 
which he always thought of now as back to Mandalore, even though he'd never been there, and he was going to be a proper father to his son. Darman wanted to stay at Kiramorat, but it was obvious that it was going to be a more dangerous world now that the Empire had dug in there. It was no place to raise a kid who was half Jedi. Darman now knew firsthand what would happen to Cad if the Empire's dark side spooks got a whiff of him. Roly Melusa was a great guy who knew exactly what needed doing, but Darman couldn't wait that long for the revolution. Got to do it yourself. He was going back to Mandalore to take his son, and then get away somewhere that nobody could find them. He was a commando. He was great at extractions, and if he wanted not to be found, he was pretty good at that, too. Sorry, Calbert, but you've got too much on your plate at the moment. I missed the first 18 months of Cad's life because nobody even told me he was mine. Darman had it all planned now. He didn't even have to sneak out of the barracks. He'd been tasked to find Altus, and Melissa had no idea how easy that was going to be for him. Dar, are you okay? Yeah. Keep your hair on. He turned off the spray and towelled himself dry. Niner gave him a worried look and dropped his voice to a whisper. Dar, you need to stop worrying about the Jedi. Cal's on the case. He'd get anyone who so much as looked at Cad the wrong way. I know. You sure you're okay? Yeah. Let's go see Holy Roly. I've had an idea. What? Bet you I can persuade him to let us carry out an op on Mandalore. Niner just stared as if he was checking Darman's eyes for signs of madness. Darman found it hard to be anything less than totally honest with his brother, but Niner was a worry guts, and what he didn't know couldn't hurt him. If Darman leveled with him completely about what he had in mind, then he knew what would happen. Niner would try to stop him. He'd do it out of love, but he'd get it all wrong. He just didn't understand how much having a kid changed everything. It was okay to keep a few cards up your sleeve if it saved your brother from harm. Niner had kept things from him for exactly the same reason. That's your desertion plan? Niner said at last. He whispered so quietly that Darman could just about see his lips move. Maybe they should have switched to Mandoe but too many of the Kamino commandos would understand that, too. Just stroll out with an Imperial vessel and a full fuel tank? That's about it. What about Reed? Or have you got a plan for convincing the CO it just needs us? Darman was pretty sure he could do that, too. He pulled on his fatigues. Let's go see. If we end up taking him, Niner said, then we better be clear what's going to happen to him when he works out we're doing a runner. He won't want to desert. He's a blank sheet. He'll respond to a sensible argument. No, he's not a blank sheet. He might be a sparty job, but he's a man like us. You've seen how fast he learns. What if he really objects? What if he turns us in? Then I'll do what I have to do. Niner's face fell. He never did like that kind of dilemma. He tied himself up in ethical knots about duty, and he found the really dirty work, turning on his own kind, one step too far. Darman didn't want to harm a brother, but he'd shot two covert ops troopers because it was a matter of them or him, and Darman was trained to survive at any cost. I've got a son to worry about now. I'd shoot the whole Imperial Army if I had to. There'll be a better way, Niner said. Well, you think about that, and I'll work on Roly. It never occurred to Darman that Melissa might have gone home at this time of night. And he hadn't. He was still sitting in his office, poring over intelligence reports. 
The man had a mission, a quest, and at its heart it was about family, a family that had been taken from him. Darman understood that perfectly. Is he married? Has he got kids? Or can he face that until he avenges his father? Darman didn't ask. He rapped on the door frame, Niner fidgeting behind him, and waited. Yes? Got five minutes, sir? Certainly. Darman waited for the doors to close behind them and stood in front of Melissa's desk. Whatever he said next, he would be dragging Niner behind him. He had to be sure it was worth that risk. How can I lie to Melissa, after all he's been through? I think I can find you Altus and his people, sir, Darman said. In fact, I'm sure I can. Niner and I just need to find some old intel contacts. He didn't look at Niner. He didn't need to. He knew his brother's pulse rate had just gone through the roof. Melissa nodded. Go on. We need to go to Mandalore. Melissa looked slightly puzzled. Very well. Is there anything special you need from me? Darman had been expecting to argue his case for being let off the leash. The new army wasn't like the old GR. He was taken aback. This was how much faith the commander put in them. I can't betray this guy. It's not right. But I have to get my son to somewhere safe. Just your permission, sir, Darman said. You have it. Tell me what you need and I'll make sure it gets supplied without any awkward questions. Melusser pulled out a data pad and tapped it. Are you planning to take Reed? Might be easier than leaving him here to speculate. It sounded like an order. Darman wasn't going to push his luck and make an excuse for refusing. And Melusser had a point. Reed would ask questions and the last thing anyone wanted was for other commandos to realize that Squad 40 was off the roster for unexplained reasons. It'll be good for him, sir, Niner said. I'll make sure he doesn't get into any scrapes. Niner turned to leave, but Melissa beckoned Darman back. Whatever the Jedi did to you, Darman, remember what they say about a dish best served cold. He gave Darman that look had slightly tilted, eyebrows raised, chin down, that said he'd thrown his lot in with his troops, 100%. Vengeance makes you take crazy risks. I know. Remember, cold. Darman felt the guilt starting to eat him alive. Got it, sir. He didn't say a word to Niner until they got back to their quarters. He checked that Reed was snoring like a vibrasaw before he even risked a whispered conversation at the far end of the room. I know it's no different from what we planned to do before, Niner said. But I feel rotten lying to Holy Roly. And Reed. I'm not lying, Darman said. I'm going to give Melissa all the Jedi he wants. Yes, Darman would. And if that didn't fit with Jang's plans for finding some Jedi in escape route, it was too bad. His son came first. End of Star Wars Republic Commando Book 5 Imperial Commando 501st by Karen Travis